Yep, yep. we are live. Yeah. I'll just start That's posting good. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Actually, let me check if the YouTube is live yet. Uh, that might just still be waiting. Okay, the YouTube is live as well. All right. Yeah, that's great. So we'll be starting up in about one minute here. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Um, just double checking that we're live on YouTube. So today will be SciMLCon, all right? So if you haven't registered, please go to SciML.com. Uh, that will have the registration link over in the tickets area. And you know, we, while you can watch this for free on YouTube, uh, this helps us uh, measure our developer community, helps us measure our support. So please uh, let us, you know, so please do the registration process. Though, of course, if you have, uh, you know, if you can't do it, that's, that's totally okay as well. Um, everything will be on this one YouTube link. So, you know, if you have this link, be ready, you know, grab a cup of coffee, grab three cups of coffee. We'll be here from about nine to, uh, we'll be here about nine to five. Um, I guess I, I hear someone says that there's some echo. Let me let me make sure I handle that for a second here. Oh, yeah, just in case you have the YouTube open, you should yeah probably have that muted. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me let me just close everything for now. All right. Um, yeah. So I'll just get started right away then. Um, all right. So. Why, 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 why is SciML kind of thing, right? So let, let's let's jump right into this and, and just say that you know SciML has grown pretty big. So for example, um, you know when we looked at JuliaCon 2021, we had I think it was like 25 talks that were accepted to JuliaCon uh, specifically on SciML software, which means that you know with the with the with the rate of of you know talks that were able to, to even make it into the conference, we had like 60, 70 talks that were submitted specifically on this one topic. And so we, you know, as we've been growing, we've seen that hey, we you know, we really should be supporting our, our community by having another conference to kind of, you know, ease ease the ease the amount that has to go into just one, you know, one uh, one conference slot, right? So um, so the purpose of SciMLCon you know, is to make it so that way we have more space to be able to explore SciML, um, the applications, the software, go into some details, and also be able to do something that's a bit more specific, right? So for example, uh, Yingbo will be go able to go into, you know, the details of modeling toolkit, like some of these very core things um, that is, you know, specific uh, to us. And so with that, we have a, a schedule that matches um, this. So you, everyone can go find the schedule on SciMLCon.org. Right. If you click on the schedule tab, you'll be able to find this. Um, you can share around this YouTube link and tell people to join the discussion. We have a Discord channel where all of these discussions are taking place. Um, you can ask questions there. You can ask questions on the Slack in the hashtag SciMLCon channel, or you can ask questions directly on the YouTube channel. So yeah, so so um, uh, I see that there's some some uh, questions about the, the YouTube channel starting. Uh, Ranjan, are, you, uh, are we good? Yes, we are good. Uh, I've just asked folks to start refreshing. I think the people who haven't, uh, people are seeing a green screen just refreshed and their YouTube video was uh, working just fine. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, YouTube Live has this thing where you have to, you know, if you if you sign in before the the stream starts, you do need to to restart. But yeah, so so we'll be going through some uh, we'll be going through a, a whole lot of different uh, things here, right? So we'll start with some applications, you know, applications to healthcare and climate. Um, we'll be moving into some more details, right? So going into the internals of how the symbolic arrays are handling new packages like structural identifiability packages, um, new differential equation solvers. Uh, we'll have our keynote talk, which will be Andreas Rosler, which will be about numerical methods for stochastic differential equations because, you know, stochastic differential equations have kind of been the, it was the start of SciML and now it's really been infused into a lot of what we're, what we're seeing with machine learning, right? With stochastic differential equations everywhere from, you know, automated model discovery um, to even things like, uh, you know, gener generative adversarial networks are using diffusion models for, you know, built on dip stochastic differential equations as well. So we'll be going to be spanning this space of scientific computing uh, to machine learning and the, all the ways that these, these, these disciplines connect today. Um, and at the very end, we will have a farewell and open discussion. Uh, so the the Zoom there will be a Zoom call link that will be shared into the Discord. We invite everyone to just join this discussion, and we'll break out into into breakout rooms, and you know everyone can, can discuss. Which means that if you want to join this this discussion, please make sure that you're in the Discord. Um, so yeah, so to every uh, just reiterating again, uh, please register if you have not. So now I'm going to jump into uh, this first talk here, which we're, really this talk is to kind of set the stage for, for the rest of this conference. It's the, it's the state of SciML, right? What is scientific machine learning and the software ecosystem and how, it ha how has it been evolving? What, what have we been seeing? Where, what have we done? Where are we going next, right? This is, this is really what we want to, to showcase and then before we get into some of these details. So... If this talk was in 2016 or 2017, uh, we would start. We would have the entire talk be about differential equations and differential equations.jl, right? And so we are, our early claim to fame was really, you know, hey, there there are things that we can do in the modern differential equation space that can be done to. Um, you know, improve performance, right? And it wasn't just improved performance over Pat, Python, MATLAB, and R, right? Th those are those were the targets that you know kind of got a, a large core of, of users. But what really got the developer community and you know even the numerical methods developer community uh, interested was that we were able to start besting even some of the best in class you know Fortran and C libraries, um, and that was done through multiple through two methods. Right. Uh, for one one set of things was all the numer you know, in advancing the numerical space. So things like new new uh, new linear solvers, uh, new computations of very core components like Blas components. But mixing that with new differential equation solvers or new iterations on differential equation solvers that were kind of not you know that were kind of lost to time. So I think that one nice uh, one nice uh, case here was Rodos four, right? So higher order Rosenbrock methods they require really they require really good Jacobian approximations in order to compute at the higher orders that they expect. And so for a long time, because finite differences was used for the the Jacobians, they were not very stable for for low orders, even though or for high accuracy, even though that's where they're most efficient. But when you start to combine that with automatic differentiation. That combination really changes the game, right? And so th this this combination of features is really what brought differential equations together. It's new features, new algorithms, and new computational details that really came together. Um, and if this was 2017, right, I would give a whole talk just all about this topic. But we've really gone past this. So. You know, so this year, for example, uh, we, we have really gone uh, through this whole vertical area. So that way, you know, we, we, we're, we're even the core things like uh, the linear solvers, right? Everyone really re relies on things like BLOS and MKL. Well, these days we have our own tools that are written in Julia because in large swaths of, of the, you know, in large swaths of ODEs, these new tools are outperforming on modern CPUs. And so this gives us a whole range of, of places where we've been doing the research. It's, you know, the linear solve, the nonlinear solve, the ODE solve, all the way to Gillespie, and basically everything up. Um, and, and so, uh, where, how we got to this, right? And I think that the, the core fundamental principle, um, the core fundamental principle was really that, 
you know, we took a pro an approach where we said we will benchmark everything. And so if you go to bench site and benchmarks uh, .jl, you'll see that there's benchmarks on all sorts of different problems. There's dedicated compute. So that way, when anyone opens a pull request to change a model or change, you know, or, or update packages, I mean, we'll rerun the benchmarks on this compute. And it has GPUs, it has uh, you know parallel CPUs, and so we can just see how everything is working. And by by really using this, you know, using a benchmark-based approach, a very empirical approach, we've been able to just grow our performance uh, improvements over over the years. Um, but what what really happened from that though is that once you have a developer community where you have all of these you know, develop, where you have all these developer tools, where you have all of these benchmarking tools, we saw that this became a community not just for software developers, but also for developers of methods, right? So uh, one, one really interesting case here was IRK gauss legendre which is a very specific kind of method, right? This kind of method is a, is a 16th order ODE solver, which is really made for cases where you want more than floating point accuracy in your solves, on equations which are you know have symplectic properties, um, and so where what what happened was you know researchers in these kinds of methods came to SciML because this became a place where hey we have all these benchmarking tools available let's just develop our methods on this interface and what do you know now I can write a whole paper just by showing you know adding my methods to the benchmark suite and releasing it out into the wild. And so what we've done is we worked with a lot of these methods developers to get these packages up, to get these packages optimized, and, and even more importantly, get them as part of the community so that way they have a maintenance structure so they would exist and be usable 20 years from now, 30 years from now. So, so you know, and it wasn't just a one-off approach. Uh, there's a lot of other cases of this. In fact, our keynote speaker today um, will be talking about stochastic differential equations. And he is and his student recently released a new stochastic differential equation package, which completely changed the efficiency of how we can compute levy areas, which is a fundamental detail to higher order non-commutative stochastic differential equations. And of course, the, 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 the speaker will go in much more detail into this, but, but, but the key idea here is that we've now developed this community where the research happens here. And so, you know, it, within just months, you know, you have these brand new methods, these really core improvements, orders of magnitude improvements, entering core packages like stochastic diff EQ and becoming the things that users automatically get. So, you know, you've probably been seeing that your performance has been growing on, uh, you know, over time, you know, your performance improvements. And this really hasn't just been, you know, two developers or something. This has been 50, 100 developers in a large community because of these, these developer processes. Um, and, you know, there's tons of other examples that I can showcase here. I'm only going to showcase two because otherwise the whole talk will be on this. So if you want yours to be showcased here at SciMailCon, I'll say, you know, please, please uh, sign up to give a talk for the next time. Um, but essentially what, what we've grown into, right, we've, we've grown from something that was about just differential equations to an ecosystem that has linear solvers, nonlinear solvers, optimization, uh, data-driven uh, discovery tools, uh, methods for solving inverse problems, symbolic modeling tools. And we put this all into one cohesive uh, or, you know, one, one cohesive group that is able to, to pull all these together. So modeling toolkit allows for symbolic solving and it generates equations for nonlinear solve. Differential equations.jl also works with modeling toolkit, but if you ask it for a steady state equation, it uses nonlinear solve, right? Um, if you use data-driven diff EQ to be able to generate differential equations from data, the gen differential equations that it generates, it shows you them in symbolic form for modeling toolkit, and then you can solve, and then you can simulate them with differential equations, right? All of these tools start to work together to pr promote the research in each aspect because it now, you know, now users only, or developers and researchers only need to focus on one, one area in order to get the benefits of all these pieces. Um, and, and so we, we've seen a lot of nice research come out of this. So for example, a we'll talk that we'll see later today is about how an infinite time neural ODEs can actually be faster to train and faster to use than finite time ODEs, uh, neural ODEs. And that's something that might be, you know, a bit mind boggling. It comes from an idea about the implicit function theorem. Um, and I won't go into too much detail because this is exactly one of the talks that we'll have later today at, at, uh, at SciMelCon. Um, now, and what, what's really evolved from here is that in order to get these models and get these methods out to more people, we've been developing a lot of front ends for specific applications. 
So here, for example, is catalyst.jl, which gives a reaction network syntax. So that way, a very chemical reaction syntax can be shown and, and used by users. And this right here, right, is, is not just, you know, this in, in Unicode or something, right? This right here is runnable code. Th this right here is runnable code that will simulate these, these chemical reactions, either with stochastic e equations or in the uh, deterministic form with ODEs. But, you know, as this is part of the, the SIMO universe, um, this is not something that just simulates, it's something that simulates rather fast. So this is uh, this I'm pulling from an unpublished paper. There's, the preprint should be going out in about a month or so um, about catalyst.jl and if jump. And what we show is that if you use that interface, right, something that looks very close to the science, um, what you get is you get something that it simulates the equations, you know, these stochastic equations with Gillespie simulations. They're simulating about two orders of magnitude, three, four orders of magnitude faster than a lot of the other um, packages that are out there, right? So we've really found a way, you know, building on top of the tools of Julia to be able to get this, this Pareto Optima, you know, or at least get close to this Pareto Optima in terms of features plus performance um, and simplicity. And, and so what, where this has really gone then is that we've been expanding in a way so that way, you know, applications can use their application specific formulas without hassle. So we can read in SBML models, CellML models, BioNetGen. This is showing how, um, how systems biology, for example, has a whole pipeline directly from, you know, their, their core formats directly to the differential equation solvers. But it's not just in the, you know, it's not just systems biology. That's just one example of many. There's Pumas for uh, pharmaceutical modeling, which we'll have a talk earlier later this morning. There's packages for uh, orbital trajectories, a lot of space science applications, uh, power systems dynamics. And, and this is really just, a, once again, this is just a short list of all of these different applications that we're seeing use this, uh, this, this set of tools. And so now researchers who are working on numerical methods, they can ask questions like, does this new, uh, ODE solver improve a climate model? And once you put it into, uh, once you put something into the differential equations.jl interface, you can actually use, say, the climate climate model and see how the performance changes in real climate models, right? Not just not just these toy problems. And this has really changed the game for what we see happens in research. But all of these assume that you have an idea of the model, right? So where where the research really went in say you know twenty uh, in twenty twenty was this question of can we start to help help users build models as well? And so this was a combination of tools, so a combination of neural networks, be able to learn from data, along with symbolic uh, regression tools, be able to change the neural networks into, um, into symbolic equations, right? So this was the universal differential equation approach that mixed symbolic regression with, uh, with kind of these partial neural ODEs and, symbol and, um, and numerical data. And we were able to show that, you know, on these toy equations, like, hey, this, this idea worked. But I think what really shows the state of SciML is to just look through some of the citations, right? You know, where, where, where has this actually gone, right? Because as a software, right, the, the, the true sign of software moving is the users doing something else with it. So, you know, we were able to show that, hey, on toy problems like La Volterra, we were able to, you know, get perfect extrapolation, right? But what happens, say, when you have partial information about uh, black hole dynamics and you say, I want to correct the black hole dynamics with universal function approximators? Well, this was done by, by um, other scientists over uh, with the LIGO black hole data. And here you go, you see that they learn from a small set of data. And when they extrapolate forward, it's able to have very similar performance to what we showed on toy problems, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the blue matches up with the orange, this extrapolation, it's able to learn a very successfully learn uh, models using this partial information. And so you might go, well, okay, you know, one example, you know, one real world example is not enough. And if, I mean, we're, we're to the point now where the SIMO organization is, is mature enough that we can just kind of go through uh, a bunch here. So let me, let me just kind of walk through some. Right, so uh, we'll have a speaker later today, which we'll be talking about deep NLME, which is a case where uh, you cannot directly do something like symbolic regression. You cannot directly do some of these methods, but by training a neural network inside of a nonlinear mixed effects model, you can then pull the neural network out and learn symbolic terms and make it so that way you can learn models that will that will be predictive of how um, of how uh, patients will change with respect to different dosing. So pharmacology was another domain you know, where, where this ended up working out. 
But you know, is it pharmacology and black hole dynamics? No. Uh, well, what about um, earthquake safe buildings, right? So here, once again, uh, you had partial information model and it, it learns from a small set of data. And when you extrapolate that into the future, it learns a, a correct enough model to be able to you know, extrapolate. So, okay, now building design. Uh, are, what, what else ha have, have we been successful in? Well, um, the better battery models is another one, right? So here's a universal differential equation was used, something called self-fit, um, to be able to improve the predictions of how batteries degrade. Um, wh where else do we go? Um, there's methods for combustion modeling, um, using the same kind of idea of diff you know of partial partially known uh, structures about chemical reaction networks, you mix that with the differentiable uh, ODE solver, and this has a you know Arrhenius.jl, the Julia package, which which goes along with this. Um, are there more applications? You know, uh, new propulsion devices which use neural networks inside of partially known partial differential equations. You train these neural networks and you extrapolate forward. Right? I can keep on going through these examples, but I. I think that what really shows the success, I mean, this really shows the success of the CIMO, you know, organization and, and, and the software, right? We, we should really be proud of, you know, not just what we've been able to show in, in our own papers and work, but really how others have, have taken it and really expanded upon it and really begun to use this to be able to solve, you know, these real world problems. Um, and one, one of our developers even, you know, here's here's just another nice case um, using this to be able to control qubit preparation in quantum circuits, right? You know, so so here this this is really pulling all these different threads together. It's uh, optimal control of stochastic differential equations using differentiable stochastic differential equation solvers um, built on Rosler Andreas Rosler's methods. You differentiate through all of them, and now you get to control. Uh, you be able you can be able to control the qubits for possibly building uh, future quantum computers, right? So all of this really comes together, um, it, or all of this has really been coming together in these last uh, few years. Um, yeah, and and as, as I said, you know, I can just keep on going through examples. So let, let's let's really get to this last part here, right? So, you know, we, we've mentioned where SciML has, has gone, right? So it started as you know, hey, we're differential equation solvers and we're fast, but it's really moved to being this whole ecosystem where, you know, you can define a PDE and it uses ODE tools and you can use symbolic modeling tools a modeling toolkit and symbolics.jl. And, uh, you know, you can pull all this together with automatic differentiation, right? We've really moved into a space that encompasses a lot of uh, scientific computing, but, um, but but where where do we really need to go next, right? Uh, I think that there's there's a lot of things that I can mention. Uh, let me just I'm going to highlight these three, right? So there's also going to be talks on improving the symbolic tooling, nonlinear optimal control, right? New, new using machine learning to generate new uh, solvers. But I think that I want to focus on. Uh, some next steps that I think can really pull in some of the community, really pull in some new developers. And this is places like uh, PDE interfaces, um, unified documentation, and modeling standard libraries. So, you know, what, what, what are some things that you should expect to see, you know, some major growth in in the next year or so? So, um, so right, so when we look at the, the current state of, of PDEs, right, um, what where we're really trying to go to is an interface where you can define a PDE symbolically, and be able to solve it with many different methods. Um, and really the first method that we had out there was these physics informed neural networks, right? Where you can define this symbolically. So you say, hey, this is a second derivative with respect to X, second derivative with respect to Y. And so uh, the Laplace equation is, well, you just write it out, right? This is how it'd be written someone in, in a book. You give it the, the boundary conditions. You say, this is my PDE system. And now here's what I, what I want to do is I want to discretize it with respect to a physics performed neural network and solve it, right? Um, but that's one type of discretization, right? You're, so a discretization in this sense is saying, I want to change a PDE system into some numerical problem uh, in which I can then numerically solve to get a solution. When you use physics informed neural networks, that discretization is to a, a nonlinear optimization problem. And when you solve the optimization, you get the weights of a neural network that gives you a PDE solution. And so this interface, though, can be used with a lot of different uh, PDEs. So, for example, you know, when we when we can keep exactly the same setup, but can say, hey, you know, here's um, MOL finite difference. So here's method of lines.jl doing a finite difference discretization on the same PDE input, um, then and then solving this using the differential equation solvers, right? So it's, instead, in this case, it's generating an ODE using the finite difference method, but giving you the same kind of output. And there's a lot. 
there's a lot more that we need to go to, right? So in, you see that, you know, in this slide, I left off how you plot it because the plotting can be kind of complex for a physics informed neural network, whereas it can be easier maybe for a uh, method of lines, finite difference solution. And so one of the things that we're going to need to move to is unifying the interface on the, on the output, but also expanding the, the, the role and, and the amount of, of different types of solvers we have on here. So we have physics informed neural networks, we have finite difference, and if you want to use neural operators, like Fourier neural operators and deep O-nets, um, then you, know, you can use neural operators.jl, um, you know, but you can't do it directly on the symbolic interface. But we also need to do finite volume, finite element, pseudo-spectral. And there's so many tools in the Julia ecosystem that we can build off of to be able to really make a really robust you know, and really strong uh, symbolic modeling interface. And so this is going to be one of the large projects that we'll be working on over the next few years to really make it so that way it's a really right one solve and solve anywhere kind of PDE ecosystem. Um, and now, why 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 is that important? Like, why why not just let someone use use a different package from their physics and form neural networks from and, and use a different package for a finite difference and be okay with it? I think that what what really is driving me to, to this is that it will accelerate the science of scientific machine learning, right? So one of the things that we saw when, you know, when physics informed neural networks and such were coming out was that we can benchmark, say, between, uh, you know, solving an inverse problem between, you know, physics informed neural networks and universal differential equations. And if you spend the time to do it, you can find like, oh, hey, on the Lorentz equation example from the deep XD paper, you know, uh, it takes 300 seconds with the physics informed neural network and, uh, 0 0.03 seconds with the with the, with you know DiffEq flux, and therefore for this kind of ODE problem, it would be better to use DiffEq flux. But you know, do not extrapolate that out because as you go to different PDEs or different equations, different workflows, right? The relative performance between methods can change, and so in order to really build a a wide spanning um, you know view of how you know, wh when are our methods optimal and what should we be using? We really need it to be much easier, you know, not having to use two programming languages and everything. We need to make it easy to be able to switch between them, um, switch between different methods. I think one story that really follows from this is uh, if you take a look, for example, at this paper on uh, on deep O-nets, you'll find that they, they mentioned that, you know, uh, that, you know, the, their methods were able to solve the, a lot of ODEs and PDEs at a fraction of computational costs uh, with respect to classical solvers, right? And so, you know, a lot of these things are driving forward, you know, like we should be using deep O-nets everywhere. Um, and so, you know, if you take a the, take the paper from here, or if, if you take the equations from here, this is the speed on the Robertson equation showing that a deep O-net was able to vastly outperform a numerical solver. And, but, you know, here's a question, like what happens if we do that with the Julia numerical solver? Um, and you can see that if we, you know, uh, comparing a deep O net, which was on a Tesla V1 C, uh, V100 GPU, right? I compared it to this uh, little, this little, you know, laptop with a little uh, CPU, and um, we were able to get about 7,000 times faster than the deep O net um, using this, right? So, and really, what I, I really what I want to highlight here is not that, oh, hey, here's a here's a case where you know where we overturned result or something. But what I think is really important is that. It's really hard to optimize classical numerical solvers, right? It's much easier to optimize something with a machine learning framework. And so without giving researchers a tool that makes it easy to have an optimal form of both, we cannot uh, really push forward this field. And so really where I think that, that this kind of PD interface will, will be helpful is making it easy to get a very optimized example with you know, the classical methods and the scientific machine learning methods to really figure out where each type of method does best. And I, I think that you know, the current state of things is not good for researchers. I wouldn't say that the researcher made any mistake here. Instead, the issue is that we don't have the software to make it so that way it's easy to not make this mistake. And so this is what we want to be solving. Um, and, you know, I can, we can do a whole talk on how this, the same thing replies to the results in the 4A neural operator paper and such, right? Th this, this is something that, that's very pervasive. And so uh, I'm, I'm going, I'm almost near my, the end of my time here. So I want to mention just a few other thrusts. One of the things that we, that happens then when we, as we've grown this ecosystem is that we have this huge documentation of, of very different methods, right? Um, but all of these are different documentations. And so what we need to do is we need to reformat our documentation so that way we have all of the packages put together and be able to make it so that way we can easily go from you know, data-driven DiffEq to DiffEq flux and all that. 
Um, so if we're looking for developers to really help us reformat our documentations in a multi-package kind of form. And lastly, you know, we've been hearing from everyone that you know the, these tools like Modelic and Simulink have these open model libraries. We've been st we've started a, a project called Modeling Toolkit Standard Library to build out such a standard library, and it's still in its very early days. But I think this will be one of our important projects over the next year. Um, so yeah, what else are we working on? It's basically everything in your imagination, and this is what SciMLCon is all about, right? Because I'm just one person talking about what we're working on, but there's hundreds of developers out there, so you know, let's let the conference go. Let, let's, we'll let you talk about what you're working on as well, because SciML is what everybody's working on in the SciML universe. Um, so yeah, so please remember to register, um, and we'll we'll cut to move to the next part of the um, next part of the schedule here. I think that I do have two minutes to to answer a question here or there. So I'll just ask you one quick question from from the Discord. Um, which part of this uh, SciML ecosystem is the most mature and which part is the least mature, according to you? Yeah, so the most mature mature person uh, uh, per area of the SciML is definitely the differential equation solvers, right? So the core differential equation solvers for doing things like solving large partial differential equations, you know, mixing with, you know, preconditioners and all that, that's really been our core for a very, very long time. Um, you know, the things where that have more medium matureness are things like uh, differentiability, you know, adjoint methods and such. We, there's a lot that is there. There's a lot that, that people are using and everything. So I wouldn't say, you know, it's it's fairly mature, but it's, there are still a lot of things that we want to be working on, right? So um, there's still more performance that we can pull out of it, et cetera. Um, things that are a bit less mature, I would say, are things that are built on the symbolic ecosystem, right? So Julia Symbolics is, in, in, it's an entire package ecosystem that itself is only one year old that was spawned out of this IML project. Um, so symbolics and modeling toolkit, right? These are some major areas that will be that are we are working on going forward. You can see that it has many different talks in here, like you know, the internals of modeling toolkit, symbolic array, structural identifiability. This all uses uh, the symbolic tooling, but it's still very it's very early in uh, in its days. So. Um, I would say that the symbolics in, in modeling toolkit is the least uh, the least mature of the areas, but it's probably getting the most development effort. All right, thanks, Chris. Should we move on to the next uh, speaker? Yeah, so I'll I'll jump roles here from from being speaker to to chair now. Um, so our next speaker will be on SIMO for climate. It's going to be Dennis uh, Dennis, and so. Um, we're right at the 9.30, so take it right away. All right. Let me share my screen. Oh, well, looks like we lost Dennis. Um, he should be back. Yeah, so I just went through some of the Discord questions. Let me answer one of them. Uh, while I'm here. Yeah, so has there been, you know, a benchmark test comparing Julius Simel to Python's JAX? Um, real world uh, situations and scale. So the difficulty is that the Python uh, is that the JAX tools they don't have anything for you know the sparse matrices or you know or the sparse LU factorization uh, connections with KLU um, and uh, and you know for things like ILU preconditioning the solvers etc. So when you go to a real world case like for example when you look at the Brussels later uh, tutorial of differential equations JL, we get about a 500x acceleration against them. But a lot of that is just, you know, algorithmic. They just don't have the algorithms in the in the packages because the things that are, you know, the things that can do ILU factorizations are just not part of the differential equation solvers, right? So um, it's hard to come up with a fair comparison just because they don't have the methods yet. Um, and so, I mean, you can say that's a good thing or et cetera, et cetera, but that, that's the, really the current state that you really need all of these methods going, you know, new linear solvers, nonlinear solvers, et cetera, to get some of these uh, performance things. And which is why we still mostly uh, benchmark against uh, ecosystems like CVOD because you know, Sundials has all of these. Yeah. 
Yeah, Dennis, uh, um, you got this? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go ahead and share. Sorry about that. Cut out for a second. All right. Uh, so, uh, my name is Dennis. Oh, sorry, can everyone see my slides? Yeah. Okay. My name is Dennis, and I am a research software engineer at Klima, the Climate Modeling Alliance. And I'll be talking today about using SciML for climate modeling research. So, let's jump right in. A uh, brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about. We'll start off with an introduction. What is Klima? What are our goals? Then I'm going to move on to this package that we've been working on for the past year or so, which is ClimaCore.jl. I'm going to give a bit of mathematical background for this package and then go through the API that we've been developing. And then I'm going to talk about how we've been working with ordinary DiffEQ's IMEX ODE solvers, uh, the heavy splitting uh, strategy for solving our uh, differential equations in a more stable way, and how we've been computing Jacobians and what future work we're planning in terms of computing Jacobians more efficiently and more automatically and generally future work uh, for cleanup. So we're a coalition of scientists, engineers, and mathematicians from Caltech, MIT, the Naval Postgraduate School, and the JPL. And we're using Julia to build an Earth system model that can learn from different data sources and generate climate predictions with quantified uncertainties. Here's a general uh, overview of what we're planning. We're going to represent all major physical processes on Earth that have large scale effects, uh, including advection of air through the atmosphere and sea ice and the effects of biophysics and so on. Uh, there will still be processes that we cannot resolve at the resolutions that our grids are going to have. And we are going to model those processes using subgrid scale parameterizations. Uh, in order to calibrate the parameterizations, we're going to use high resolution uh, simulations of small domains. These are called large eddy simulations. Um, and the calibrated parameters are then going to be fed into large uh, global circulation models, GCMs, uh, which have a coarser resolution, but can be used to then in turn tune the boundary conditions for our LES simulations. So some more technical goals of the Klima project. We're trying to create a open source code base that is easy to understand and can be uh, extended by a wide range of users, be it uh, domain experts who've been doing climate science for many years and new people who are just interested in the field. Uh, we want simulations that can run on both CPUs and GPUs, and we want to support a very wide range of different coordinate systems for our simulations. Uh, so the final simulations, both LES and GCM, are going to run in 3D, uh, but for the purposes of testing, we also want to be able to run in one and two dimensions. We want to use both Euclidean and spherical domains uh, with Euclidean corresponding to our LES simulations and spherical corresponding to our global GCM simulations. Uh, we also want coordinates that follow terrain. So for example, the bottom of the atmosphere, uh, coordinate Z equals zero, uh, should always run along with the surface of the earth going up when mountains go up and so on. Um, and we also want vertical grid stretching. So because uh, processes high up in the atmosphere uh, happen over larger scales and processes closer to the ground, uh, we want to stretch grids in the vertical direction. Um, and then we also want a wide range of different discretizations over the domains that we're working on. So for example, we want finite difference uh, discretizations, which is sort of the simplest case where you store the values of your state at a discrete set of points, and you can determine derivatives by taking finite differences of those values. And then we also want a set of different spectral element discretizations, like continuous Galerkin and discontinuous Galerkin, uh, where spectral element means that we're uh, decomposing our state into some, a, some a, a linear combination of polynomials and storing the coefficients of those polynomials. Um, and we generally want to be able to try out a very large number of different model formulations. Which variables do we use? How do we make those variables interact with each other? Uh, and we want to be able to very easily swap out different formulations and different integration schemes in order to determine what works best and what's most numerically stable. So it's very experimental work, and we're trying to come up with ways that make it easy for scientists to determine what works best. So moving on to Klima course, a bit of mathematical background. So at every point in the domain uh, x, we have some state at time t, uh, denoted by y of x and t. Uh, so as an example for a simple dry atmosphere, 
the state could involve the density rho and the potential temperature theta and the wind velocity at every point u uh, instead of theta we could use for example uh, energy e or energy density rho e um, and then a set of conservation laws gives us an expression for the tendency of the state so how it evolves over time and in this case i've written out the tendencies for each of the three variables it's advection plus source terms essentially and when the domain is discretized we represent uh, the state of our system with a state vector so for the finite difference case this is going to be the state at every single location of our finite difference discretization for spectral element this will be the coefficients of the um of the polynomials in every element and when we do this discretization, differential operators can then be expressed as matrices that act on y of t. And we're going to come back to that when we talk about uh, the Jacobian uh, computation. So because we want to be able to run our models on arbitrary domains, we use generalized coordinate systems. So here's a very brief rundown of what it means to use generalized coordinates. So in the 3D case, suppose we have three variables, psi1, psi2, and psi3, which represent our three special coordinates. Uh, each of these corresponds to a basis vector, which tells you which direction x, your current position, is changing when you vary each of the three generalized coordinates. And then we also have a metro tensor, which is the set of all inner products of these basis vectors. And here's an example for uh, spherical polar coordinates, uh, lambda phi r, which stands for latitude, longitude, and distance from center of the sphere. Uh, a vector can be expressed in several different ways. We can have the contravariant components, which are uh, the values that you, or the, the coefficients of the basis vectors that you sum over to get the vector itself. You can also express it in covariant form by contracting the contravariant components with the metric tensor, and you can also get the Cartesian components, uh, again, through the metric tensor. And all differential operators are expressed as some combination of basis vectors and derivatives with respect to generalized coordinates and the metric tensor. I won't go through the details of this, it's not super important, because the whole point of Klingberg core is that it allows us to essentially sweep all these generalized coordinates under the rug. We want to be able to write code that uh, is the same regardless of which domain that we're working on, which makes it a lot easier to program and debug our models. Uh, so on the whole, Klingberg core is a suite of tools that allows you to specify three things. Uh, discretized domain, a state on that domain, and then a tendency uh, of that state. So we're going to start off with how we describe discretized domains. Uh, we call these objects spaces, uh, which, and we construct them by using a series of lower level objects, uh, with the lowest level one being a domain, which just says uh, a region, which specifies a region of space and the boundary of that region. So is that region periodic? Uh, if it's not periodic, what are the names of its uh, various boundaries? Um, and then once we have a domain, we can specify a mesh, which tells us how to break up the domain into a set of discrete elements. Uh, then on top of that, we have a topology, which adds connectivity to information to the mesh. So which elements are, or sorry, which element faces are adjacent to which other element faces. Uh, this becomes very important once we deal with distributed computing, uh, because we need, if we have a group of elements on one, uh, computational node and another group of elements on a different computational node, we need to know which elements are connected between the two com computational nodes to know which information to send over. Uh, and then finally, once we have a topology, we wrap that in a space object, which stores, which, which is kind of a pre-computed cache of all useful numerical data related to a topology. So it stores the coordinate of every point, it stores the Jacobian determinant, the metric tensor, and so on. Here's a, the simplest example of a discretized domain. Suppose we want a 1D domain that goes from z equals z min to z equals z max. And it has, it's non-periodic, so it has a bottom and a top boundary uh, and z element elements. And so this is how we would specify that. First, we get the domain, then the mesh, then the topology, and finally, the space. Here's a bit more complex example. So now we want a rectangular two-dimensional domain with a spectral element discretization with polynomial order and poly. Uh, and this time, the, the domain is periodic in both directions. So we can specify periodic equals true rather than assigning boundary names. And this is what the code for that would look like. So now moving on to what we can actually store on top of a discretized space. 
uh, we call these objects fields, which are a combination of a space and a set of values. These values are stored in a flexible data structure called a data layout, which allows us to experiment with different memory layouts. So for example, do we want the uh, first dimension of the way in which we're storing our data to be the horizontal uh, element or the vertical element or the spectral element in, or the spectral element node within an element. And so we can experiment with all of these different layouts. And in turn, that allows us to experiment with different threading, model, threading models for parallelization. Uh, and the values that we can store inside of a data layout can be arbitrary data structures, as long as they're representable by a single base type. Uh, the most common base type we've been using so far is Flow64, but you can also go further and store a field whose base type is dual numbers. And this can be useful for doing automatic differentiation, uh, forward mode automatic differentiation. So here's a, a kind of random example of a field that we can create. Uh, so this is a, a field that we're allocating that stores a name tuple, where the first value A is a flow of 64, and the second value B is a covariant vector with two flow of 64s inside of it. And so by passing in one of the two spaces we defined earlier, we can define a field over uh, that space that stores this particular type of value everywhere. Uh, and fields also define some helpful overloads, like sum, which computes the integral of a field, and norm, which computes the p-norm of a field. Uh, and one thing to note is that a field is an array-like object, so its space acts like the axes of the array, and the data layout acts like the array itself. And this can be very useful for broadcasting, which we uh, extend through operators. So Julia's broadcasting already works for any array-like object. A uh, broadcasted function gets applied element-wise to all of its inputs, uh, and uh, any scalar values that appear in broadcast expressions are treated like array-like objects, all of whose elements are the same value. And multiple, multiple functions that appear within a broadcast uh, are fused together. So we create this new function-like object or pseudo-function that we can add to broadcasting. It takes one or more fields as inputs and outputs another field. It can't be used outside of broadcast expressions. Uh, it's, uh, its behavior is undefined. Uh, but when it's used inside of a broadcast, it gets fused with other operators and with ordinary functions. Unlike regular functions, operators are non-local, so they don't necessarily act element-wise. The value of a single point in the output could depend on the values at multiple points in the input fields. Uh, for example, when you're computing a derivative of a field, at a single point, you need to know the values of the field at the nearby points. Uh, and also the input and output fields of an operator don't necessarily have to have the same space. So you could also do more advanced things with operators like remapping from one discretized space onto another discretized space. Um, all of our differential operators are implemented, sorry, all of our differential operations are implemented uh, through operators. And to give an example, going back to one of our earlier slides where I said that the tendency of density can be expressed as the negative divergence of density times velocity. Here is a direct translation of that into code using the divergence operator. So on top of fields, we have this highest level data structure called the field vector, which contains one or more fields, not necessarily on the same discretized space. And this field vector provides a simple view into the underlying data layouts of those uh, fields that it wraps. And it's fully compatible with ordinary DFEQ. Uh, you can broadcast over a field vector, and that's equivalent to broadcasting over each of its underlying data layouts. And you can also use standard functions like copy, deep copy, fill, uh, and so on. Uh, so everything that gets run internally by ordinary DFEQ is defined for field vectors. So to run a simulation using any of ordinary DFEQ's explicit solvers, we just need to specify two things. Uh, a field vector y, which denotes the initial state of our system, and a tendency function, which takes in the field vector y and sets another field vector, which denotes the time derivative of y. And this is always implemented as a series of broadcasts over the different fields in y, uh, typically using various differential operators. So now moving on to why we can't just stick with explicit solvers. The states of our models. Hi, Dennis. Sorry to interrupt, but you have three minutes left. Uh, just wanted to point that out. Um, it, it would be nice if we'd get a question as well, but I just wanted you to be aware that you have three minutes uh, left okay. on your talk. Sure. Thanks. So 
uh, I'll skip the details of why exactly we need to, uh, why exactly we have very skewed meshes, but suffice it to say, we have extremely skewed meshes uh, with much smaller spacing in the vertical direction and then in the horizontal direction. And that means that if we just use explicit solvers, we'll be very highly limited by the uh, distance in the vertical direction. So we need to treat the vertical direction implicitly. To do that, we split our tendency into two pieces, an implicit and an explicit piece, uh, with the implicit piece only including operators that act in the vertical direction. Um, and the Jacobian for a finite difference discretization is uh, much simpler than the Jacobian for uh, spectral element discretization, uh, which is why we end up using finite difference in the vertical uh, and spectral element in the horizontal. We do still stick with spectral element in the horizontal because it's more numerically stable with explicit solvers. Uh, here is the, the previous example with the tendency of density rewritten now using uh, heavy splitting, horizontally explicit, vertically implicit. And so the first line of DTD row of the DTD row broadcast computes the vertical component using just vertical momentum W. And then the two other pieces, the vertical component using the horizontal velocity and the horizontal component are computed separately in the explicit tendency. So the structure of our Jacobian uh, looks like this, where every column is completely independent because again, the implicit tendency only uses vertical uh, operators. So no column affects any other column uh, in terms of the final tendency. Um, and within each block of the Jacobian, so within every single column Jacobian, uh, we can uh, write it out like this, where we have the derivative of the tendency of each of the fields inside of the field vector with respect to each of the other fields. Uh, in order to simplify the computation, we do uh, set a lot of these blocks to zero, which allows us to reduce the size of the Jacobian when we invert it. And oh, let's see. Yeah, so the, the Jacobian in each, uh, sorry, each block of this column Jacobian is a banded matrix, and we have mechanisms for uh, writing out the uh, the definition, sorry, for computing each banded matrix, again, using uh, broadcasts through this extended broadcast functionality. So we have this operator to stencil function, which converts any finite difference operator to an operator that then generates a block of the Jacobian. And so it becomes very simple to directly differentiate our code. And this is my yeah. last slide. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So yeah, more complicated uh, tendencies result in more complicated blocks of the Jacobian because derivatives sort of scale exponentially. Um, and as we add more and more variables and interactions between these variables, it becomes increasingly harder to write out the different blocks of the Jacobian. So we've been looking into automating away the process of computing the Jacobian for our implicit tendencies. And now ordinary DFEQ does come with a suite of tools designed for this, uh, but they're not particularly well suited for our problem because First of all, the sparsity pattern of our Jacobian uh, depends on the memory layout that we're using, and we want to play around with many different memory layouts. And also, these utilities for automatically computing Jacobians are really meant for arrays. And because we're using fields rather than arrays, this results in some inefficiencies. For example, there's no easy way to parallelize this computation across different columns. And so we're working on using field broad on further extending field broadcasts in order to completely automate the process of computing the Jacobian. And hopefully that will be ready within several months. And sorry. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, because we're a bit over time here, uh, we invite the speaker to answer these questions on um, on YouTube and discourse, right? So keep keep the chat going. Though we'll move directly to our next speaker, which will be Nicholas Korsbo, who will be talking about um, essentially uh, who will be talking about understanding heterogeneous health outcomes with SciML and Puma. So take it away. Hi, hi, thank you. So my name is Niklas Korspo. I'm a scientist at Pumas AI, and yeah, I'll be talking about uh, modeling healthcare. Um, so today we live in this age of patient-specific data, where we have access to data coming in from clinical tests or monitoring devices or medical images or omics, or even like wearables such as your smartwatch. But a key question is, what kind of information is actually predictive? And how do you utilize these predictive factors in order to make the best decisions? And so we think that effective use of data is one key component of patient-specific analyses. 
Another key component is the knowledge that we already have about our systems. So we're studying some specific disease or some specific treatment, and we might know something about the molecular interactions or the cellular interactions that are actually important for those processes. And we might also know some of the covariates that might be informative of patient outcomes. And all of that knowledge is highly important to us. So we don't want to just throw it away which is why we tend to do scientific machine learning, where the idea is then to combine data-driven machine learning with knowledge-driven modeling in order to then make the best possible predictions. So we'll have a look at modeling patient outcomes. And typically we want to see how a model outcome can, uh, how a patient outcome can evolve over time. So you might have data coming from a clinical trial where people have been tra tracked for a while, and you want to see what is driving the disease progression, what is driving the, the effect of treatment. So for that, you tend to use a dynamical system, so a set of ordinary differential equations. And now looking at the data, it seems as if we have a bit of noise in here, right? So we're going to add an error model to account for that noise as well. And if you look even more closely, you'll see that when you actually look at more than one patient, if you check many patients, you see that they are different and they are more different than you would expect from just some observational noise. And it's because like human beings are different. Um, and therefore we are modeling them with individual parameter values. And so these individual parameter values, they're coming from uh, some typical values that is shared amongst the entire population that we're modeling. And we have some random effects, which are distributions that characterize the variability between different patients. Uh, how much are they varying? And finally, we say that we don't just want to characterize the heterogeneity. We want to be able to predict it. Um, and there we use patient data. So the idea is that we want to be able to measure something about our patients and hopefully use that to inform us of what their individual parameters should be and therefore to better predict their, their outcomes. And so this modeling structure is called a nonlinear mixed effect modeling. And it's a pretty nice structure in, in the sense that you can encode your scientific knowledge. If you know about the molecular interactions that are important or about how covariates can affect the system, this is a nice way to encode that. But there is sometimes some problems in knowing what to do, how to create such a model. And this is where we're turning to machine learning. So first, just what is a, a neural network? The neural network is an information processing mechanism it's usually based on the ideas of a neuron, where every neuron takes a bunch of inputs, it processes that input, and it provides an output. You stitch a bunch of these neurons together in a network, and you get something that's quite good at processing information. And for us, it's important that mathematically, most neural networks are just functions. So neural networks are actually usable anywhere where you would use a function. And we use functions all over the place. And also, neural networks are universal approximators, meaning that if they're large enough, then they can approximate any mathematical function. And the functional form that they end up approximating is tuned by its parameters. And that parameter tuning can be linked to, for example, observed patient outcomes. And this gives us a way to use data to automatically discover functional relationships that might exist in our model. So coming back to the MLME structure, so what if you now have some input data that you just don't know what to do with? So you might have some, some data from blood tests or genomics, or you might have some images, and it's not at all trivial to figure out how to use that information. And this is where we are turning to something that we call deep NLM, where the idea is that we want to augment the model with neural networks such that they can automatically discover how to process that information in order to turn it into something useful. And thereby allowing us to explain why some people's fare well and some people's don't uh, for different treatments. And not only that, um, but we also might have trouble defining our dynamical systems. That's quite common that you don't quite know what, uh, what to model. And so again, if you're uncertain about something, you can just stick a neural network straight in there and have it uh, capture the interactions that you might be missing. 
So with this, we're hoping that we can create uh, good models to make good predictions. Uh, and this should all work because the neural networks, their functions, we have automatic differentiation in both the NLME structure as well as the neural networks. So we should be able to just train everything in, in concert, right? So now we'll have a look at accounting for patient heterogeneity. So here we did a synthetic analysis where we generate a or define a data generating model. We generate some synthetic data. And in that data, you can hide some pieces of information or you can have some noise. And then you use that data to fit a, a deep NLME model. And now, because we've used synthetic data, we know the ground truth. So we can evaluate success, which is something that is uh, a rare ability if you're working with real data where you have no idea what the true answer is. So does it work? So here I'm showing you uh, some synthetic data, and this is test data. So the model has never seen this before. We have access to the ground truth. So this is a population prediction from the data generating model. And here a population prediction means that we're not using the random effects. This is a real prediction, but it's from the true model. So the prediction is pretty good. Uh, we can have a look at a population average, which is a population prediction that doesn't use any of the patient data. So here the prediction is the same for every patient. Um, and this is something that we want to improve upon. Right? And then finally, we have a look at the deep NLME prediction. So this is a prediction coming only from baseline values. So this is information we had at time zero. We're using that information to predict a full time course. And we see that we can uh, match the, the results of the true model quite nicely. So here we have it for uh, four virtual patients, but virtual patients are cheap. So we can have a look at thousands more. And we see that the deep anatomy prediction matches the truth uh, really quite nicely. So does it work? I, I would say yes. Well, at least in this case, right? So here we have the synthetic data that was generated using 10 linear covariates where 100% of the patient variation was actually explainable by the data. And we were using 200 training uh, subjects. So it doesn't generalize to anything else. So we can have a look at bigger data. So here we're using 1,000 covariates instead, and that seems to be perfectly all right. We can have a look at different dynamical systems. So here, the and the data we generated is coming from a different dynamical model. And this approach is quite agnostic to that, so it works fine. We can have a look at nonlinear covariates, so where the, the relationship between the data you can uh, gather from your patients and their, their uh, individual parameter values, it's nonlinear, it's unintuitive, it's hard to figure out. But neural networks are quite good at capturing such things, so we're doing well here too. And then finally, we can have a look at imperfect covariates or data where you, uh, where only a small fraction of the patient variation is actually explainable within the data that you have. This is a common case. And here we see that the deep LNME prediction, it doesn't perfectly hit the data points here, but you wouldn't quite expect it to because it doesn't have enough information. And indeed, if you look at the true model, if you give that the same data and it uses the data in the correct way, then you see that the, the, the true model has predictions that are the same as the deep NLME model. So this indicates that the deep NLME uh, model has accurately identified how to utilize the data that it has. It doesn't overfit, it doesn't underfit, it uses the data that we have access to. So after we've done this, we can ask ourselves, what were the relevant prognostic factors? Uh, and one key question would be, what data is worth collecting in the future? So here we can ask ourselves, um, how much does each of the covariates help explain patient variability? And we can do thresholding here and say that if they're not important enough, we can stop sampling them. And this is important if we wanna go from a, a clinical trial setting where a lot of resources is dedicated to each patient into a hospital setting where you might not want to collect all of that, in, all of that data. Furthermore, we could ask ourselves what information or what relationships do the neural network actually discover? And so here we're looking at using symbolic identification from data-driven DFEQ um, in order to figure out what the neural network ended up approximating such that we can make the models interpretable. 
and so that we can map it back towards biology again and formulate new scientific hypotheses that we can actually test and sanity check. So next, we'll have a look at automatic identification of uh, dynamics. And so in this slide, we're going to assume that we have no prior knowledge, really. Uh, we want to identify both the prognostic factors um, as well as the entire dynamical system, all from the data. So we try that. And again, we see that, yeah, this just works. It works. And um, so what we did here was to have a fully data-driven and fully automatic model identification. And what's more, this took me about 15 minutes to run. Uh, and I say run, I mean fit, not just simulate, but to fit this. So that could be compared to the weeks and months that you might spend as a modeler trying to figure out how, how um, what your dynamics are. So once you have a fitted model, you can start making predictions uh, of it. So here we have a model that we trained on uh, one dosage regimen. So you see that we get one dose per week. And now you can ask yourself, what if we change the dosage regimen? So I'm going to um, double the frequency of the dosing, but just take half the dose each time. And we make a prediction there. And we see that the deep LNME prediction is, again, uh, spot on. And you can do the same if you increase the dosing interval and increase the dose. We again make perfect predictions. And it's sort of worth highlighting here that what we're making here is perfect predictions in novel scenarios that we've never trained on before. We've only ever trained on a single dosage regimen, and we're predicting other doses. And, and we are doing this on an individual patient level. And if you can do that, right, if you can make predictions for an individual patient based only on their baseline data, on what you can gather at time zero, now you can start really optimizing dose to them, right? Now you can start computationally optimizing their dosage regimens and how to treat them in order to achieve the best healthcare outcomes. So in summary, with deep anatomy, we can accurately account for patient heterogeneity we can uh, identify partial or even entire dynamical system. And with that, we hope to make uh, effective de novo model identification possible, as well as effective augmentation of pre-existing model where you already have a lot of information and you just want to see if you can squeeze a little bit of extra power out of your modeling. And in the very near future, we'll be looking at using entire images and omics and other pieces of uh, data all mixed together seamlessly in order to make the best predictions possible. And again, this should really work. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you and acknowledge the, the people that we've been working with, especially Chris Elrod and Julius Martinson. Uh, and I would again also like to say that uh, the deep the Deep Pumas team is hiring. So if you're interested in this kind of work, we have two positions open. Check us out. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. So we're looking at uh, the Discord and, and Slack and getting some questions. So one one question that I'll uh, that I have for you is, um, you know, what what's this translation? Uh, what what's the path to translation to to the clinic, right? So you know, like uh, you know, it's really nice to always have examples of, of something working on on you know example data and everything, but you know. Are, how is this going to, you know, change a clinical trial? What's what's the timeline that that's going on there? So it's already happening, right? So uh, we are developing this, like not in a vacuum. Uh, we are developing the core basic research as well as the software, while simultaneously doing um, consulting projects with uh, with other partners in in pharmacology. So this is already being used on the ground, and we're already squeezing information out of data sets uh, and finding that we we do get good results. We don't get the same kind of perfection that we've seen here because like we don't have access to perfect data at any time at all. But indeed, we seem to be beating the state, the, the previous state of the art. Yeah, and um, and a question that we have on the Discord here is: What types of scenarios would the clinic be open to trusting machine learning models? Like, you know, where where does this work with trust and and you know regulation? Like, what wh what's the point where we can say like, oh, you can trust the neural network to to choose your dosing mm. for you? 
Yeah, that's actually that's a good and tricky question. Um, regulatorily, it is being opened up a little bit to to machine learning or black boxes. You can probe them. You can you can see if they do any anything extreme uh, for extreme input, and you can sign it to check them a little bit. Um, so that gives you a little bit more confidence, but it's still uh, difficult. One promising approach is then symbolic identification, especially for the dynamical system. If you can symbolically identify what your neural network ended up uh, approximating, and then simply replace your neural network with that identified equation, then you don't have a problem anymore, right? You've used the neural network in the modeling creation or modeling definition, but you don't have to keep it when you move to, to hospital. And that makes your model interpretable and you can sanity check it, making sure that like it's not gonna blow up because some patient has some weird values. Right? Yeah, and we have a question from the YouTube now, which is how do you account for patient heterogeneity? Is there a specific hyperparameter in your model that accounts for it? Yes, um, yes, uh, like we have, here, so uh, patient heterogeneity, we account for it in, with the individual parameters, right? And we have this slush bucket term here, the random effect. So these are distributions that capture anything that's sort of left on the table or anything that, that we are unable to, to characterize, right? So the patient heterogeneity is then coming from the individual parameters, that's coming from the typical values, from patient data, and from the random effects. Yep, and that's about time. So everyone thank our speaker, Nicholas. Um, we'll be bringing in our next speaker. Um, so our next speaker will be Mar Marvin Hoge, which will be talking about neural ODEs in hydrology. So take it away. Thanks a lot. Um, so my name is Marvin. I'm a postdoc at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, and I will present the work of me and my colleagues on neural ODEs in hydrology as an example of using SIML software in applied sciences. So in its core, hydrology is about understanding and predicting the water cycle. As you can see on the right-hand side scheme of a river catchment, this water cycle comprises numerous interrelated processes. For instance, starting on the very right with evaporation, water enters the atmosphere, rains down, and gets channeled back into a larger water body. On that track, river discharge, also known as stream flow, is the central quantity in hydrology. Knowing about stream flow behavior is particularly important at the extremes of the water cycle during droughts or floods. Therefore, one major objective in hydrologic modeling is to predict and forecast the stream flow over time. As you can see in this example discharge time series for some random catchment, the blue model prediction matches the dots that represent discharge observations pretty well. The other major objective is to understand the processes within the system and to extrapolate them. That means to learn traceable relations or to transfer knowledge from one catchment to another. It also means being able to estimate the effects of hydrometeorological extremes like droughts or floods, and in the broader context, as we've also heard before, to assess climate change impacts. Traditionally, this is done with so-called conceptual models, often also called bucket models. These are based on the mass balance between inputs and outputs of the catchment and are formulated as ODEs. As you can see in the central scheme, there are forcings like the precipitation and temperature that drive the system. The gears represent the processes within the system and the output stream flow is modeled as a function of the model states. The advantages of such models are their physical basis and the interpretability and traceability of all processes. This is also important because data scarcity is a common challenge in hydrology. It is hard to impossible to fully equip entire catchments with devices to monitor all potential processes. So scientific assumptions have to be encoded to close that knowledge gap. The downsides of such models, however, are that um, good predictions require a lot of fine tuning and reiteration of the model setup. So it is usually difficult to use a model that was fitted on one catchment in other catchments. There's simply no generic model setup that works in every case. Recently, machine learning models became very popular in hydro hydrology and they have pros and cons 
opposite to the conceptual hydrologic models. They show highest predictive accuracy and come with transferability between catchments. However, their interpretability is limited and the representation of physics within the models remains hardly traceable. The models are either purely machine learning based, like with the long short-term memory LSTM neural network being the approach that has gained most traction in hydrology, or they are hybrid schemes, like the one shown in the center of the slide, where the output of a plain conceptual model serves as additional input to a convolutional neural network aside of the forcings. Compared to that, our hydrologic neural OD approach is also somehow hybrid, but stays within the conceptual model framework. To the ODE basis, we add the flexibility of the neural network and can thereby avoid fixed assumptions about processes or potential limitations within the model. A starting point, we use a simple hydrologic model called XP Hydro, and this one has only two states for snow and water storage and comprises five processes. There is snowfall as direct input to the snow storage and rain as direct input to the water storage, and melting is the exchange flux between these two states. Both evapotranspiration and discharge are outputs from the water storage. So we can simply write down the model as two coupled ODEs. Note that there are much more sophisticated models with more states and processes, but as said, there is no general model setup. In the plain conceptual model, each process is described by a fixed process equation as shown here for discharge, for example, in the original XP Hydro model, discharge depends solely on the water storage, uh, some variables um, and so some parameters and some additional relation for peak flow. This holds similarly for all other processes with ET or melting being also dependent on temperature, for example. In our approach, we replaced the terms of the right-hand side of the ODEs by feedforward neural networks, or one in that case, each of the five output nodes is assigned one specific process. The neural network has four inputs, which are the two external forcings, temperature and precipitation, and the internal model states of water and snow. This way, it is possible that the network also learns interrelations of the variables and their mutual impact on the processes. And this is what the model core in Julia looks like. First, we interpolate the external variables to make them time continuous. This is also not typical with machine learning methods in hydrology because the other shown approaches operate on discrete time steps. Then there's the neural network, which with its four inputs. In the following lines, the output nodes are then put together to represent the processes in the ODEs using some transformations and activation functions. And I want to highlight here that this approach also allows to specifically take in physical variables exactly at the place where you want them to be. Here, we take the length of day, L day, only as a factor to the ET term, as you can see in the bottom line center. This is a fixed physical value for a certain latitude and time, and it regulates transpiration of water by plants. So we also only want to have it act on this term and not as other input to the network. We applied this generic model setup to 569 catchments for which we have daily data of stream flow, precipitation, temperature, and so on. The data is from the so-called CAMELS data set that covers several hundreds of catchments all over the United States. And as shown on the right-hand side, you can see the distribution of mean daily discharge. For each catchment, we trained our model on 20 years of daily data and then evaluated the performance on the next 10 years. Therefore, we used uh, three criteria to measure accuracy in different flow regimes. First, we used the so-called Nash-Sutcliffe efficiency to assess overall flow and or flow prediction performance. And this one is based on squared residuals and has the optimal value one. This was also our loss function in training, so the model was optimized for overall flow. During testing, we also used something called percent bias in flow duration curve, high segment volume to assess peak flow bias. As bias measure, the optimum is of course zero. Finally, 
we measured flow flow performance with a modified NSE that takes the absolute rather than the squared residuals, but has the same range and optimum as the original Nash Sutcliffe efficiency. And here is what we got. Each column refers to one of the flow segments and the histograms show the corresponding metric values for all 569 catchments. Each line represents one machine learning model and the upper and central line um, refer to LSTM and the convolutional network models introduced before. The results for these two models are from the benchmark study by Jang et al. The bottom line shows the results from our neural ODE model. And as you can see, this model shows state-of-the-art performance. In this task of catchment-specific training and testing, the LSTM model in the top line performs worse than the other approaches. But um, you should note that LSTM research in hydrology has made much progress over the last years and remains state-of-the-art with best predictions in other tasks. Here in this task, the convolutional neural network performs already better in all metrics. And then our neural ODE model shows similar results to that for overall flow, as you can see in the lower left in red, but it shows again an improvement over the other models when it comes to peak and low flow in specific. None of these models are very close to the optimum values of the respective metrics, but this is very common in hydrology since observations are often subject to large uncertainty. So for example, Nash Sutcliffe efficiency values above 0.6 are already considered good. This improvement of the neural ODE approach is even more significant when compared to the original plain conceptual model, where you can easily see that the neural ODE model outperforms it in every aspect. The nice thing now is that with the neural ODE approach, we can also look at individual processes. On the left, the dependence of discharge to the water storage variable is shown for an example catchment. And as you can see, the fixed relation of the conceptual model in gray shows an increase that is too strong and therefore leads to an overestimation of discharge for high water storages. The learned relation of our neural ODE model on the other hand, covers the range of observed discharges much better, which also leads to better flow metrics. On the right-hand side, you can see heat maps showing the dependence of discharge on rain and water storage. And for the conceptual model, there is only a dependence on water storage on the y-axis. The neural ODE shows a similar trend, but the discharge magnitude also depends on rain. Now here for larger rain values on the x-axis, there appears to be a small decline in discharge, which could either be counterintuitive behavior in the catchment or simply lack of training data points in that high storage, high rain regime. Nonetheless, our framework specifically allows to investigate such relations. So in summary, we can say that this neural ODE model provides many of the desired features of a hydrologic model. It keeps the ease of interpretability and traceable physics, and it provides state-of-the-art predictive performance, and that even as continuous time solution, which as said is not given for other machine learning approaches in hydrology. And finally, the generic model set setup is highly transferable between catchments. So we think that the neural ODEs therefore have a high potential in hydrology, they provide a new level of conceptual modeling because processes do not have to be hard coded, but could be learned by neural networks. Of course, they can be kept fixed if desired, and this allows all kinds of combinations of variations. Neural ODEs demonstrate high predictive performance while being interpretable. interpretable. The hydrologic community has developed lots of tools to analyze individual processes for plain conceptual models and can now apply these tools to the neural ODE approach in a very similar fashion. And finally, the generic model setup already led to good results over numerous individual catchments, but also allows us to conduct large sample studies that simultaneously include multiple catchments. This is the current trend in machine learning and our approach could help us to find better relations that are uh, there better than those that are known today. Yeah, so, so yeah. With that, thanks a lot. Um, 
especially to the community that provides all these cool tools. Uh, if you want to take a closer look into that research, feel free to check out the preprint that is currently part of the submission process and also feel free to get in touch. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we got a lot of questions for you in, in the discourse. So let me pull one up here. Um, so one question was, right, so you had very, very nice results, right, you know, showing more, more accuracy and everything. Uh, this came out really well, but one of the things that we'd be interested to know is how fast is the learned neural ODE compared to the original model or the other, you know, model types? So the forward runs are incredibly fast, but um, the calibration takes quite a bit of time, that is true. So far, we, we ran that on only a CPU with about 2.3 uh, uh, gigahertz, and it took a few hours to, to calibrate it, to train it. But we're working on that. I think we have not fully exploded all the speed up options that we have. And um, yeah, and we, we could definitely talk about speed on you know discourse and everything. But um, another question that I see is that in the benchmarks, uh, do you normalize by size of, of uh, network? So, for example, is the performance improved because of an inherent mo better modeling approach, or you know, is it because of deeper uh, using a deeper ne neural network model? So far, not. So far, um, all the different approaches, like the LSTM approach or ours, we, we optimized the, the architecture of the networks that we used, and with that optimized already, uh, architecture, we then also performed all our model runs. Cool. And another question here is, uh, how important is interpretability in hydrology? I would say it's uh, extremely important. And this is especially the feature that is lacking in um, other machine learning approaches. Uh, there are people working on that and there's made much progress. But uh, with our approach, we introduce a new one that has that direct interpretability, um, like other conceptual models where you can directly say a certain term in my ODE reflects evapotranspiration and can therefore also be tested when conditions change as during climate change. Yeah, um, another question is, is there any plan uh, in the future for an application with a semi-distributed model? Um, not so far, but I'm happy to discuss the idea. Yeah, and um, what, are, what are some next steps that you see in, in your work? You know, are you going to be integrating things like symbolic regression or what are, what are some, some real world problems that you'll be solving with this? Can you describe yep. where, where, where this work will be going? So uh, using symbolic regression tools is definitely one of the next steps because now that our network kind of learned to extract the relations, uh, we would like to decode them and then finally get uh, to, to simple symbolic equations that we can also play around with as we usually do with the conceptual model equations. So that is definitely one route to go. And the other one I, I mentioned is that and this is a big thing in hydrology right now is large sample studies where you take many different catchments into account during training such that you get kind of like universal hydrologic laws that, that hold over various different conditions in terms of uh, climate conditions of catchments and so on. And we're working on that because then we could also solve that problem of having just um, scarce data on very extreme conditions, like as shown for, for peak flow or very low flow. Sometimes you just have only a few measurements, but you will need more to get reliable relations for flood prediction, for example. Yeah, so I think that, that this connects with one of our other questions here, which is, um, uh, also, can you can you explain something about the amount of data used for training? How many examples did you use to train the model and how many bytes typically is in a data set for you? So um, for the, the task that I just presented, we used these 20 years of daily data, which is about uh, uh, 7,300 data points for, for training. And then uh, for the testing, we, we used half of that. And um, with Going to multiple catchments, we, of course, would um, expand that by far because we have access to hundreds of different catchments, right? We could have tens of thousands of, of data points to train. Um, another thing that would be interesting here, but where the database is not as extended so far, is to go to higher temporal resolutions, which would definitely be very interesting because, for example, flood events occur within hours sometimes or within minutes and, and not over average daily values. 
Yeah. So another question we have is, um, how do you th how, uh, how do you think uh, neural networks would work for more complex models and and more processes and parameters? Um, that is a question we're also looking into. So um, this framework is applicable to all kinds of conceptual models that are out there, and the most sophisticated ones um, they already they also lead to, to very good results, but um, not as good as the ones we get with machine learning. And those uh, sophisticated conceptual models have several dozens of parameters and also uh, multiple states. So we have not tried it yet, but we would definitely be interesting in, in, in um, trying to boost these models too with our neural ODE approach. Yes, and I think that uh, last question here, um, Marvin, that's very, this is very interesting research. Um, in the beginning, you showed a time series with large spikes. How well does your neural ODE model predict these? Um, the, the, the beginning plot that I showed was actually the, um, the output of that um, neural ODE model. So, so I think most of the time we get much better results than you get with the other, especially machine learning um, models, because uh, they struggle with peak flow predictions. And um, overall, we also get very good peak flow performance measures um, there, as you could see with the peak flow bias, for example. So we see high potential there to, to match these peak flows even better once we have more training data and then more sophisticated um, um, also like process representations. And that would be a key thing to predict uh, floods and stuff. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, you know, if anyone has any more questions for Marvin, you can find them in the Discord or find them in the in the Slack chats. Um, and I think that we're going to move on next to our to our next speaker now. So our next speaker will be uh, Frank, um, who is uh, one. You know, he's also one of the developers in the SIMO ecosystem, known for do recently doing a Google Summer of Code in uh, in DiffEQ sensitivity. Um, for methods for differentiation of chaotic and hybrid systems. And he'll be talking about his, the work that he did there. So uh, take it away, Frank. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction, Chris. Uh, yeah, my name is Frank, and I'm a PhD candidate in the group of Christoph Bruder at the University of Basel. And the talk today will be split into two parts. So in the first part, we will um, treat these interesting chaotic systems where very nice uh, uh, features emerge. and you can already see these things in simple systems, such as um, classical double pendulum, but um, also in fields like fluid dynamics or climate models, you can um, see these chaotic behaviors. And in the second part of the talk, we will come to hybrid systems. So those are systems which are uh, have some discontinu discontinuities in the um, time evolution. So for example, we can have a, for, could have a kicked oscillator um, or like discrete switching time controllers, or also in pharmacology, one could consider um, models with some explicit dosing times. And just to recap for what ordinary differential equations and sensitivities are, um, an ODE can be written as this initial value problem where we have um, the ODE function that contains some parameters theta, and y would be the state of the differential equation. And then we say the initial value is the state y0 at time t0. And then typically we're interested in optimizing some form of loss function where the loss function maps basically the state and the parameters to some real number quantifying um, our objective. And yeah, then we're interested in saying how this objective changes when we change the parameters or also the initial conditions. And this is what we will call um, basically computing the sensitivities. In this talk, the main idea will be to show um, this kind of failure for conventional sensitivity methods um, in the case of chaotic dynamics and discuss alternative methods with, which we can use instead. And also discuss um, what we have to do if we have these kind of discontinuous events inside of this um, ODE. Now for this, it's first useful to recap what sensitivity analysis is. Um, is about, I mean, more in a nutshell, but the easiest way to think about it is basically to write your ODE solver, at least if you want to do this discrete sensitivity analysis inside of some um, package, which is compatible with automatic differentiation. 
And then you can either use forward mode AD or basically reverse mode AD to differentiate the steps which your ODE solver would take. Um, there's another approach to sensitivity analysis, and this is basically to derive explicitly the kind of equations which would um, compute the sensitivities for you. And so this is like, if you differentiate the ODE respect to the parameters, you end up with these so-called forward sensitivity equations. And very similarly, but a bit more involved is maybe the computation of continuous adjoint sensitivities, where you also derive basically a set of ordinary differential equations, which allow you to compute the sensitivities respect to the initial state and the uh, uh, parameters. And here I just want to point out that depending on the choices of um, the computation of re recomputing the initial state, which is needed for this vector Jacobian product here, or um, how to compute this integration part, you arrive at basically different methods. Now let's um, see um, or basically introduce what chaotic behavior is about. And we will do so for the um, Logan system, which is a simplified mathematical model for um, atmospheric turbulence. And so the model has basically here three coordinates or states, so x, y, and z. And we have three parameters, sigma, rho, and beta. And for the rest here, you can think that we fix um, sigma and beta and just look at the variation with respect to this parameter rho. Now, one of the fun features is that if we start at some initial condition here and we solve this Lorentz system forwards in time, and we do so by um, doing this two times with different floating point accuracies. So one times we solve it with flow 32 and once with flow 64, then we will see that at the beginning of this time trajectories, the two solutions basically agree. But then after some time, some of these oscillations, we see that the trajectories diverge. And this is a very common feature. We could at first maybe think that this is just due to the use of a specific solver, but you can actually also check that even if you use a very high order integrator with very small tolerances and you just um, include a small perturbation to the tolerance, you will um, you solve it two times, once with this uh, small tolerance and one with the same tolerance basically, but just a floating point perturbation, you will also get this kind of picture where the trajectories basically diverge after some time. And a bit more thoroughly, you can use tools from uncertainty quantification, where you basically map this kind of ODE system to some stochastic differential equation. Then you solve an ensemble of the, from the stochastic differential equations over time. And what you would see here is the, basically the z-coordinate of the Lorentz system as a function of time. And for, well, for some initial time, all of those um, trajectories from the ensemble will basically um, follow the same kind of trajectory. But then after some, after this characteristic time, which we call the Lyapunov time, we will see that basically the um, solution after the time is random on, on this attractor. So we can't predict then the future anymore. In more popular media, this would be called the, the butterfly effect, simply indicating that like a small uncertainty in the initial condition would propagate to a very large change um, in the long-term future. So we simply can't predict the outcome um, precisely after a long time. Now, there's one nice feature in this is that if we consider a long time average quantity, so we define our loss function um, as this limit of a time average. So where we here simply integrate some instantaneous loss function over time. And in addition, let's assume um, ergodicity, which simply means that this long time average quantity shouldn't change as a function of the initial condition. So each initial condition um, should yield the same long time average quantity, such that it only depends on the specific choice of parameters. Then for the Lorentz system, we can, for example, check that if we solve the system forwards in time and plot here the, this um, Z coordinate as a function of the time, then it has these strong oscillations and the time average would here be, for example, this red line. And we can repeat this average computation for different values of the parameter row. And it turns out that this actually has a kind of very smooth behavior. And if we start at this plot a bit uh, longer, then we will actually see that the slope of this objective with respect to the parameter row, so the derivative will actually be um, close to one. So we might think that we should be able in principle to just do 
sensitivity analysis on this objective and estimate this slope. However, if we now apply this kind of con conventional sensitivity methods like automatic differentiation or also just doing finite differencing, we see that these sensitivities are several magnitudes of, um, of order wrong. So we see here either a way too small value or like a way too large value. And in fact, it can be shown that this, um, yeah, this explosion of the sensitivity can be linked to the, this kind of Japan of time or differently speaking to the Japan of exponent. And so basically the Japan of exponent would be, uh, would indicate how strongly these kind of sensitivity tools um, diverge then. The maybe most intuitive solution to still compute sensitivities by these con conventional sensitivity analysis methods would be to basically um, try to average these um, largely fluctuating values or diver diverging values even over an ensemble of trajectories. And this is the so-called ensemble method. But it turns out that this actually does not always work. So in general, the kind of derivative of the average which we want to compute is not the average of the derivatives. And because these kind of these tangent solutions, which we would compute by automatic differentiation, are not bounded, but really diverge with this Yapunov exponent, we actually can't interchange the limits. So we are not, technically speaking, here allowed to um, yeah, swap the uh, long time behavior and, the, and the, sen the sensitivity computation. So the important question which you should ask at this point is, so the trajectories, though they diverge, and I mean, the position on the tractor is essentially random, you still see that they kind of have the same behavior, right? So um, they're not going completely crazy, but the both trajectories actually still lie on the attractor. And actually this um, fact is guaranteed by the shadowing lemma, or a bit more specifically, we can state the shadowing lemma as saying that um, there are actually initial conditions, so small perturbation to your system, um, which follow the true trajectory or the first numerical computed one. So not all of these trajectories will diverge, but there will be like a shadowing direction, like a, a direction or a, a, another solution that follows closely um, the first numerical solution. And the general idea is then, since this solution exists, it can be used to basically distill the kind of long time effect, which we just saw. So the effect that shifting rho basically increases the Z coordinate. So it shifts the attractor up and down from the two effects, which are combined in the, in the first place. So we have this um, chaotic butterfly kind of effect and this shift of the attractor. And by finding um, this shadowing direction, we can basically just distill this long time effect. And the main idea is to replace the initial value problem then by an optimization problem which simply tries to bound the norm of this um, diverging trajectory. And in fact, it turns out that this is then a well-conditioned um, problem. And since we bound the, can bound the norm by um, L2 norm, it's a least squares problem. Um, yeah, this method actually is then guaranteed to converge as a function of the square root of the time. Um, if we have, if the system is ergodic and if it's hyperbolic. However, the, the kind of this most easiest still method for these sh shadowing techniques um, still scales rather poorly with respect to the number of states and time steps. And so it's um, numerically rather expensive to do. Um, more sophisticated methods then actually build on the same intuition. So you still first sort of a numerical tra tra trajectory forwards, which is your reference trajectory. And then you find this kind of shadowing directory direction following the well, the first one. But instead of scaling with the number of states, you can show that you can do something more efficient and derive a scaling behavior with respect to the um, number of positive, positive Lyapunov exponents. And yeah, applying these systems in the Simon ecosystem will then basically um, boil down to just switching the sense alt argument in the solver. And you will see that then these kind of expected sensitivities of around um, 1.0 will be returned. Yeah, now we come to the basically second part of, of the talk um, where we investigate hybrid systems um, that are 
yeah, these systems which have a discontinuity in, in the time evolution. So as an example, we can consider a kicked harmonic oscillator where, um, yeah, which is written in a general form here for harmonic oscillator that can be written as a state and a velocity. And yeah, we basically assume that we have kicks to the velocity at some fixed time points. And so you see here that then in um, this picture of um, time evolution, you simply have then kicks here um, leading to this kind of discontinu um, discontinuous time evolution. And this is the one of the most easiest form for actually having this kind of event um, inside of the trajectories. And in general, we can have either explicit events. So ones as here above where the condition that the events happens just depends on the time. So for example, on a regular time grid, or we can have implicit events where the condition that the event happens does not only depend on time, but also on the current state of the system. And the main part in this second part will be that we now basically implement a correction term such that you can model these hybrid systems or and compute derivatives within the continuous adjoint sensitivity methods. Um, as an example, we can consider a bouncing ball where we have this set of differential equations and some um, initial conditions for the initial height and the initial velocity. And we will essentially let the ball drop. And then um, after some time, um, which is the event, is basically happening when the ball reaches the ground. So at, at z equal to zero, and the effect of this event will be that, well, the position essentially stays the same instantaneously, but the velocity of the ball will flip. And essentially, if it's an inelastic bounce, then we will have here a, a damping factor. Since this is a rather easy system, we can um, solve for this time trajectory analytically. And yeah, the solution is given as this form, just depending, so the event time will depend on the initial velocity and the um, initial height uh, and this gravitational constant. Now you can ask, well, is this bouncing ball actually now this first form of an explicit event that just depends on time? Because I mean, we can just solve it. Or is it an implicit event which depends on the state? Because well, we say something like z should equal, be equal to zero when it hits the ground. And indeed, once we have solved and it and basically insert the numerical values for the time evolution, in a forward simulation, we would not see any difference here for these fixed initial conditions. So the here trajectory for the z coordinate and the velocity as a function of time would look the same basically here for both of these callbacks. However, now, if we really um, go forward and treat the bouncing ball as this explicit event, event note that um, the impact time essentially is fixed. So different configurations for the um, initial conditions or the parameters will necessarily lead to some to a different impact time. So the ball could in principle bounce before it actually hits the ground. And the analytical solution for um, the trajectory um, looks like this way. Essentially, I just inserted here the, the specific value um, of this event time um, computed from the numerical values we assumed. And sensitivity analysis would tell us now, for example, how the height of the ball at the final time would change if we slightly perturb the initial height. And we see here that we can basically read off here that the sensitivity would be one in this case of modeling the ball with the explicit event. Now note that when we do the full modeling with the kind of explicit implicit event, where we say that the ball hits the ground when the z coordinate is zero. Um, in the kind of trajectory of the of the ball, um, it would hit it actually then here in this example later. And so it's really important that the kind um, that this impact time changes um, as a function of the state. And so the full analytic solution looks then actually like this. And if we take the derivative of this solution now with respect to the initial state, we actually get a different value of the sensitivity um, yeah, in this case. So it's indicating that we really have to include um, this modeling of the implicit events and we cannot, um, and explicit events in particular, ignore the, these kind of relevant changes in the, in the event time. 
the general idea is a bit um, lengthy to describe, but um, essentially for explicit events, since they are easy enough, you can just insert the correction term between um, individual solves of your continuous adjoint sensitivity method. But for implicit event, you have to consider your solver as some function which outputs not only your state, but in addition, the event time. Have to, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you have two minutes left. Uh, just thought I'd remind you. Oh, yeah, okay, it's a last slide, basically. And the general procedure is a bit lengthy, but um, it essentially relies on this idea and then implicit differentiation. Um, in conclusion, I presented to you this um, new methods for computing gradients, and specifically the new shadowing algorithms, which allow for differentiation also of these chaotic systems and these correction terms that are needed um, for hybrid systems. And yeah, uh, with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, we do have a question here from the, from the YouTube. Can you please elaborate on higher order derivatives? What is the roadmap to make the, uh, the output of the AD function uh, differentiable? Um, so, so in all of this talk, we just looked at first order derivatives. I'm not sure if there's any literature actually on combining the shadowing techniques for getting higher order derivatives. In general, in the, in the sensitivity packages, we basically just do something like a uh, backward over forward. And I think in principle, it should work. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if backwards uh, shadow adjoints I wonder if you can for if you do dual numbers on a shadow adjoint, that might give you a second derivative. That, I mean, that's 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 a great question for 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 a next step. Yeah, um, yeah, and I guess uh, another question is, um, you know, give, given what you've been doing with the differentiability, um, what what are some some next steps that you see for you know SciML in in this space of improving you know differentiability? Oh yeah, that's also a nice one. So so. I really think um, it's just a start on all of these techniques. So we have not too many use cases yet implemented. So basically it's literally on the Lorentz oscillator yet and really on relying on the bouncing ball. So it would be nice to have more example for people coming from, I don't know, engineering, having their switching time controllers or so being implemented in these kind of frameworks. And we see what kind of extra um, yeah, tools we have to add basically or um, how to modify the, the tools here. So it's like, I think it will be driven by interesting applications basically to, um, yeah, to see what's going on. One example from my own field would be differentiating of these quantum trajectories um, where you basically have an event depending on the state of your quantum system um, yeah, at a, at a given time. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, so, uh, with this, we'll, we're at 10.50, so this will bring us to our break. We'll, we'll be taking a 20-minute break on, uh, or a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern uh, Standard Time uh, with our keynote from Andreas Rosler. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, keep the questions coming. And remember that we have this discussion also going on in the discourse and in, in the Slack. So I'll just pull up the sl slides then for you know just the basic information.
Hi, Andreas. Uh, so I, I think I've just made us live, but Ron, John, or Chris, if I've messed anything up, uh, please let me know. Hi, Sam. <laughs> nice uh, to meet you. All, yeah. Uh, start in a couple of minutes. I mean, yeah. it's it's live in any case. So okay, uh, perfect. Nice to meet you, Andreas. Sorry, I'm not super familiar with this platform. I was trying to figure out how to communicate with you. <laughs> yeah, the same to me. <laughs> Hope everything works fine. Finally. Uh, yeah, but it's great to meet you, and I'm I'm very much looking forward to your talk. I'm gonna start introducing you one minute in a, like a minute, just so you can start your talk right on time, and we give you maximal time to talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it will be more a mathematical talk, so a little bit different to the talks before. Not so much applications, that's, but that's good for me. So. <laughs> Okay, so why don't we get going? Um, so, you know, uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us uh, for our first uh, keynote talk of SciMLCon. Uh, we're glad you can all be here. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Andreas Russler. I hope I, I've got your pronounced your name right. Who is a, prof a professor of mathematics at University Zu Lubeck, where he has been since 2011. Um, Professor Russler is a foundational figure in the field of numerical methods for stochastic differential equations. And he's made significant contributions to the development and analysis of Runge-Kutta methods for SDEs and more general numerical methods for SPDEs. Um, and recently he has some very interesting work on forgery detection apparently in images of human faces. Um, so I think today he's gonna tell us a bit about stochastic Runge-Kutta methods that allow for higher order approximation methods. Um, and in this, maybe a bit about an associated Julia library they've been developing for some of the tooling that play a role in those approximations. Um, so Professor uh, Russler, uh, thank you for being here and please take it away. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation to give this talk here. So it's a great pleasure for me and um, I think I will talk about a simulation of stochastic dynamical systems today. And uh, for this, we will uh, focus on Runge-Kutta methods. So these methods are especially designed for stochastic differential equations, as well as uh, stochastic partial differential equations. So the outline of my talk is as follows. So we, we start with a motivating example. So the question is, why should we consider random dynamical systems instead of deterministic dynamical systems? And after that, we will dive into the numerical point of view for uh, stochastic differential equations. So I will present you some numerical methods and describe how they work and what are the advantages of these methods in order to solve stochastic differential equations. And then we will see that um, one thing is very essential to get um, very good approximations and that are Levy areas. So we will spend some time on the simulation of these uh, Levy areas. And finally, I will, uh, in the second part of my talk, um, give you a, a small outlook to the application of uh, such methods to stochastic evolution equations or more specific on stochastic partial differential equations. So that's, that's the, the outline. And uh, so let's start with uh, the introducing question. So the question is, why should we do or why should we consider random dynamical systems? So I think um, most people know the, the very famous model of um, predator prey, which is uh, from biology. And um, so we can describe the, um, the size of a population. We have the population of the prey denoted by x1. And we have the predators. Uh, the population is denoted by x2. And this can be described by some lotka volterra ODEs, as they are given here, for example. And if you simulate such a model, you can see a behavior as it is presented in this picture here. So this looks very, very deterministic, very, um, we are repeating. Uh, so we have uh, uh, something that is that is a little bit boring, a biologist would say maybe. So this is, if you compare this with real data, this will not be the case that you see such a um, periodic behavior, let's say. And um, now the question is, what can we do to get more realistic models? 
And um, one way to, to come to more realistic models is we, we can consider the parameters that enter into the equations. And there we have uh, two parameters, that is the birth rate and the death rate for each of the two populations. And if we um, would introduce some uncertainty on these parameters, which change from time to time, then we can add some noise term to this model, which captures the uncertainty that's in, the, in these parameters. So if we add some noise to these two equations, and we, if we simulate now this, these two equations, then we get a realization which can look like this in the second picture here. And this looks much more realistic uh, to real data. And um, so it, it makes sense to consider some uncertainty that we don't know exactly. So we model this by, by some distribution. And uh, so the noise comes into the play. But you have to be careful now, because this is just one realization of, of, of the equation that we have if we enter some noise. And another realization can look totally different. And um, why should we simulate such realizations now? Now we are interested in questions on probabilities. What is the probability, for example, that the population size is larger than a certain value or gets below some, some limit or something like this? So if we simulate a lot of these realizations, different realizations, then we can get some information about the uh, probability distribution, about the probability that something special happens. And here we can see another realization uh, on the left figure. And then something very interesting can happen in a stochastic model that cannot happen in a deterministic model. So what we can observe in, in the last figure on the um, right-hand side is that uh, the population dies out. So this is a situation that can happen in a stochastic model. And um, we are interested in, in, in the probability that such an um, event occurs. What is the probability that the population dies out, for example? And this can be um, calculated with a stochastic model where we incorporate the uncertainty on the parameters. But this cannot be done with a deterministic model. So I think this is a, a good reason to uh, start to consider uh, models where we have uncertainty um, cons um, incorporated by some noise. And the question is now, how does the uh, noise look like such that we can um, get a reasonable model? So we start with an with a arbitrary ordinary differential equation, which is a model for many things. And now we can think about how to add some noise to this uh, differential equation. And um, if the noise term, or if, for example, the parameters in the last model are randomized or uncertain, and um, if we assume that this uncertainty changes from time to time, then we have to add a, a random process. So something that uh, depends on the time as well. And the most um, common process, the most uh, widely used process is a Brownian motion or called also Wiener process. And um, this is a very nice process because this occurs um, very natural if you start with a discrete time model and uh, go to the limit for, for a continuous time model. And then you, by a central limit uh, theorem argument, you naturally um, end up with, a, with a, a normal or Gaussian distribution, which is a key feature of the Brownian motion. So for those who are not familiar with the Brownian motion, just a definition here. So these are uh, four um, characteristics which describe a Brownian motion. And the most important one is that we have a continuous, in, in time, continuous process, and the increments of the Brownian motion are normally distributed and independent whenever the, the time intervals do not overlap. So we have stationary increments that are independent. Um, here we can see a simulation of a realization of a Brownian motion. On the left-hand side, a, a one-dimensional Brownian motion. Um, and on the right-hand side, we can see a three-dimensional Brownian motion. So this is a typical thing that you can use to model, for example, if you have some smoke uh, um, and if you consider one particle in the smoke and now you can um, observe how it evolves in the, in the space or in your room after a certain time. So this is a kind of diffusion that happens then. 
Okay. And if you if you use a, a Brownian motion or Wiener process in order to, to model the noise term, then you come to a stochastic differential equations. So there are many applications. Um, in principle, you can use any ODE um, model and add some noise to get a stochastic model. And uh, most um, or some some very um, um, popular models are um, the lotka volterra equations that we have just seen. Um, then we have the SIR model, which is uh, for epidemic diseases like COVID-19. Um, it is used in, in uh, computational neuroscience um, for circuit simulation. And there's a big field in, in mathematical finance where you want to um, calculate some option prices. And there are many more uh, applications, of course. So now I uh, have a closer look to the um, theory behind uh, stochastic differential equations. So what we have or what we start with is a probability space. Uh, we have a filtration usual, which fulfill the usual um, conditions and we consider a m-dimensional um, Wiener process or also Brownian motion cord. And then we need some drift and diffusion functions. So A is a drift function, which uh, gives us the, the the mean direction in uh, locally, so to say, and and then we have these diffusion function v j. Um, so these diffusions um, control the intensi intensi intensity of the noise component, and um, then we can um, consider a stochastic differential equation as it is given here. So this is written down as a differential form, but um, if you want to give sense to it in a mathematical sense, then you should consider uh, integral equations. So this can be written as an integral equation, but usually this is a shorthand notation that we use for differential equations. So we have the, the drift part, which comes from the ODE, let's say, and then we have these diffusion terms, Vj, um, which are driven by independent Brownian motions, Wj. And of course, we have an initial condition. This can also be a random variable, but um, can also be deterministic. So here in this talk, we, for simplicity, um, stick on some standard assumptions. So we assume that um, drift and diffusion functions are globally Lipschitz and uh, satisfy linear growth conditions. So this uh, assures that um, we have the existence and uniqueness of some solutions. Okay, this, these assumptions can, can be weakened, but for simplicity, we, we take these assumptions now here. So what we are interested in is uh, the approximation of, uh, of single trajectories. So we want to um, fix some, some small omega and uh, then we want to um, approximate one realization of our stochastic differential equation. Um, this is different to, to the point of view when we talk about weak approximation, where we want to approximate some distributional characteristics, for example, the, the expectation or the variance, perhaps like this. So if we have a look at the picture here, we can see um, 10 different realizations of a solution of a stochastic differential equations. And of course, we could also consider this, this red curve here, which is the, the mean, the expectation of the solution evolving over time. So this is much smoother, of course, and you can approximate this uh, with, with weak approximations much easier than approximating um, single trajectories, which are very, very rough paths um, which comes from the Brownian motion, which is a, a rough um, stochastic process. Um, so it's the Brownian motion is, is nowhere differentiable, and the, it's held continuous with an exponent less than one half. So it's a rather rough path. So this is why we get only low, um, or we can expect only low um, orders of convergence if we want to approximate these trajectories. So the first thing is that we have to discretize the time, which is done by these um, step size or these uh, time points T0 up to Tn, and we have a, a step size Hn, and we so we have a grid on the, on the time interval, which is denoted by Ah, and um, the approximation process will be denoted by Y in the following, and depends of course on the, on the step size H, and H will always be the maximum step size that we consider on this time interval. From, from T0 to capital T. T. So not, uh, now what is the, the error criterion that we want to consider? So we um, consider the, the pathwise or uh, strong approximation 
and that is we, we consider the root mean square error of our solution x at time point t and uh, approximation y at time t. And um, so this is a L2 convergence. And if the error can be bounded by some constant c times the step size h to the p, then we say our approximation pro uh, process or approximation method converges with order p. So in the most, most um, well-known and widely used approximation scheme is still the euler marie scheme, which is given here. So this is because it's easy to implement, easy to understand, and um, it's, it's really, um, I think, widely used. But um, um, in this talk, I want to show you that this can be done much better than with the Euler scheme. So the Euler scheme is, is simply considering the, the stochastic differential equation. And then we fix the integrands, um, the uh, drift function A and the diffusion functions B, and hold them constant on each time interval. So this is the idea behind. And then we have this delta W, which are increments of the Brownian motion. So these are simply normally distributed random variables that can be easily simulated. So this is a very um, simple scheme. And the order of convergence for this scheme would be one half uh, with respect to the root mean square. Now the question is, uh, how can we do these things better? And uh, so we want to um, consider some higher order approximation methods that are efficient in some sense. And therefore, I want to um, present you the, the class of uh, stochastic rungen kutta methods, SRK methods. And um, these methods allow for approximations with some higher order of convergence. So the methods are, are given, the method is given here. So um, we have the, the scheme itself, in, um, which is a recursive formula. And uh, we go with time steps. and um, what is important is we have some stages. We have the stages H0, which enter into the drift function A. And then we have the stages HK for each diffusion function VK. Now, um, further, we have to simulate um, these random variables um, IK and ILK. So these are IK are increments of the Wiener process, which are normally distributed, so they can be easily simulated. But uh, the random variables i, l, k are iterated uh, stochastic integrals, and these are hard to approximate. So I will come back to this point later on in the talk. So such a, a stochastic rungen kutta method is, um, is somehow defined by its coefficients. And the coefficients in the scheme are the weights alpha i, and uh, the coefficients which are in the stage values, which are a, zero and a one. So these are the, the blue coefficients which correspond to the truth function a somehow, um, scaled by the step size h. And then we have uh, further coefficients uh, beta one, beta two, um, and b zero, b one, which correspond to the diffusion function and to the stochastic part of the method. So um, these coefficients uh, can be Summarized, uh, we can write the, the weights alpha, beta 1, beta 2 in some vectors, and we can write the coefficients a and b in some matrices. And then we can um, put them together in a so-called Butcher tableau, as, is, as it is given here. So we can summarize all coefficients in such a tableau. And then, yeah, we have to think about um, choosing nice coefficients such that we can have a, a high order of convergence. Yeah, and we can calculate order conditions for such a scheme, which are given here. I don't want to go too much in detail, such, so just telling you that you can solve these equations to calculate some coefficients for the scheme. And um, then you can guarantee that you have a order one, um, 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 uh, an, a strong order one approximation scheme. And the proof can be done by color to the theory. So now we, we put in some coefficients such that we have an order one scheme as it is given here now. And we can see that we need three stages now. So we have um, H1, which is equal to Yn, so I didn't write it down again. And we have these H2, H3 stages for the diffusion function V. And then we can uh, uh, think about the computational effort of such a scheme and compare it with well-known schemes. So the computational complexity um, is um, considered as the number of function evaluations that we have to uh, calculate in each step. And if we compare this Runge-Kutta method with some well-known schemes like the Runge-Kutta method, 
proposed in the famous book by Cluden and Platen or with the Milstein scheme, which is well known, which is the Taylor scheme, then we can see that the computational effort for a d-dimensional di system of SDEs, um, if we consider the evaluation of, of the diffusion function, then we have m squared times d. Um, and for the Milstein scheme, we have d squared times m evaluations. And for our Rung Kutta method, we were able to um, break it down to a linear dependency on the parameters m and d. So d is the size of the system. We have a d-dimensional system of uh, SDEs, and m is the number of prone motions, of independent prone motions driving the system. So here we get a reduction, and um, this is a very significant if you consider large dimensional systems. So the savings are immense if you have um, high dimensional systems that you want to simulate. So these Rungakuta methods are very efficient um, due to the design of the stage values. But we have to keep in mind that we, um, for all of these methods, all over order one methods, we have always to simulate the iterated stochastic integrals. And this is another question which is uh, very important for the implementation. So that is now the, the next question. Uh, why are Levy areas are essential for um, higher order approximation methods? And um, yeah, such a uh, iterated stochastic integral as it is given here can, can be split into two parts. So the first part is, is the first summand on the right hand side here, which can be easily simulated. We only need the increments of the, of the Wiener process, process, which are, are normally distributed random variables. And then we have these, um, these terms A, I, J, which are the so-called Levy areas. And the problem is now that uh, we don't know the distribution of the Levy area. So we can't simulate it exactly. And um, so we have to, to think about an approximation of these Levy areas. And um, yeah, many people have been thinking about this problem. And um, starting in 1988 uh, by Milstein and then Klöden, Wright, they proposed an algorithm which is based on a Fourier series expansion of this term. And um, however, the drawback is that the computational complexity um, is if C is the computational um, cost. So it depends on C to the minus one half. So this is not very interesting to use these methods because then you can also use a, a, a euler mariama scheme directly, which has the same computational effort for the same error. So this is not, makes not much sense, sense to uh, use such an approximation method. And then in, in 2001, um, it was Ryan and Victorson who came up with a new method. And here for the first time, they, they improved um, the computational complexity to C to the minus one. And from this point on, it, it was possible to apply such higher order methods um, like the Milstein scheme or Runkuta methods, uh, because now they, they can be better than the euler mariama scheme. And however, in the starting, um, this was only possible for two-dimensional Wiener processes. And then uh, Victorson um, presented an algorithm in 2001, which also works for general high-dimensional Wiener processes. And um, this has been generalized as uh, some other works here and has been generalized in uh, cooperation with Claudine Leonard, uh, where we um, um, generalized this for the SPDE setting, for the infinite dimensional setting. and um, very recently, together with Jan Honkovius, we um, were able to improve this algorithm by Victorson. Um, it's the same order of convergence, but a better constant, so we can save a, a computational effort. And that's what I want to talk about next. And um, therefore, we we start with the idea behind this. So as I said before, we have a, we consider a Fourier series expansion of a so-called Brownian bridge. And if we consider this Fourier um, series expansion, we get a representation of the Levy area as it is given here. And the Fourier coefficients are the A and the B random variables, which are simply normally distributed independent and can be easily simulated. So we can put this into a matrix form, which is A of H and uh, vectorize everything. Then we get the expression given here. And now the idea is to truncate this series for an approximation. So we can truncate this after p summons, and then we have some remainder terms, r1, r2. And um, the idea is now to approximate also these remainder terms in a suitable way. So the first term, ap, can be simulated directly. This is the finite sum. And 
the remainder terms have to be approximated in order to get a better approximation order. So the algorithm that we propose works as follows. First, we, we approximate or we simulate this truncated uh, Fourier series, uh, which we only need, where we only need uh, normally distributed independent random variables. So this is easy to implement. And then we approximate um, the first remainder term R1 by this expression here. So here enters also a normally distributed random variable. And this is not really an approximation, it is exact. Yeah? We know the, uh, the distribution of the reminder term R1, and we can do this exact here with the exact, exact uh, distribution. And then the second reminder term R2 is uh, approximated because this is only conditionally Gaussian distributed. And um, making this, um, so the idea is, is uh, the same as by Victorson, who uh, proposed this idea first in a seminal paper 2001. And um, we, we just modified this idea a little bit um, to improve the, the algorithm. And here we, we use also a standard uh, Gaussian random variable, which is uh, which we have to simulate, can be easily done. And then we have to um, approximate this remainder term R2 by this expression here. So all we need is just to simulate uh, Gaussian random variables. That's, that's easy to do. And at the end, we, we put everything together um, to get uh, the iterated stochastic integral values that we need for the approximation method. And they are somehow anti-symmetric in, in a certain way. So uh, for i less than j, we have the first expression and um, the other ones we get by turning the switching the, the, the sign somehow. So that's the, the algorithm which can be easily implemented. and um, yeah, if you can compare this with the algorithm by Victorson, we get an improvement by a factor square root five. So this is a, um, a factor which is uh, a factor where we need less computational effort by a factor square root five. And uh, in addition, um, we have to calculate uh, a certain uh, covariance matrix, which is also is very easy. In our algorithm, it's just a diagonal matrix; it's an identity matrix. Whereas by Victorson, we, we need to uh, calculate the square root of such a um, general um, covariance matrix, which is also uh, costly computational. And um, this new algorithm has been implemented uh, by Felix Kastner, who did a very nice job there. And there's now a Julia, Julia package available, which is called Levy Area. And uh, so we can use this uh, very fast algorithm very easily now for, for any um, higher order approximation method for SDEs. And um, yeah, if you consider the computation cost of this algorithm and put this together with an order one approximation method, um, then you can consider the error versus the computational effort, which is that what we are interested in. And this uh, gives us the so-called effective order of convergence. And this is not uh, any more one as it was for the, for the scheme itself. Uh, so order one with respect to step size, but if we consider error versus computation effort, then due to the simulation of the iterated stochastic integrals, which is very costly, the order drops down to two over three for such uh, for any order one method. But this is still more than one half uh, that we can expect for the euler mariama scheme. So it makes sense to use this higher order methods. That's the, the crucial point of my talk. You, you should um, apply order one methods, but you have to keep in mind that you have to spend a lot of work in the simulation of the iterated integrals. But anyway, at the end, we get an order two over three, which is more than one half for the euler mariama method. Considering some uh, numerical examples, just I uh, uh, want to go fast through it. So this is a system of, of some SDEs, uh, two-dimensional two system and a four-dimensional Brownian motion driving this SDE and it's a non-commutative uh, case. And uh, what we can see here for the simulation results is uh, on the left-hand side, we consider error versus step size. So we can perfectly see order one half for the Euler method and order one for the Milstein method and the Ruhn Kutter methods, but this is not what we should look for. We should look on the right hand side where we have the error versus the computational effort. And this is what we are interested in because we want to consider error versus computation time. And there we can see the improvements of the Sarsic Ruhn Kutter methods compared to the Milstein scheme and to the um, Ruhn Kutter method. Um, that has been proposed in, in recent literature by Glöden Platen. So we, we get the reduction of the computation effort by a factor. So this is the shift of the curve um, to the left hand side. And the blue line here is the result of the Runkutter method. And the red line here is what uh, we get by the 
we could have mass effect load in plasma, and if we increase the dimension of the system, so if we consider another example, which is a linear stochastic differential equation here, so we can increase easily the dimension, and we have an, an explicit representation of the solution, which is given here. So we compared with a just exact solution, we don't need a numerical sim, uh, simulated solution as a reference solution. Then we get um, improvement on, on the right-hand side, error versus computational effort. And here we're saying we can see how the, the improvement increases as the dimension grows. Now for dimension 10, we, we can see uh, a very better res results uh, com of the Rungekutta method compared to the Mischstein scheme and compared to the Rungekutta method by Klöden Platen. Um, so the blue line is, is the best um, scheme here in this example with, uh, with the smallest computational effort. So what have we seen in this talk? We have uh, seen that um, um, stochastic differential equations are important for, for many models. We have uh, seen that there exist efficient um, approximation methods of higher order, order one stochastic room quarter methods, and that we need a very efficient um, simulation method for the Levy area, which is very important. important. And what I've not talked about in this talk is uh, about stability issues, about uh, stochastic differential Asher-Pike equations where I've been working on. I have not been talking about weak approximation or some geometrical numerical integrators. And there are many more results, um, just to mention a few of them. Multi-level Monte Carlo is very important for weak approximation. There's a lot of uh, research going on on non-standard assumptions, um, irregular thrift functions, and so on. Um, there has been done a lot of work uh, for step size control uh, in connection with stiff equations. And there have also been some people working on differential equations with um, not only Brownian motion, but fractional Brownian motion, sham process, Levy process, and whatever kind of noise process. Okay, there's a lot of things going on. And now I'm coming to the second part of my talk. And um, this is the stochastic evolution equation part. And I just want to give you an idea, not going too much into details now. Um, so what we considered here is a similar uh, stochastic partial differential equation as it is given here in the middle. And um, there we have um, an operator A, which acts on, on X. And uh, here we assume A is a generator of an analytic semigroup. And we have a nonlinearity F and we have a diffusion operator B and the, the whole solution of the SPDE lives in a Hilbert space H. And um, now we have not a Wiener process, but a Q Wiener process, uh, which is uh, also a Hilbert space valued um, process, which lives in the Hilbert space U. And we are considering mild solutions as they are given here. We have the uh, semigroup E to the H times T, which um, gives us the solution in, in this uh, form as it is given here. And um, okay, I'm, I'm not going too much into details, just to give you an idea how it um, works for the infinite dimensional setting. Um, now we need a lot of assumptions, technical assumption. I'm not going into detail here uh, on the operators and so on. Um, what is important is that um, our operator A has some eigenfunctions, which are uh, orthonormal basis of our space H and uh, that we can represent uh, the operator A in this uh, spectral form as it is given here. We assume for the non-linearity F that is twice continuously differentiable and uh, both derivatives are bounded somehow. And for the diffusion function B, we assume essentially that it's also twice continuously differentiable bounded derivatives. And we have a linear cross condition we have a kind of Lipschitz condition for B prime B, and we have this artificial condition, which is given here in the last uh, inequality. And there are a lot of parameters, but don't care about them. That's not so important uh, for, for this talk now here. For the initial um, condition, we assume that uh, there exists a fourth uh, moment, which is finite somehow. Now, there's also been a lot of research going on at the moment on this uh, SPDE stuff, and just to mention, um, one work here, this is uh, the work by Arnulf Jensen and Michael Röckner, 2015. Uh, they came up with a Milstein scheme for SPDEs. And this, is, uh, this was the starting point for our research when we tried to uh, design a derivative-free method uh, of the same order of convergence, but uh, with, improved, um, with an improved design so that finally we can 
also increase the order of convergence compared to the original, original Milstein scheme. And that's what I want to show you uh, very shortly now. So there are two things to do now. Um, we have to discretize the, the space. So we have to project the Hilbert spaces, which are infinite dimensional, to some finite dimensional subspaces. So this is the spatial discretization somehow, which we do by projection operator PN. So we uh, consider here a spectral Galeakian approximation. And then we consider discretization of the time, which is uh, done by um, equidistant discretization with step size H. And then we can uh, expand the, the Q Wiener process in a series, as this is given here, where uh, we have some scalar Brownian motions beta or increments of, of, of these Brownian motions delta beta, which enter to the series. We have these uh, eta j, which are the eigenvalues um, of the covariance operator Q for the Q Wiener process. And we, here we have the eigenfunctions of the Q Wiener process, which are autonormal basis of the space U. Although well, this can be very easily be simulated. And um, now for simplicity, we assume um, a commutativity condition. So we assume that P prime B uh, is somehow symmetric and the two arguments U and U tilde, so we can switch them and it's, uh, it's the same somehow. And this allows us to only to, to need uh, increments of the Q winner process. And then the derivative free Milstein scheme can be written down in this form here. So the first part, the first line is essentially um, an exponential Euler scheme. And then the rest of, of this uh, scheme is an approximation of P prime B somehow. And um, the most important thing here is, you don't have to go into details here, but the most important thing is that uh, we, um, we did this in a, in a very sophisticated way, such that we can reduce the computational effort uh, around a little bit out of time. Huh? Just, but just giving you a five minute warning till the next talk. So yeah, okay. feel free, so, don't push, but just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Um, so we, we can prove um, um, convergence results and um, I want to uh, jump to the simulations. Um, so we consider a, a Laplacian operator here and then we get a reaction diffusion equation as it is given here and then we can apply this method. And this is very similar to the SDE setting, but now we get a improvement of the order of convergence not just a reduction by factor of the computational, but an improvement of the order of convergence. So the Q line is the uh, Prokhorst von Kutta method, and we get uh, the highest order of convergence compared to the original Milstein sch uh, scheme, which is here in magenta uh, color. And then we have the result for the exponential Euler method and linear implicit Euler method, green and red line, which are really the same. And we get, can see we get an improvement of the order of convergence. So this is very interesting. We have a derivative-free method and higher order of convergence. And another example with a nonlinear diffusion that we used, um, the same effect. And here we can see the Milstein method has the same order as the Euler method, but our computer method can improve the order of convergence. So what you can take home is that higher order methods are very efficient, but uh, in the general case, you have to simulate iterative stuff integrals. Uh, expect of the situation we have commutative noise, then you can uh, work with increments of, of the um, PINA process only. So thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you for a really nice talk. Um, we, we do have several questions uh, posted on Discord, and um, there were a bunch of questions about uh, multi-level Monte Carlo. Um, and um, so I think I might want to turn off the, the close the YouTube tab. I think there's oh, an echo coming in. There's an echo coming in. Uh -oh. Yeah, on on your on your audio feed. Uh, uh -oh. Is there still an echo? Uh, now it's fine. Oh, that's weird. That was a completely different computer that yeah. didn't shouldn't have even had the microphone on. Okay. Um. Anyways, uh, my apologies to everyone. Um. So. Uh, I think Chris kind of summarized maybe a, a bit of the issue, which is, could you comment kind of on the trade-off between, say, variance reduction using multi-level Monte Carlo versus, you know, increasing accuracy ver ver versus higher order uh, methods? You know, is, is there a lot known about the kind of trade-off between the two and which is going to dominate? Yeah. Um, so the multi-level Monte Carlo method is for more or less for the weak approximation situation where we want to approximate expectation of, of something functional applied to the solution. And, and these methods are really designed for the for the strong approximation, L2 error. So this is a different error criterion. Uh, you can use them for multi-level, but this is not efficient. I would not recommend this. 
So you should rather use um, uh, very um, specialized methods for multi-level. And um, I think there exists a, a Michelin method, um, which is it's based only on increments of Tocconi motion, which is very fine. And uh, we are working on, on a Runge-Kutta method for this, this version. And um, otherwise, you, you can combine strong approximation methods, Euler method for strong with strong approximation properties together with a weak approximation method on the finest level of the multi-level Monte Carlo. And then you get also very nice results. But uh, these methods I presented today are, are not um, recommended for, for, for weak approximation. It's, it's, I, today I only spoke about uh, strong and L2 approximation. Oh, great. Um, I, I actually had a question um, to, um, so I guess uh, one thing I, I wonder about is I do like a lot of simulations of reaction diffusion systems. And so I wonder about, you know, with these kinds of methods, have you investigated or are there adaptations of them to try to be positivity preserving for solutions or to try to recover mm -hmm. stationary distributions? You know, I assume the convergence results are finite time in general. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, these are very interesting questions, especially for, for the SPDE um, setting. And I have to say we are only at the beginning, um, or for myself, I have to say, we, we started to to um, prove conversions for these results, uh, for these methods. And uh, we are now working on, on um, methods where we don't need this commutativity condition. And this works also very fine uh, together with the iterated just integrals. But um, now the next step is to consider stability issues or uh, positivity to serving or whatever you can think about. But um, the first step was for us to, to have a method that converges. And now we, we can think about how to modify these methods such that they have nice properties, as you as you mentioned. And but this is uh, not we are not um, coming along this. Uh, so this is maybe on the plan for the future future, future projects. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's very important. Okay, great. Well, I think uh, we we need to move on to keep on schedule. But thank you again for the talk, and I'll, I will okay. give you. The last thank you very much. Um, all right. So I'm gonna. Uh, remove him from the stream uh, and add Yingvo. Ah, oops, sorry, Yingvo. Add yourself, Yingvo. <laughs> okay, pa my sorry, apologies there. All right, so our next speaker is uh, Yingbo Ma, uh, who I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with his work if you use Siamo tooling because he's worked on almost all of it, it seems like. Um, so Yingbo, please tell us about the internals of modeling toolkit. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm Yingbo, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the internals of modeling toolkit today. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a research engineer at Drake Computing working on modeling and numerics. Um, and most of this work was done when I was a undergraduate at UMBC. Um, and I had a part-time position while I was in the university. So speaking of modeling, um, the most common formulation is ordinary differential equations, which uh, the derivative of the state is simply equal to uh, a possibly nonlinear relation between uh, the state parameters and time. But there are several drawbacks uh, of ODEs in the context of engineering. So for instance, if we want to simulate circuits, um, we want to express Kirchhoff, uh, Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law, uh, but then those are not different equations. And another limitation, for instance, is that in the setting of multi-body dynamics, uh, when we have constraints on the length of the component, um, we cannot express that in uh, ordinary differential equations easily. So really, in the engineering setting, we want to use ordinary differential equations with explicit constraints. So in other words, differential, differential algebraic equations, uh, which is simply a possibly nonlinear relation between uh, the derivatives, states, parameters, and time. For instance, the pendulum equations from before are precisely in this form. Uh, and today we are going to use the RC circuit as a model example to show the capability of modeling toolkits and the internals of it. Uh, one might argue that uh, to simulate an RC circuit is simply a single ordinary differential equation. So uh, why do we have to do all these extra steps to model the simple RC circuit? Uh, the point here is that we want to model it in a composable way where we model each physical component individually 
and connect them later um, as needed and simplify the, uh, the connected system by a computer instead of by hand. Um, so in here, we are going to build a model for the register, the capacitor, and uh, the voltage source. And each simple circuit component is characterized by uh, the current and the voltage. So in here, we first define a connector component, uh, a pin model, where it only has the voltage and the, the current. Uh, the current is annotated as a flow variable, meaning that in each junction, the summation of all the voltage uh, of all the current uh, is zero, and in each junction, all the voltages are equal. So the contact, uh, and then we need to define a ground. Uh, so the concept of a ground is often skipped uh, in introductory physics class, where. Um, but then it's kind of important in the simulation setting because all the voltage are only defined to be uh, relative. Uh, so if we have a particular solution, then any constant difference in the voltage is also a solution. So to make sure that we have a unique solution, we want to set a component uh, voltage to zero, and that is the ground. Uh, to simplify the modeling process a bit more, we can uh, use the idea of object-oriented programming, where we abstract away intrinsic physical constraints of a whole class of physical components, and then extend the space model uh, by specific equations later. Um, so a abstraction for all the simple um, circuit models with two terminals are simply that uh, the voltage drop of this component is equal to the voltage difference between the positive terminal and the negative terminal. Um, and the current is conserved. So the positive terminal's current plus the negative terminal's uh, terminal's current uh, equals to zero. And the voltage of this whole component is simply the positive terminal's uh, voltage. So this is kind of like the boundary conditions of PDEs where uh, where those are the physical constraints. And to fill in the details, uh, we need to expand this um, base model. So for instance, the resistor, to uh, define a resistor is simply a simple uh, circuit uh, component with two terminals. And it has the internal equation that uh, the voltage drop is equal to the current multiplied by its uh, resistance. And the capacitor is a uh, circuit component with two terminals where the derivative of the voltage is equal to uh, the current divided by its capacitance. So this is kind of like the interior conditions of uh, PDEs. Um, to instantiate a, the RC circuit, we simply first instantiate all the components, the resistors, capacitors, constant voltage, and the ground, uh, and then simply connect them uh, in a loop. Uh, after instantiating it, we notice that there are only 17 equations uh, and 20 states. To have a balanced model, we want to have the same number of equations as the number of states. Uh, that is because the connect statement might generate more than one equation. So after running the expand connections uh, function, we get a balanced model where we have 20 equations and 20 states. Uh, as we have saw before, that um, the RC circuit is characterized by a single uh, ordinary differential equation, and now we have 20, num 20 equations. Uh, it seems to be extremely costly numerically than what it should be. Uh, this is where the optimization of modeling toolkit comes in. Uh, and our first observation is that all the algebraic equations are linear and uh, con with constant coefficients. Uh, and most of, most of them are homogeneous. So if we have a algorithm that can be run on a uh, linear subsystem with integer coefficients, and it's fast and, uh, and always truncation error, that would be great. And the solution is to use the Bryas algorithm. The Bryas algorithm exploits the fact that uh, the determinant of integer value matrices is also integer. And he proved that uh, 
this algorithm is always fraction free. And because it's fraction free, we don't have to use costly rational arithmetic. And um, because it's specialized for integers, we don't get any truncation error. So this is ideal for uh, modeling toolkit. So in the implementation of alias elimination inside the modeling toolkit, we first collect all the linear homogeneous equations, and then we apply the Bryas algorithm to remove the redundant equations and aliases. Uh, removing redundant equations is important because sometimes uh, doing component-based modeling, we can generate uh, degenerate equations where they are they are basically saying the same thing, but uh, uh, which may, which will make the uh, Jacobian of the model singular. So we definitely want to remove all the redundant equations. Uh, and aliases is, is um, just simply in the form of a equals to b or b equals to uh, minus b equals to a. Uh, and then those are the lines where those are implemented. So after running the alias elimination, we get seven equations instead of 20 equations. Uh, to optimize this system all the way down to a single ordinary differential equation, uh, we need another process called tearing. So consider this uh, nonlinear system of equations. Uh, if we suppose we already know the variable u5, uh, then we can solve for u1 from variable u5, and then we can solve for u2 from the variable u1 that we got from u5, and then so get the variable u3 from u1 and u2 and get the variable u4 from u2 and u3. And then notice that we get back uh, variable u5 from uh, variable u4 and u1. And then we notice that we assume variable u5 is known and then we get back a variable u5. So basically we can substitute uh, the first four equations into the last equation. Uh, and we reduce the system of five uh, nonlinear equations into just the one single nonlinear equation. Uh, this makes uh, a single nonlinear equation is much easier for numerical solvers to solve because we, if, if we want to run Newton iteration, we evaluate the Jacobian matrix and do the IO factorization. If we only have a scalar, then we only have a scalar division instead of computing the IO factorization of a five by five matrix. Um, so we want to let, uh, write an algorithm that does this automatically. And the MTK is, in, uh, is implemented in terms of graphs. So um, first we get a bipartite graph from the connectivity of the equations and unknowns. And then we run a matching algorithm to assign each equation with an unknown. Uh, and then we contract away all the equation nodes in this bipartite graph to get a graph of all the unknowns. So after this stage, we kind of get a uh, dependency relations of all the unknowns. But in, in uh, normally a dependency graph is uh, a acyclic uh, graph. But in here we might have cycles because instead of assignments, we have nonlinear uh, equations. Uh, so the tearing is simply re the, the tearing uh, process is simply to remove all the acyclic subgraphs. So all the parts uh, that we can solve by simply evaluating some kind of function, and it's Im implemented in here. Uh, the implementation in modern toolkit is greedy and is known to be non-optimal, but it runs in polynomial time. Uh, there is a optimal algorithm proposed by um, by half, uh, by half. Uh, although that algorithm is um, NP hard, so it takes much longer to run that. Maybe we can implement that in the future as an improvement. But uh, the current greedy, uh, the greedy approach works pretty well in practice. Uh, so putting everything together, just calling the structural simplify on the RC model we get uh, one single ODE as expected. That is uh, the voltage source minus the voltage of the capacitor divided by the capacitance 
uh, multiplied by the uh, resistance. Uh, a still uh, listener to my notice that uh, in here we are calling full equations instead of just calling equations before. Uh, that is because uh, we don't compute the substitution after tearing uh, immediately like we have done uh, in here. Because in here, you can notice that we are uh, duplicating a lot of efforts. Uh, so we are evaluating uh, F1 of U, uh, F2 of F1 of U5 twice, right? For instance. So to get efficient lowering into Julia code, we cannot substitute immediately, but uh, compute the, the lowering from uh, all the observed equations. And then uh, instead of doing substitution, we uh, just do assignments. So this is like um, common substitution elimination uh, of this system. And I want to thank all my collaborators, uh, in particular, Shashi from MIT, Chris uh, Kino Varal from Drill Computing, and Chris Laufman from Merle, and people from Modal Modalica community for discussing the algorithms, in particular, Hilding and Martin. And since the work, most of the work was done when I was an undergrad at uh, UMBC, I want to thank my undergraduate advisor, Dr. Susudik, for his accommodation. Yeah, so I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Ingva. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so we did get a, a, a question, um, looks like from YouTube, saying, this approach looks a lot like uh, Modelica or Modia. Have you considered uh, or are you cooperating or trying to work with them in any way? Yes, <laughs> that is from the acknowledgment. <laughs> but uh, maybe you could say a little more about what you're doing with them. So. Yeah, so we have been talking about uh, better handling uh, array variables inside um, a causal modeling settings. For instance, if we want to model PD discretization inside um, modeling toolkit, currently we are uh, expanding um, the array variable in terms of scalar variables. So imagine if you have a 1,000 by 1,000 PD discretization, that's going to be horrendous, right? Um, because everything is going to look like this. Um, uh, so uh, we are talking about a better algorithm to handle uh, PDs and uh, with boundary conditions in particular, because for instance, if you have a directly boundary condition after running tearing, we are basically removing the directly boundary condition, right? And then we are only simulating the interior. Uh, so we are trying to come up with an algorithm that uh, reduce away the directly uh, boundary condition, but keep uh, retain the array structure instead of scalarizing everything. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Um, all right, we have a, a question from Discord asking about uh, where are things at with regards to defining optimal control problems, especially for closed loop control? Uh, yeah, that is currently being worked on uh, at Julia Computing. Although I don't know much about controls, uh, Frederick is probably going to tell, can can tell you more about uh -huh. uh, the plan of controls inside okay. of my toolkit. So I had a question. So I, I see, you know, you did a lot of uh, updating and refactoring and expansion of the structural simplify kind of code. And you mentioned some components of that today with the aliasing and the tearing. So are you trying to make that more general? Or are you trying to make it work uh, easier to plug into because right now it's kind of very internalized, right? To modeling toolkit, like, it, is there plans for growing that or expanding that in any specific ways beyond the array stuff you just mentioned? I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, so there are some current. There currently there are some limitations that makes, uh, for instance, the alias elimination uh, not very easy to use. Right. It only works for linear homogeneous equations. So if you have like minus one in the equation, then it doesn't work. Right. Um, so, so there there are some opportunities to generalize uh, alias elimination and tearing, uh, but it's not a top priority right now. So if you have some ideas on how this can be used in, uh, you want some kind of alias elimination 
thing that we can use in Catalyst to reduce given what we consider con algebraic constraints, I guess, linear algebraic constraints. Right, yeah. Or before, before translating to ODEs or such, so. Yeah, I think we can do that. Um, it's pretty generic if you look at the code. Um, so the refactoring was done by Kino. It's not like uh, a ad hoc thing that we had before. Um, so in here, we are simply getting, um, uh, yeah, in here, we compute uh, the subsystem that is linear and uh, homogeneous. Uh, and then we just run the alias eliminate graph. And this has nothing to do with uh, DAs in particular, right? So this can be done in general. So as long as I think if you, if we implement uh, collecting the subsystems, uh, the linear subsystems, then we are good to go. Okay. Then I guess we need some kind of re graph representation among the reactions to figure out how to reduce variables in there. So. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, so IG in here is uh, is a vector of aliases, and MIM in here is just a reduced matrix ah, okay. in, in echelon form. Cool. So and then you write some symbolic code that uh, converts this AG into uh, incorporating the alias into the actual model. So we do some substitutions in here uh, and updating the system. Cool. I, I'll have to I'll have to bug you about this more offline. So you got a couple more questions, and since we have a break, I think we could at least do one or one more. Um, so one was asking about: um, Is there the possibility to add thermal noise to your RC circuits using uh, to get SDEs? Right. Uh, I think that can be done in principle, but I'm not sure it's implemented correctly uh, with SDEs. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I think we're in a break now. So to let everyone get their their break, and we'll come back at uh, twelve twenty Eastern Standard Time for our next talk. Um, even though you do have another question on Discord, if you want to check in there. Um, and otherwise, uh, we'll see everyone in twenty minutes, hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye.
All right, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, Shashi, oh, uh, do I need to add your sharing screen? Do you want to add it? Or? Um, yeah, I don't know which one is my sharing screen. Uh, okay. We've got it. Is that the screen that you want to share? seems to have gone into spinning wheels for me. I don't know, is other people seeing that too? Yeah, hold on. Okay, okay. I'll kick this shashi out then. Yeah, why don't you uh, take over, Ranja? <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. we can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, for some reason, it kicked me out, but I'm back. Oh, okay. So right now, your sharing screen is just ah. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Yingbo uh, mentioned uh, symbolic arrays, and now we're going to get to hear all about them, courtesy of uh, Shashi Gauda, um, who is one of the creators of Symbolics.jl and also has made lots of contributions to SciML libraries like Modeling Toolkit. So please take it away, Shashi. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Shashi Gauda. I am a grad student at the Julia Lab at MIT. Um, previously, I worked at Julia Computing, building Julia DB. Um, if you know about it, um, yeah, currently I'm working on Symbolics.jl. Um, and this talk is going to be about uh, symbolic arrays. And um, uh, to begin with, I will define what symbolic arrays are, what I mean by them. And we will look at like uh, what other computer algebra systems have symbolic arrays and what kind of features they have. And uh, we will also look at symbolics, the new implementation uh, of symbolic arrays and symbolics. Um, and we'll also look at uh, what's like the future direction of array languages in general is going to be um, or is right now. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so what do I Oops, we lost Shashi. Okay, he's back. Hi, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's uh, happening, but um, I yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah, now we can see your screen. Okay, great. Uh, hopefully this sticks. Um, let me turn this. Yeah. Um, so by symbolic arrays, what I mean is, uh, um, yeah, so being able to represent uh, operations on symbols that represent arrays um, and having expressions on those symbols, right? So. What I mean by that is uh, it, it, no matter what the size of the arrays uh, is, um, you, you, you should be able to represent them in O of 1 space, which is constant space. Um, this is uh, obviously different from an array of symbols, which we can do in Julia just using the generic array type. And most. Looks like we lost Shashi again. Shashi, why didn't you try presenting without a video? That's computer algebra systems have symbolic arrays. Um, 
and it uh, turns out Maple, SymPy, and SymEngine do not support symbolic arrays in the sense that I described, but they do have an array of symbols um, in the sense that they have their own matrix type uh, where you can put symbols in, and they also support mate. The same matrix type is used for uh, numbers as well. Um, yeah, uh, Mathematica has symbolic arrays. You can say that a symbol um, belongs to an array um, class, and uh, all the algebra on that symbol will will be based on that. Um, Maxima has this, but Maxima is actually GPO which makes it not usable for a lot of the applications that people in the Julia community use, use Julia for. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, finally, Symbolics has array symbols um, as of um, six months ago or something. OK. Um, yeah, so I just want to do like a quick overview of uh, features. So if you guys have questions, I have a um, I have a Julia ripple here, and uh, I can I can um, try out things for you or um, show you things on that. But uh, to begin with, we can create symbol uh, array symbols using this notation um, at variables. Um, so it's just an, it, 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 this this means that x is a matrix with a uh, of size ten by uh, ten by five. So X is a symbol which is a subtype of abstract array in this case. And any operation on these symbolic arrays result in symbolic expressions without being expanded out into their full form. Um, so here we have a matrix vector multiply. Here we have like a simple broadcast with uh, three inputs. And you can see that it um, represents like the high level expression tree of what needs to be done on the arrays. And uh, well, what Symbolics is really good at is being able to allow you to uh, write rewrite rules in terms of uh, uh, this DSL here. Um, so, um, so here are three rules for transforming array expressions. The first one it says that an adjoint of an adjoint of an array is the array itself. And the second one says, uh, if you have A times B times C, where A times B is performed first, then convert it into A times B times C, where B times C is performed first. If the intermediate result of forming A times B uh, is more expensive in terms of size than uh, forming B times C. Um, so this is basically, this is the rule that you require uh, to um, simplify a matrix chain multiplication, right? So if you have a bunch of uh, matrix ma matrix multiplies on a vector or a bunch of matrix multiplies themselves, then you can apply this rule to kind of minimize the intermediate storage required. And then the next rule here um, basically fuses two bro broadcast operations. Um, so you can write rules like this and immediately apply it on um, the symbolic expressions that you just created. Um, and here's an example. Here I'm creating a rule uh, for the matrix chain multiply optimization. And then um, here the input is x times y times b. And x times y is 10 by 10. Uh, but it's ultimately just two matrix vector multiplies. Um, so if you apply the rule here, you get back a new expression, uh, which um, which shows that it's uh, it's first doing the matrix vector multiply here, and then doing the matrix vector multiply on the resulting vector. So I will uh, talk about this, this notation of array op in the next slide. Um, um, yeah. So if you if you uh, enable this uh, flag uh, this flag um, called show array op from symbolics uh, every time you would perform an array operation you get back uh, a notation let me check again um, uh, which, which says what is the loop going on inside basically so this is a variation on uh, what 
many people call the Einstein summation notation, uh, which basically means that uh, for every i, um, this is how you compute it, right? So it's saying that uh, for every i, take x i comma k and multiply it with y comma k. And since k does not appear on the left-hand side, this also means that uh, the dimension where k is used must be reduced over. And by default, we reduce over it with the plus operation. So this becomes a matrix with the multiply. Um, in the second example, we have uh, um, j in the left-hand side, but not i. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. This was supposed to be prod. So here, I, uh, I, I want to use a different reduce function, uh, which is not plus, right? So um, that's also allowed. Yeah, you can have a star as the reduce operation. So in this case, it's doing a product over the first dimension. Um, and that's the area of you get. And yeah, finally, you can nest these things. So for example, this adjoint is written as uh, 1 comma i equals uh, y of y, y of i, uh, which basically turns a uh, column a column vector into a row vector, and then it's doing couple of broadcasts. Um, uh, and broadcast is in this case it's just a um, it's all yeah in in this case it's just um, um, doing two loops right um, yeah so as you can see it it encodes both the high level operation where, and uh, this loop formulation of the operations that we are doing. And it turns out we can represent um, most of Julia's um, standard array uh, library using uh, this notation. So for example, broadcast reduce over any dimension um, as some of the linear algebra up to blast uh, two or, uh, or like even blast three where except the solve operations can be represented in this way. Um, and it also ha has the feature to represent um, indexing. So slicing arrays can also be represented using this array of notation. Uh, so when you do a get index, this is what it internally represents. Uh, here I have a slice of x being up, uh, broadcasted with the sign function. So you can see the internal array op is basically it's an identity uh, operation, but with the index set subset from the entire index set. Um, yeah, so why do we need this tensor notation? It seems like a extra level of complication, but uh, it turns out it makes a lot of things very easy. Uh, so first of all, it encodes the loops. This means we can generate the loops when we want to compile it down to Julia code. Um, secondly, um, it, it allows Apologies, Shashi appears to have frozen in the stream. He'll be back shortly. And we lost him completely. All right, he should be back. Hi, Shashi. Hi. You, you got kicked out again? Yeah. Uh, so um, I do you know where, uh, if you were seeing the slide? Yeah, I can see the slide. No, but uh, was this the slide that was before? Yeah, um, you, were, you were explaining um, about you hadn't gotten to talking about differentiation or anything. But... OK, cool. Yeah, so I was. 
I was just explaining about Get Index, I guess. Um, OK, yeah, so I'll just continue from here. So I was uh, saying that uh, even Get Index can be represented using this notation, and we do it in symbolics. Um, so in this case, x there is a slice of x here, and the internal loop contains the uh, ranges of the indices. And this, this also makes it easy to uh, have shape propagation and checking going on at all times. Um, yeah. OK, so why do we need this tensor notation? It looks like uh, an extra layer of complication. But it turns out it makes a lot of things easier. First of all, we have the loops encoded in this notation. So we can generate the loops uh, in Julia when we need to compile a certain operation. Um, secondly, shape propagation just becomes centralized. So we don't have to do it for every single operation uh, that is there in the standard library. So we just do it for um, arrays in general. Uh, And yeah, differentiation uh, becomes possible. We just have to differentiate the internal um, expressions. And finally, it also makes it possible for us to um, go back and compute a specific element of, a, um, of the result of an array operation. Right. So here I have a x broadcast over x times y, and I'm indexing the first element. So if you do this in the REPL, you just get this uh, lazy uh, expression. And then if you call symbolics.scalarize, it's going to go back and uh, take the tensor notation and uh, start applying the indices that you want, starting from 1. Right? And then it's going to say that uh, the result of the first element here is going to be uh, at the dot product of y with the first row of x and x of that. Right? So, this becomes possible with the tensor notation. Um, but, uh, yeah, so and then we can compile these uh, expressions to Julia code uh, using this two expr. There are three ways to do it. So, firstly, there is two expr, which will just give a code fragment. We're using the same names um, for how to do this. And then there's in place expr, which uh, gives a, a for loop. And you also need to give like an output array symbol. And uh, basically, it, it, it gives some code which fills up the output array symbol with the operation required. So in this case, it's a, um, it's a matrix vector multiply. So it, it has one loop um, going over all the case and one loop go going over all the uh, i's um, and filling up each element of the output. Um, so and then. Finally, we have this build function, uh, which is what Marlin toolkit uses. So if you give it an array operation and then say x and y are the inputs, it just gives you back uh, um, a function which takes x and y as inputs, uh, a tuple x and y as inputs, and uh, does the operation required. Um, and in this case, it's using like the, just the high-level representation, not the loops representation. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some languages which do, which are doing novel things in array-specific, um, domain-specific languages. Um, so first of all, there is like JAX, which uh, mirrors the NumPy API. Uh, so it it is kind of symbolic in the sense that when you um, when you create arrays in JAX and apply operations in them, it maintains this expression tree. And then it can do um, automatic differentiation on it. And it can do um, shape propagation and checking. And the internals work mostly as if we are doing you know, um, uh, symbolic tracing, right? as if you're running something with symbols. Right? Um, but it's also just geared towards uh, machine learning. It doesn't explicitly provide symbols. Um, and then there is DEX, which is a, a functional language. Um, it's kind of like Haskell, the flavor, or ML. And um, yeah, just checking again. And it, it, it allows you to express um, 
for loops are comprehensions, um, and the uh, index sets are part of the type. So, which means that like the index ranges are part of the type, basically. And every time some operation happens, the index sets become. Um, yeah, index sets are uh, type checked in, in a sense. Um, but this language does not have uh, metaprogramming, which means uh, you can't take the expressions themselves and transform it in the language. Um, uh, so, but if you think about it, since symbolics um, can compile down to Julia code, it, 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 when you're doing symbolics, you are doing metaprogramming um, in some sense. And it's like the most um, user-friendly form of metaprogramming where there's the, you're manipulating these expressions with like a rich library of uh, things around it. Um, yeah, and there's halide, which is mostly geared towards parallelism. I think I'm running out of time. So um, uh, par parallelism of for loops and- Ashi, you yeah. can go um, for five more minutes. Oh, okay, thank you. Strict there, so. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so, yeah, again, halide is, uh, all the features have to be built into the language. Um, but uh, I think symbolic arrays let you, uh, allow you to have much more flexibility in that sense. Um, so in summaries, uh, array symbolics have been around for a while, but like the the attitude towards it from other CAS, uh, other computer algeb algebra systems have been like, you know, this is just another type of symbol. Um, but in symbolics, we take it a step further, and we have multiple encodings. And in the sense, we we also maintain like the for loop representation of an ER array operation, which allows us to do compilation and optimizations. Um, um, and um, yeah, it, this is super important for the SIML ecosystem because that's like compiling symbolics is what we care about the most. Um, yeah, and it becomes a metaprogramming tool in the end. Um, yeah, so things we are working on in the future uh, includes uh, loop uh, uh, generating the code uh, to be very efficient uh, using loop vectorization and using crystal rod in general. Uh, the differentiation of array operations is coming, and we're working on stencils. And uh, I have this project to do like XLA style optimization of flux models. So if anybody here is interested in doing that, then uh, please uh, talk to me uh, after the talk. Um, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Yingbo. Chris and Alan uh, for helping me work on this. Uh, Yingbo has, uh, when I have questions, I always talk to Yingbo and it always clears me up, uh, clears them up. So uh, if you want to use Symbolics, I hope you can, uh, you know this already. You can go to juliasymbolics.org and read more about it. Thanks. All right, uh, thank you, Shashi. Um, so why not, since we gave, said we give you five minutes, why don't we, we do one question from Discord? Um, and then maybe you can go take a look at the other one uh, that's on there. Um, so the, the first one was uh, asking about your, the chain of array multiplications that you showed, yeah. um, saying, can you apply a rule that calculates the optimal array multiplication order using dynamical programming or such that uh, they didn't think the, a simple greedy rule uh, works in general when you have, I guess, a bigger chain? Uh-oh. Seems like Shashi froze on us. Um, okay, so maybe we should just move on to the next talk um, since Shashi is frozen anyways. Um, so, uh, Ranjan, do you want to handle setting it up? Great. Um, okay. All right. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Can you Great. see my uh, presentation? I can see your presentation. So Perfect. hopefully everyone else can. Um, all right. So our next speaker is uh, Ilya Elmer, um, who is, a, I believe, a graduate student at City University of New York in computer science um, and has done a lot of really nice work on structural identifiability tooling in Julia and is going to give us an introduction to that. So please take it away, Ilya. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ilya. 
Hi, everybody. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the Graduate uh, Center at the City University of New York. And today I will present a quick tutorial on structural identifiability solution in Julia. Um, I, uh, my research topic is uh, parameter identifiability algorithms. And um, in this talk, uh, I'll first introduce the uh, identifiability problem. Um, we'll, uh, I will present um, two uh, Julia-based solutions. Um, one of them, namely uh, structural identifiability.jl, is included in SIML framework, uh, SIML infrastructure. infrastructure. Um, uh, the other one, a structural identifiability analyzer, is um, uh, a Julia port from Maple of another uh, identifiability algorithm that's very efficient. So we'll kind of go, we'll go over uh, the differences uh, during the example section. We'll, uh, I will do a quick uh, live coding demo. And then we'll uh, highlight some uh, you know, differences and uh, how one uh, package can complement another um, during the conclusion section. So what is a structural identifiability problem? And well, in general, parameter identifiability deals with situations where um, we are given an ODE model and we would like to know whether we can determine uh, parameters of that model. And um, you know, one way to do it would be to set up an experiment measure uh, certain variables, certain state values, and then try to manipulate the data to get the uh, value of a parameter. Um, a, a structural identifiability is a theoretical notion that can answer that question from a symbolic um, ODE system. Um, and uh, such structural identifiability is, uh, can be categorized further into global and local. So global identifiability is when a parameter's value can be determined uniquely. And uh, uh, we say a parameter is uh, locally identifiable or local identifiability case is when there are finitely many solutions um, to, uh, for, for the current parameter. If neither of those situations occurs and maybe the parameter has infinitely many values, uh, then we say that such parameter is non-identifiable. Now there are ways to mitigate this issue. Um, I will mention them, but I don't think I'll have enough time to kind of cover uh, in full details, um, but we'll definitely talk about what can be done for that case. So let's consider a simple uh, example. Uh, we have a, um, the following input structure, and this structure will be preserved for either Julia package, either Cyan or uh, structural identifiability. So we have an ODE, um, of which there could be more than one, but for this example, let's consider a single one. So we've got two parameters and one state variable, and we have an output function. Consider this something that can be measured during uh, the experimental stage. Um, and so if we were to plug this into each of the packages, Cyan, Structural Infibility Analyzer, would tell us that the initial condition and the parameter B are globally identifiable, while uh, parameter A is only locally identifiable. That does make sense. I mean, measure Y at zero and you get the initial condition. A is seen with a square, so there would be uh, two values uh, that, could be, that could satisfy uh, an equation for A. Um, so finitely many solutions for A and unique solution for B and X. Structural identifiability, on the other hand, will tell us that B is globally and A is locally identifiable and will not provide any information about the states. So this is the first difference that we encounter between the two packages. Um, under the hood of Cyan uh, lies uh, a Monte Carlo algorithm which accepts the ODE model and the probability of correctness. So default probability value is always 0 0.99. And of course, users can adjust it. Um, the value will affect the runtime. So the higher probability of correctness, the slower it might become. Um, and the input ODE model is transformed into a polynomial system from which we first uh, extract the local identifiability information. And then from the local identifiability information in further transforms of the polynomials, we can compute uh, Grubner basis and just determine global identifiability um, report. In the structural identifiability.jl package, we've got uh, a similar st input structure. So we provide a model with outputs and the probability of correctness p. However, the process of determining identifiability is a little different where we uh, compute something called uh, input output equations. So we only consider equations that contain inputs, input functions, output functions, and their derivatives. Uh, and then the, uh, the identifiability report is based on the coefficients from the equations, a field of coefficients. Um, now, the structural identifiability package can distinguish between single and multi-experiment identifiability, and we'll see where this is beneficial and both can be um, uh, can lead to an incorrect answer. So right now, let's move to a coding example. So I did preload a few packages. 
like structural identifiability and modeling toolkit, as well as some other things that we're going to use to um, visualize what's going on with uh, identifiability. So let's first create um, a simple ODE. It's, it's based on the example from the slides where there are, th there are going to be three parameters now and two states. Um, so we're going to create the array of equations. Uh, and this is, by the way, all coming from a modeling toolkit. So this is a, a modeling toolkit based format for the input value. Um, at the end of this representation, I'll also show the um, structural identifiability kind of native, a slightly different input format. Um, so let's define a modeling toolkit ODE system um, and define the array of uh, measured quantities. So these are the outputs that I talked about in the beginning. So we'll start with analyzing uh, local identifiability first. So um, if I run the assess local identifiability function and provided the measured quantities, um, so first it's going to pre-process the ODE system, which means that it's going to convert it to the data type that's um, accepted by internals of uh, structural identifiability. Um, okay, so this is uh, done. Let's consider, let's see the result. So it tells us that A and B are local identifiable. So the output of this is a dictionary uh, from the symbols to uh, the Boolean value. C is not, a, not local identifiable. And if it's not locally identifiable, it means that it's not going to be identifiable at all. Uh, and it does make sense. We consider the output like we measure something that only in the ODE depends on A and B. So no information about C was provided, which is why we would not get any information about it. So let's uh, compute another identifiability um, result. This time we're going to get a full picture. So local, global, and non-identifiable altogether. So again, it starts with pre-processing. And it's going to go through the stage of local identifiability. And it begins the input-output equation computation. Um, and then um, there's a lot of internal information about what's going on with the Bronskian computation and, and, and so on. It's finally done. Um, so it tells you in about roughly nine seconds, we got the um, global identifiability result. Let's see. OK, so as before, if, let me put the equation up uh, on the screen. So we have uh, A being locally identifiable and B global identifiable. C is not identifiable, so that result is uh, preserved. Okay. So let's consider a slightly more complicated example. So this uh, model comes from oscillatory behavior in enzymatic uh, control processes paper. Um, let's define the states, parameters, and the equations. So there are four states, and we're going to use a single output. So we're just going to measure the first uh, state. Okay. Um, we'll define the ODE system. And let's assess the full identifiability, oh, and it's already done in less than a second. Um, uh, if we display the result, we see that um, almost everything is globally identifiable. I believe B, um, C, and sigma are uh, global identifiable. Beta and delta are local. And alpha and gamma are, are non-identifiable. Now, I want to focus on these for a few, uh, for a couple of minutes just to visualize what this means. So let's give it, um, let's actually solve the ODE. Uh, so let's provide some initial conditions. Uh, let's give it a time span and some parameter values. And let's define the ODE problem that we're going to solve and plot. So the idea is to kind of illustrate what we're going to do is we're going to plot the solution for two collections, for two sets of values. So as you can see, I'm going to alter uh, alpha and gamma, which I remember, they're not identifiable. So um, we should be able to, well, actually, we shouldn't be able to see anything changed uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the picture, on the plot. So let's visualize what's going to happen. Um, and I will, in the meantime, um, alter the parameters. So <clears throat> for now, it's just going to plot a single solution. And, and remember that we're plotting the thing that we're measuring. Um, otherwise, that wouldn't necessarily make sense. Um, OK, so here's okay, here's a function. Um, looks like um, you know, kind of decreases real fast. Very nice. Let's create a new um, ODE problem with changed values of parameters. And let's plot that as well. Um, oh, all right. Let's see. Oh, okay. So as you can see, even though I changed the parameter values, the curves are almost identical. I mean, they're probably even exactly identical. So the parameters are unidentifiable, and so we wouldn't be able to tell that from the um, 
um, ODE. Now let's also uh, show another feature of structural identifiability where we can check a parameter, a function of parameters for identifiability. In this case, I'm going to ask, well, is alpha plus gamma or alpha plus G identifiable? If I run this, um, it does the check and the result is displayed here in the terminal. It tells me that, no, it's actually not identifiable. Um, so uh, the reason why this might be of use to check a function of parameters is because if parameters, some parameters may not be identifiable, there may be a function that that, that can be identified. Um, okay, so now let's consider an example where we use the structural identifiability um, native kind of input. So I'm going to zoom out just a little bit to show the full OEE. Um, so it does kind of look like what you would expect to be written on paper. Uh, I'm going to close the uh, plots here. Um, right, so if I call this, it's going to define ODE, give you a quick summary of states, parameters, and output functions. Um, and if I call it assess identifiability on that, I see a warning saying that the result that it provides, and let me display the result, might be only valid for a multiple experiment case. Um, well, the result that it tells me is K1 is globally identifiable, so is K2 and EB. As a quick note, let's check this um, identifiability for these two functions. And this time, um, we didn't see any warnings. Uh, and locally, these functions are nicely identifiable. So it's another example of where uh, you can identify two functions of parameters. Now, let's go ahead and um, follow the warning. So the warning told us to actually use Cyan to uh, check identifiability of the set model. Cyan is the second package that I mentioned in uh, my uh, slides that also is very well integrated with a modeling toolkit. Uh, one notable difference for now is that we still have to define um, outputs in uh, the definition of variables, um, but we are working to make it more compatible with um, or kind of more similar to how uh, structural identifiability does it, where you just provide a separate array of equations. Um, so let's define the equation set create the system, and call the main function of Cyan called identifiability ODE. Um, OK. All right. So um, let me actually display the result. Um, did I not function? OK, no, I think now it works. Um, okay, so yeah, um, it starts with a similar process of you know, pre-processing and converting the input from the model toolkit format to the uh, appropriate data type. It does start with the local identifiability report and then proceeds to the global identification report. And um, as you can see, so before structural identifiability told us that these three were global identifiable, but that was only valid for when you perform more than one experiment. Turns out that if you perform a single experiment, you only get identifiability uh, local, but not global. So let's try to mitigate this. So I'm going to define this again. And what I will do is I will generate a replica. In fact, I'm going to consider the input to be two ODEs, but with different initial conditions. So if I do that, and um, okay, so the replicas are generated, I'm going to call my function again. However, I will uh, specify the parameters um, of the model without initial conditions. Well, because if we did check initial conditions, that would be two separate sets, and maybe it would be um, not as interested and as interesting as um, some other things that we're going to see. So now, after performing two experiments, so two copies of the input model, we get the same identifiability result um, as structural identifiability. So that kind of concludes the slide, uh, sorry, the live uh, coding section. And um, to conclude, um, we saw two available solutions for parameter identifiability in ODE models. There isn't a one framework that would solve everything. So these kind of complement one another. Um, some may be appropriate for more output functions. Uh, some would be uh, faster when there are fewer outputs and, and more equations, more ODEs. Um, but both can handle quite large systems. We've got a lot of work in, uh, planned for in enhancement of the underlying um, like Gerbner basis computations and integration with more uh, CIML uh, uh, frameworks. Um, we also currently have a Maple-based solution on the web that com combines these algorithms and some more uh, uh, in extensions. 
And we're also building a Julia web-based solution for the, um, yeah, for the web. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much to the organizers. And um, here are some references that I used. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very nice talk. Um, so I think we've got a little time for some questions since you started late. Um, so there were a couple on Discord. So the, the first one was asking, um, uh, can you use this with, in combination with a Turing.jl model that you know involves ODEs? Right. Um, I don't think that right now it would be compatible, but it's something certainly we would uh, consider looking into. Um, there. Yeah, so it's not right now to be like a, to give a short answer. Not right now, but um, that certainly would be interesting to um, look into more how to make them compatible with uh, ODEs that may be um, coming from Turing uh, at GL. Um, one of the uh, other Discord questions was asking if you could say a little more about the maybe the the notion or the differences between global and local structural structural identifiability. Um, yeah, so so. <clears throat> When, um, let me actually maybe con consider this example. So uh, like the, the biggest difference in between local and global is that um, when you, if you were to solve this equation, um, you would actually like maybe if you, even if you don't have the value of B, right? If you have X dot equals A squared uh, times X, if you solve it, you can find the value of parameter A, um, but uh, because A is squared in the ODE, you will be able to identify A squared uniquely, but not um, the value of A itself, right? Because whatever A squared might be equal to, maybe actually let me uh, write it down. So if you have, if you identify A squared to be something, then A will have plus minus that value, right? Well, to a square root of something. So there are two values. However, A squared is identified uniquely. So that would be global identifiability when there's one solution and um, a local identifiable parameter is I have more than one but finitely many solutions so I, I hope that clarifies um, the question I hope it did <laughs> um, okay I think we got one from the from YouTube uh, at least I think that's the source uh, asking uh, can you do identifiability of initial conditions yes so uh, initial conditions are identified by cyan um, so cyan actually considers the output functions themselves and, and the initial conditions will come from, from here. Uh, structural identifiability doesn't check for uh, initial conditions because the underlying um, equations that it considers are input output equations. So they, they only contain y's and if, um, I don't have an example with an input function right now, but if there was an input function, well, maybe b is an input function, right? So there wouldn't be any state left basically in the, during the process of identifiability uh, computation with um, structural identifiability. So to answer shortly, cyan can identify initial conditions. Um, structural identifiability cannot. And the difference is because of the underlying algorithm. Uh -huh. uh, OK, actually, we just got another in. Um, so can can the parameters be an array? And if so, uh, is identifiability the same for all elements? So I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe mm -hmm. you know exactly what that's asking. But. Um, so if, right, so I'm, uh, if I, if I understand the question correctly, let's say you would like to define a parameter, uh, Q that would go from one to some number. That might Currently, be. this type of symbolic definition does, is not supported. Uh, but we have, a we kind of, we're working on supporting this, uh, and resolving the issue. Um, so if that is what you mean by a parameter array, then it's not supported right now. Um, but it will certainly be supported in the future. We'll work on that. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, I think I actually had a, one question myself, which is, um, I don't know the kind of relevant theory or algorithms in this area, but is there much work, uh, and kind of known good methods if you have stochastic problems like SDEs, for example, instead of ODEs or, uh, jump processes, which is what I simulate a lot. Right. So, um, I don't really work with stochastic differential equations. I, I don't think I can answer the question. I believe there are works, um, but I don't think I would be, uh, I don't think I know enough of, of I'm sure. not familiar too well with them uh, to kind of give a solid answer. Um, but that's uh, definitely worth looking into. I believe there are, uh, there is research done, but 
Um, I just personally don't work with stochastic sure. differential equations. Okay, great. Well, then I, um, I guess we'll stop there. It's probably it's about time to start our next talk. And so thank you again for a really nice talk. Thank you very much. All right. And uh, our last speaker of this session is uh, Utkarsh. Um, I, I, I apologize if I hope I got your name right, um, who uh, is going to tell us about parallel extrapolation methods. And I'll let you get going so we can kind of try to stay on time. So, Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Utkarsh. So I'm currently a senior at IIT Kanpur. And I've been majoring in two very different fields, electric and chemical. And I've been uh, coming to MIT and working with Julia lab. So yeah, so I believe like, let us, you know, kind of start introducing like, what are basically extrapolation methods. So like, as like, as the name say, it kind of extrapolates the solution. So, so I just, you know, have this snippet from the here, like, which, which basically, you know, explains all the things very detailed in, in that. So I'll just briefly go through it. Uh, so what extrapolation method does is basically it kind of compute the corresponding step uh, by basically, you know, choosing a uh, particular subsequence. And as you can see that it has a, it uh, basically, you know, extra, extrapolates to the TI comma one, and which basically kind of eliminates the, as many terms that which are possible in the S, asymptotic expansion by com computing the interpolation poly polynomial. And finally, uh, so basically it helps us to, you know, reach higher orders and it is also a variable step method as well. So it kind of operates in both domains. And like, so these methods are now part of the ordinary DFQ uh, system. So it supports all of the, all of the, all of the functionalities that we have, the linear solve, the threading, multi-threading, as well as some, some area, which I would be going to discuss, like, which was uh, kind of, you know, explained in the here. And uh, so as you can see that, these are some other two methods, like uh, with one of them is explicit, like which don't, uh, which, uh, which are basically use for non-stiff problems. So these are some of the methods that we have, and uh, uh, and another methods are the implicit methods. So that is that would be kind of my focus for this talk, and like like we kind of you know identified a domain for domain for these problems, and uh, yeah, so they are kind they're performing well. But yeah, the work is in progress, and yeah, it could get better. And uh, coming to that. So I'll basically jump right into it. Like uh, the OD code is everything written in the or if you could jail, you can check it out. And, uh, and every implementation that is there, but let me, you know, come to that, like how we are parallelizing them. So we basically choose a step number sequence. Like, as I had already told that we need to, you know, have smaller step sizes. So that smaller step size extrapolates to the bigger step size that we are taking at that point. Then basically did, uh, then this computation of T K comma one requires two K sequential function evaluations. So this is this kind of a text that I have, uh, this is basically kind of error hypothesized. And if we are using MIMD processors, multiple input, multiple data, then this kind of this serial evaluation can be, you know, uh, processed into K processors and uh, which will basically generate the numerical approximation TKK. And uh, after that, and so basically this kind of parallelizes our code and the, the extrapolation that we are kind of the final time time step that we are for kind of you know uh, exposes the multi threading and parallelism apart from apart from the LU factorization that we would have in the implicit implicit methods so, that, so yeah that being that and uh, yeah i have just you know put a uh, put uh, put down some code snippet as well so as you can see that we are uh, so we are calling we are calling the jacobian 2w on on the on a particular thread and which basically uh, performs a linear solve and uh, and this linear solve kind this linear solve kind of you know computes the computes the step at at that point and then it basically for, uh, then then this then whole collection of this uh, extra extrapolated variables takes place and we finally uh, reach to the uh, reach to the kind of approx approx approximation of the method that we are trying to have so so what is this what is so special about like i mean uh, this is like kind of already been uh, you know discussed in books and as well as these methods are quite popular. So what happened is that when we are using large set of ODs, so in case of uh, in a stiff ODs, let me be particular to that. So we will require a, a we'll require a LU factorization that O and cube solve. And what won't happen is that so this is being done by BLAS. So BLAS multi-threading is not so efficient 
uh, in like let us say like this is kind of an heuristic in uh, less than 100 ods so this would require multiple elu factorization that scales like on cube so we know that the inverse is kind of you know goes in on cube so there would be uh, let us say that there would be there would be a cut off that point where it's long, no longer a good idea i mean there is a kind, as we know there is a overhead in the uh, parallelism that we have so and also the jacobian is too small to parallelize in the elu factorization effectively so it becomes a sealer solver for sufficiently small problems so in that case like uh, rodas method would be more serially efficient but these methods could expose parallelism to be faster on multi core machines at that point and uh, so that's why our implicit uh, implicit extrapolation methods come into place and we know that uh, blast is already multi threading efficiently so a serial method is already using its own cores and coming to that like as i have already uh, already men mentioned this be, uh, this is basically it, it is important in uh, quantitative system ph pharmacology models because these applications use gradient based optimization on six systems of size such that the optimization nature requires the parameter choices to be solved serially so thus parallelism needs to be exposed from the solver that's why these extrapolation methods kind of you know work in that in that qsv models domain and we need to you know also take care about the size that we have so yeah coming to that so now basically it's mostly benchmarks now and i'll maybe kind of walk through the benchmarks that we have so this is a rober problem let me come to that first so the rober problem is uh, is a stiff problem and it, it is composed of three ods so this is generally so this benchmark was you know uh, to, took upon uh, taken upon on high tolerances and as you can see that uh, there is implicit error warrant extrapolation method so this is basically a midpoint uh, midpoint method which is that the e, e small step size is using is being computed by the midpoint rule and uh, and uh, this is kind of an and this is implicit so basically as you can see that it is kind of you know uh, uh, kind of performing well and uh, for some tolerances with the roda so which is the best which is the best solver that uh, that the rope problem has so and even even you can see as implicit implicit euler extrapolation so that is that kind of also performs well but uh, as you can see that we have this kind of suite of solvers so that can be you know uh, tailored ac according to your problem that we have how much stiff it is and etc coming to that so this is a qsv model that i would be going to discuss in the next slide so as you can see that this is was computed on low transfer and you can see that this completely Uh, beats the other solvers that are in this domain uh, even the rosenbrock and the trbdf code which works in the in, in this um, in this method so so this is the kind of the uh, which basically explains my point like this is the kind of the domain of this uh, method like and, and where the where the users can benefit from them and uh, coming to that so basically here are also implemented this in the fortran as well so these are the sodex and the sodex method So basically, I have I have included a link here so you can check them out. So we had a, we have we have good Fortran drivers, so OD interface and OD interface DCQ as well. So that is a uh, that is so that is being benchmarked here. As you can see, that clearly beats the already existing Fortran solvers, which kind of you know stands the testimonial to the ordinary DCQ solvers that we have. Like the benchmarks are pretty amazing, and you can check them in Simon Simon benchmark as well. so it kind of amounts to the uh, five five times performance gain so yeah and so it is uh, pretty good according to that so i'll now you know talk about the bruslater problem so basically it's it's kind of a pde which is being semi discretized to generate an ode and we can you know we can you know generate generate uh, in our own sense like uh, that could be you know that discretization is the one to us and that you know kind of scales that so that problem so that problem size kind of scale as n square so i took this i took this example as well so this is uh, this is stiff so basically demonstrate that the as you can see it, it is near the 100 range so 120 od is pretty near that range and what is happening is that uh, the iron and the threaded versions are being uh, uh, are performing very uh, are performing much better than the unthreaded ones so that kind of gives us a 40 to 50 perform 40% to 50 performance gain and uh, and uh, coming to that uh i mentioned polyester thread there so yeah so basically polyester threads are the cheap threading utility which is being provided by julia sim so uh, courtesy of dr chris elrod so that has been incorporated into them so 
the overhead uh, overhead basically in this thread multi threading is kind of reduced now so as you can see that uh, comparing uh, comparing the polyester threads over the threaded so you can use polyester polyester threads for this use case as well so that is kind of an api that we have and also we uh, also coming to the api we also support uh, sequence step uh, uh, sequence step, maximum order minimum order so these orders can go to very higher orders like around 15 orders and the extra uh, and, and the uh, and basically we can also select the sequences which are the harmonic romber bullish like, like every so what has been you know given given by the book so the support and it can be you know uh, tuned as per your problem so that is the kind of the aim of providing a comprehensive api to that and uh, yeah so yeah and so basically i also tested with this uh, another method as what the euler berry centric method so one of one guy uh, i guess he did his thesis in the berry centric exp extrapolation kind of implemented some of the met explicit methods so uh, my job was to you know uh, translate them into implicit methods and we are using berry centric ex extra extrapolation in it so it performs similar to this uh, similar to the hair and warner method that basically which uses the midpoint method and this uses the euler method and this kind of gives the performance improvement in it and coming to the qsv model that i was talking about so basically uh, with the help of modeling toolkit and systems uh, sbml toolkit.jl so i was able to you know uh, parse a model which is basically qsv models this model describes and compares two models on the egfr signaling so that is kind of a protein receptor thing so i i am not specializing to that but yeah I, uh, so it it kind of has around 109 ods so which basically falls into a domain and as you can see that uh, it it supports all the things in module 2 which is the structure simplify so that is the uh, i mean the, uh, that is so that is the that is the advantage of building into the siml ecosystem and uh, you can see that it has a it has a very significant 80 per, 80% performance increase with multi threading so you can get so and that uh, that application kind of depends on the number of uh, number of core as well so like how uh, so if you have a higher core count you can you know get, get much more better performance and uh, yeah so i mean you can try these uh, you can try this method the implicit methods on the systems pharma pharmacology me model mm, yeah so coming to coming to like summarizing like the thoughts that i have so every method has its pros and cons so the pro let me come to the pro uh, first so basically this is this is good for qsv models having 8200 ods and you, uh, that that range is kind of heuristic like maybe as as i demonstrated the brush polymer it can, it can go to even 120 ods as well so it leverages higher core count apart from the le factorization that that is already being take place so we kind of turn it off uh, turn it off in the implicit method that we have so the every so 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 that the co the cores are being blocked by the Value factorization, so it is good for highly stiff problems and precision. If you want to go for very higher order, very higher order methods, so uh, so uh, these methods are quite good. So you can get good accuracy and precision. So this can go up to 15. The non-threaded version, like I have also demonstrated in the rover problem as well, the non-threaded version performs comparable to with common stiff 4D method. So that is, uh, I mean, yeah, it's not bad uh, that it is that it has a very trade-off in the performance. But yes. Uh, if, uh we can you know check on the models that we are building and uh, you know subsequently decide what to do so the con is that like what i feel like the domain is quite restricted i mean uh, they are better better stiff methods available for most of the general problems like uh, like from sundial.gl there is the cvo dvdf method which perform very well and we have an equivalent which is a better method which is the qndf in the in the uh, in the audience difficulty which is which is completely imp imp implemented in julia and there are the rodas method as well rodas 5 rodas 4 so these are i mean in speaking in general sense like it is uh, it is kind of domain restricted so this threading overhead becomes significant in less than 100 ods so you will the, the solve will be basically be not you know very good and it is overcome by so this so this uh, uh, this uh, overhead does not scale well with the problem so we are when we you know go with a very high Very high order problem, so then it would you know uh, that performance gain would you know be substituted by that. So yeah, I mean, and we are working on that. So and uh, and it it supports the nearly all dot gel new interface with uh, which IML has. So we can use 
multiple factorization methods and the preconditions that that are being built upon on that and yeah so it's some of the work is in work in progress and we are trying to get a preprint and a paper out of it yeah so acknowledgements i i would like to thank all of these people so which are which would help and the guidance so this, this is kindly a new venture to me and yeah thank you Uh, hi, uh, very nice talk. Uh, thank you very much. And um, so uh, I guess I, I had a question. You mentioned a little bit about at the, at the end about kind of what's next. But so, you, so you, mm. your, your conclusion is that you felt these methods were kind of a little uh, a little restricted in terms of the size of systems. Yeah. Where they, yeah. So so um, do you have ideas on how to make them more generalizable, or do you think it's better to look at some of these some of the other approaches? You know, like used by CV. Uh, yeah, I mean. I mean, I think some things uh, could be done from the linear solve. Like that is the most expensive step because we are going to the higher orders. So the linear, and we are extrapolating to uh, so higher order. So that linear solve would grow, grow as 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 per that. So maybe some if we use some uh, techniques, some some tricks in the linear solve, so that could be improved. But yes, I I mean yeah, that is kind. But uh, like what analysis we had, so that is kind of uh, restricted to this domain. Okay. Um, well, I think that's about it uh, for questions. I think everybody's ready for their break. Uh, so thank you yeah. again for the talk. Um, and I guess we will see everyone in 10 minutes for the uh, sponsor talk by Julia Computing at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time.
we'll wait for one more minute before you uh, you can get started jacob um but i see you have uh you've shared your slides as well as your screen separately so uh, i'm i'm just curious whether you want to put both of those together um i don't know wh whether you're going to be switching back you know uh, between slides and and screen or oh, uh, you're muted by the way oh um now i can hear you you can hear me now yep okay yeah i'm going to switch so uh go through a couple slides and switch back to my screen okay uh would you uh, should i just add your um should i add this picture to the the stream instead or should i have this instead? let's let's start with the slides and okay then, um, um when i kind of jump into the live demo i'll uh, i'll use the other screen yeah, for sure. Just just let me know, and I'll and I'll switch it. Absolutely. All right. I think we've uh, it's one thirty, so let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Jacob Vavaka from Julia Computing, and he's going to be telling us about uh, Julia Sim. Julia Computing is the sponsor of SimulCon as well, and we thank we thank them for their sponsorship. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And today. Uh, the name of this talk is Democratizing Semineural ODEs. What I want to talk about is how Julia Computing is bringing a platform in Julia Sim uh, in order to bring uh, a lot of the advancements to many different areas, many different fields, many different teams that it previously wouldn't have been uh, capable. So with that, I'll get started. And um, as we know, the Julia community is growing rapidly. It's finding its way more and more into machine learning uh, in different industries. And Julia Computing is built on top of a foundation of Julia Hub, which is an enterprise compute platform uh, for distributed compute. It's embarrassingly parallel, it's cost effective, um, and it is all designed around uh, reproducibility and optimized for Julia development in particular. And so, the, uh, the flagship, the, the foundation of, of Julia Computing is Julia Hub. And on top of Julia Hub, we have many different tools for different industries. So uh, we are gonna be talking about Julia Sim for physical simulations, um, but there are currently other offerings for uh, pharma simulation, for circuit simulation. Um, there's certainly more to come in the future, but today we're gonna take a look at Julia Sim in particular. And to start, uh, we're just gonna kind of walk through what you might expect if you are in modeling, uh, especially with an industry. Um, engineers are going to, in, they're going to incorporate modeling into their design process by, uh, by leveraging HPC, leveraging compute, and uh, you know, modeling the problems. They're gonna take these outputs, analyze them, and feed them back into the design. So. When this works well, you have data-driven decisions that are driving your design forward. And this works really well when you can experiment quickly and, and constantly iterate. The big challenge here is that many industries have, they're held back in certain places where they're dealing with long running models and accelerating that isn't always easy. So. Just because you have more compute available doesn't mean that you're automatically going to be able to get that speed up. And uh, it's doable, but it's it's time, it's effort. Um, you're always also going to want to make sure that your model is uh, still got the fidelity that you're happy with. And so, what we're looking at here is an answer to this problem, this challenge of pushing industry industrial modeling forward, um, because we want engineers to have that freedom to experiment, to ask questions that maybe weren't feasible to ask before and, and uh, see what designs come out. And we believe that by enabling this, by, by giving engineers better tools, we're gonna wind up with better designs. And so this introduces the concept of uh, a semi-neural ODE or a surrogate, uh, also sometimes called digital twins. And this is, um, I'm gonna, talk through this at a high level. This isn't meant at all to be uh, your, um, your, your in-depth explanation, but this is kind of a crash course just on what to expect because um, later on we are going to be kind of uh, fine tuning uh, some of the parameters. And so I just wanted to give a visual representation of, of what's happening. 
And this is um, a representation of uh, the CTESN, the Continuous Time Echo State Network that uh, Chris, uh, Chris Rakakis, Yingbo, uh, many others at Julia Computing um, have all worked on this algorithm in order to uh, train and generate circuits. And so you can start with um, you can start with your your solutions. You have some weights going in. Um, the reservoir is something I want you to take note of. That's going to be a particular uh, uh, parameter that we're going to adjust later. And then um, in the middle, in the in the in the purple time series uh, where we integrate, that's where the continuous comes from because we're evolving this uh, differential equation over time. Um, and it's, it's all fed from these hidden states. And then at the end, uh, we take the output weights um, and have a uh, projection back to the state dimensions. So again, this is um, just kind of a crash course. Take note of, of the reservoir, take note of the input because this is, um, I'm trying to represent how uh, this mental model that you might have if you are uh, using Julia for your modeling and um, and then if you have more questions in particular about the CTESN, uh, there's there's papers and other talks out there that will that will deep dive that. And so, um, with that kind of out of the way, let's just talk about a general use case where you have a simulation that takes two hours, and two hours one time isn't so bad. But we're we're talking about an instance where this two hours explodes because you wind up having to run the simulation many, many times in order to find optimal controls. And so this, this two hour simulation must be run 1000 times in this workflow. And it's, I think it's, uh, it's very common depending on uh, what modeling that, that you're engaged in. But, um, you know, the, the exact numbers here are, what we're going to use walking forward just through this example to kind of share um, why the work that we're doing is, is important and, and what kind of platform we're trying to build to, to answer this challenge. So that two hour simulation run a thousand times. Um, in addition to one final run at the end to uh, kind of test run just to make sure that uh, everything looks good and, and you know, it's your validation run winds up being 2002 hours. And this is obviously something that we're trying to improve. So what we propose here with the solution is injecting, uh, injecting Julia Sim in the beginning of this process. And so what we want to do is we want to train a surrogate uh, first, uh, right out the gate, train a surrogate. And that's going to be done in order to get a faster model. So instead of running that two hour simulation a thousand times, we wind up with something that can run in a minute. Now, training the surrogate is something that we can kick off in parallel. And again, that's something that Julia Hub, uh, the foundation of, of Julia Sim is very, very good at. And so we can leverage Julia Hub to kick off thousands of, of simulations in parallel and really only have about four hours um, of training time in this example. Is, and, uh, and then you wind up with a one minute simulation, which after a thousand runs is about uh, just under two hours, uh, one and two thirds hour. And so what we're talking about here is yes, we've cut down time, but aside from just looking at it from pure compute, where we're looking at wall clock time, um, 2000 hours is, is days. It's, it's, you know, it's really weeks because you're not an engineer is not just going to be sitting there waiting for the next one to run. You don't always have the ability to just, make sure that they run sequentially because you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to step in different places, um, do some analysis, do some fixes. And so that 2000 hours turns into likely weeks or, or maybe a month where now when we're able to do these 1000 runs with a one minute simulation, we can take that down to just a couple hours. And so, we're still going to do a test run, a validation run at the end of it. Uh, that's our uh, our two hours on the right. But we've taken what could be weeks or months or, or, or a month 
down to a single working day. And that's the difference in, uh, in a, in a industrial setting. That's the kind of thing that can really accelerate a team. So, um, allow them to ask those questions that maybe previously they didn't have the bandwidth or the time to do because, uh, you know, their project is on a particular, uh, life cycle and, you know, they got to get their things out the door, uh, with the analysis that they're able to do. So this is what it can look like by in injecting Julius Sim at the beginning of this process, um, bursting one-time compute, getting that surrogate, that accelerated model then is going to benefit you uh, throughout every one of those 1000 runs to optimize. So that's what we're doing. And then quickly, I just want to talk about uh, where this has been done already. And uh, we have seen extraordinary speed ups for HVAC models. Um, this is a, an example of a 570x speed up on a, uh, this is a 8,000 equation HVAC, eight, excuse me, 8,000 equation HVAC system. And uh, we've scaled this up even further to 100,000 equations. So when, when we did that, we got an 80x speed up and 80 doesn't sound as good as 570 maybe, but when you take into account what the current tooling is capable of, right now the best you can hope for is, is uh, real-time compute. So if you wanted to simulate a year, it would take you a year to compute that. Now with an 80 times speed up, you can simulate a year within, within four days. So um, that is really what we're talking about, changing, you know, what's possible for uh for engineers and 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 modelers to ask and uh and then we this has also been applied to uh circuit systems as well so there's a 1200 equation circuit system that got a 274 times speed up and there's really no limit to where this can go so um we're looking to uh, apply this to as many industries as, as we can to uh you know spread these benefits and so uh what, I, what I'm going to run through really quickly is just an example of this model here that you see of a DCPM motor. And uh, it is just uh, measuring the influence of uh, armature temperature on performance. And uh, just note the model parameters on the bottom right. So we have voltage and we have load. And um, we're going to see how we can train a surrogate uh, over this model with these parameters. Um, and we're, again, we're going to be using that CTESN. Uh, algorithm. And so here, um, if we could switch back to my other screen. Perfect. All right. So from Julia Hub, we have the Julia Sim FMU accelerator application. And once you launch that up, you can connect to it. And then you're faced with a dashboard. And um, I guess let me back up just for a second. There's two entry points for this. So Let's say that um, you're you're writing this model in code. That's great. I'm going to talk about how you can reap these rewards. But if you're if you're not writing it um, in code per se, you're using a GUI tool, or maybe you're not writing it in Julia. Um, if you can generate an FMU uh, functional mockup unit, uh, which is uh, available from virtually every modeling tool, then you can take that FMU and upload it here and get an accelerated FMU in return. So I'm gonna show you how to do that by clicking new job. I'll upload an FMU. So this is a functional mock-up unit of that motor uh, model that I showed you. And then we have the ability to uh, adjust some parameters for this uh, surrogate training process. So uh, we are going to use the, uh, the algorithm that I shared with you. And then remember that reservoir so that's the number of, of hidden nodes in here. So we can adjust this to uh, how many we think is gonna, is gonna be appropriate for our model, um, the number of simulations that you wanna run. You can tell it uh, the time span to run over from beginning to end and the step. And then you can also enter the parameter space. Now, instead of doing this manually, I'm just gonna load a configuration for the sake of time and we will just take a look down here. So here are the uh, the load and the voltage parameters that we saw in that model. And 
we have a lower bound and upper bound and a sample point. So if you define these, you're going to define the parameter space that this circuit gets trained over. And once you're kind of happy with, uh, with these training inputs, if you hit start new job, then you're going to be brought back to the dashboard. You can see all your jobs. You can always come back and get the configuration that you used. Uh, you can get the report, which I'll share in a second, and then you can get that uh, accelerated FMU. So the report is something that I won't spend too much time on for the sake of time, but I do just want to point out that our team has done a phenomenal job of how to analyze these models. And uh, what you're seeing here is a really cool way to, uh, to subtract some of the noise. So you can see straight away some different colors. You can kind of zoom into where the model's doing poorly, for instance, and uh, see where you want to train this model over or where it's safe to use this model with a high, high accuracy. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to leave that there for now, uh, just in the interest of time. And then uh, the only other thing that I wanted to jump to real quick is just show that um, you have the ability to do this in code as well. So if you are modeling Julia, good news, you have all of these uh, configurations and more where uh, you can choose the reservoir size, uh, the algorithm to use, um, the number of simulations, you know, et cetera. And so this is going to be a very uh, familiar um, syntax and, and you know, the, the same benefits. Um, and so I'm kind of flying through this, but if you could switch back to the slides, I'll just finish up. So thank you. So all of this is um, showing two different ways to start with a model and just uh, Julia Simon and get back another accelerated model. So this FMU that we've accelerated can be uh, put back into existing tools for whichever, you know, whichever tools you're using in your workflow. So um, all those different tools that can import export FMUs can, can leverage these accelerated models. And then this is all made possible, again, um, because we have the ability to computationally burst on Julia Hub. And so um, that's the real benefit here is we are bringing not only the, the know-how, so you know, um, instead of requiring in-depth knowledge of the particular area that you model, as well as uh, the latest machine, turning, machine learning techniques, as well as you know, HPC infrastructure, um, this is really simplifying a lot of that. We can auto scale to however much compute that you might need for your model. Um, we can handle all the parallelization. Um, we can also put it back into a format that uh, you're currently working with. And so all of this is really the Julia Sim platform. Now I've shared with you a couple different tools in um, the FMU accelerator and the Julia Sim IDE, but, uh, this is the platform. This is kind of the vision. And um, and this is all in an effort to uh, accelerate scientific discovery. Right. So it's um, all uh, on top of all the work that has been shared here um, from the other members at Julia Computing. Um, this th this is this is the, the main goal is to uh, accelerate these discoveries in as many different industries and fields as possible. So uh, just have a minute or two left. And that's that's it for me. Well, thanks a lot, Jacob. Um, uh, I do have one question from YouTube. Um, so how do you handle the security aspects of Julia Hub and industry? It's a great question. And it's something that uh, we face every day because um, that's something I, I would say for uh, specific questions. Uh, I'd like for uh, you to reach out to um, info at juliacomputing.com or, or uh, any of our sales uh, personnel, but it's something that we've had to address on many fronts because of our existing partnerships and, and, and clients, right? So uh, we're working in um, a lot of different spaces that require uh, security, require compliance, require, uh, you know, data governance. There's there's very tight rules that we're, we're working with all the time. And so it's something that is really at the core of it, everything we do. Um, and yeah, I'd say with with specific questions, definitely reach out, and we can we can definitely answer um, what our current uh, strategy is, and and you know how we hope to improve going forward. All right, 
Thanks, Jacob. In the interest of time, I think I'll I'll close it out. We we are thankful again to Julia Computing for being a SimulCon sponsor. Um, and now I will move on to the next talk. Thank you for having me. Sandra, could you go ahead and uh, start sharing your screen, please? Mm -hmm. Okay. Looks like that you, you you can see my screen, right? Can yes. We? Yes, we can see your screen. I just <laughs> introduce you. Um, uh, now we have uh, Sandra Bregi, who's going to tell us about learning measured bifurcation diagrams with UDs. Take it away. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I'm Sandor Berge from the University of Bristol, and as I said, I'm going to talk about learning measured uh, bifurcation diagram the UDE, so universal differential equations. Uh, so basically, the uh, this research I'm going to present here is mostly on using data-driven models on uh, nonlinear dynamical systems, which is linked to a project on uh, creating digital twins, which are essentially data-driven adaptable virtual counterparts for uh, real world of physical uh, systems. And what I found that universal differential equation models are especially good candidates at digital twins because they basically allow for having a physics-based core that's, uh, uh, that is, uh, they allow for incorporating some of our insight into these models, but by adding a machine learned uh, structure to, to the physics-based part, we can uh, compensate for the modeling errors and potentially reach a very high accuracy. This is all very promising. And I would like to use these models for uh, nonlinear dynamical systems, which is basically the broader area I uh, do research in. So that's uh, in my background. Uh, which uh, are essentially focused on systems uh, undergoing so-called self-excited vibrations. And uh, the main complexity with, with uh, these kind of systems that they are uh, most typically lead to varying parameter problems that uh, usually gives an additional complexity to the training procedure. And I will uh, present one specific application related to uh, to uh, an engineering-oriented uh, field, uh, aerostatic flutter, for which I uh, um, carried out a few numerical simulations, but I also uh, trained some mod trained the models on experimental data. Okay, but before that, I just would like to give a short introduction on what nonlinear systems actually are and what are the problems I'm uh, interested in. So basically, nonlinear dynamical systems uh, can be considered uh, as differential equations in the following form. Like we have a derivative of a state variable equal to some nonlinear function of the state variable and some system parameters. I'm considering uh, here or ordinary differential equations, but uh, one can also uh, um, take into account or, or study uh, more complex or more exotic type of differential equations. And the equations can be either autonomous or non-autonomous if we have an explicit time dependence in the equations. The important point is that in the focus of my investigations are uh, systems which have periodic solutions. And one uh, very common example is the Hopf bifurcation, which is a feature in autonomous differential equations. And basically, these two bifurcation diagrams in the bottom of my slide show the uh, typical characteristics of uh, the two basic cases of, of the whole bifurcation, the supercritical and the subcritical one. So essentially, in, in bifurcation diagrams, we typically show the steady state solutions of the system with uh, information about their stability. So in, in this case, I highlighted uh, the stable and unstable solution with different colors. So for example, what happens here that in the supercritical case, in the horizontal axis, I'm showing a chosen parameter, which is referred to as a bifurcation parameter, whereas in the vertical axis, 
in case of um, periodic solutions, it's typical to show some sort of a norm uh, related to the vibration amplitude. So basically here, in the horizontal axis, we have equilibria, which uh, uh, loses its stability at a certain uh, value of the parameter lambda. And what happens here at the Hopf bifurcation that at the stability boundary, there is a stable branch of periodic solutions emerging from, uh, from, from this point. And then this is the supercritical Hopf bifurcation, whereas in the case of the subcritical bifurcation, a similar thing happens. But in this case, the uh, branch of uh, periodic solutions is an unstable branch. And, but uh, what uh, very commonly happens that later on, uh, this unstable branch uh, undergoes a so-called saddle node bifurcation and becomes uh, stable again. And um, so basically the reason I like these diagrams and why these tell us often more information than like a simple numerical simulation would tell is uh, because using essentially the information of the steady state solutions and their stability, we can also infer what the transient of the system would look like. And um, starting with different initial conditions from different regions of the phase uh, space of the system, as these uh, arrows basically indicate, we can tell where the, where the solution would converge to. And from this point of view, probably the most uh, interesting region is this one in the case of the subcritical bifurcation, when uh, we have a so-called bistable parameter region where we have uh, a, a coexisting stable equilibrium and a stable large amplitude solution. And then basically the initial condition is going to decide whether we will see uh, the equilibrium or a large amplitude oscillation in the long uh, in the longer term or in, in, in um, or as steady state behavior, which are obviously two <coughs> entirely different uh, type of behavior. Now, uh, the important thing is that in, in this case, the unstable periodic solutions play an important role because they essentially are attached to the boundary between the um, uh, domains of attraction of the two stable solutions. So that's why it's actually also important to characterize this, which uh, can be a bit challenging because this solution never directly appears in experiments since they are unstable, but we have a control-based uh, technique to trace them. So it's actually possible to uh, get information of them in, in, in measurements. So as I mentioned earlier, and, and uh, I hope that uh, I could make this a little bit more clear why these are actually varying parameter problems. And on the other hand, uh, these systems are relevant in several engineering systems. I just uh, wrote a few examples. I hope the video is going to start. One is uh, the example I'm going to show some numerical results of is air elastic flutter, which is basically the self-excited vibrations of aerofoils in airstream. The other one is another area which uh, I did a lot of uh, research in is wheel shimmy, which is basically the self-excited vibration of uh, rubber tires. Now, as you can see, these uh, vibrations are relevant because they can either cause well, well, um, some mild discomfort, but in, in some cases, if 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 you are unlucky, then they may even lead to to accidents, which is which is obviously dangerous. So we would like to avoid them. Okay. So um, after this introduction, I I would like to move on and introduce uh, the modeling concept I have uh, for these types of systems. So my assumption is that uh, we have an ob an, an experiment or a system we are observing. Um, which has these kind of periodic solutions. So for example, a subcritical Hopf bifurcation, as you can see uh, the, in, in this example uh, with the bifurcation diagram. <clears throat> and usually the, the case is uh, with an engineering system that one already has some sort of a knowledge or insight into how the system actually works. Therefore, it's usually possible to uh, come up with a good physics-based model 
which at least in a qualitative sense describes how the system behaves. But usually the case is that uh, that model is, is, is never 100% accurate. So there is, all, there is always going to be some error due to the uh, neglections and simplifications one has to make during the modeling procedure when compared to measurement data. So that's why um, I'm adding a universal approximator to the physics-based part and using a universal differential equation model to reach uh, a higher level of quantitative uh, accuracy when compared to measurement data. So uh, if we take a look at what uh, our model looks like in terms of equations, then uh, from the point of view of an experiment, it, uh, at least to me, it makes sense to uh, divide the system to an accessible and the hidden part. Basically, the accessible part, meaning all the state variables and, and, and everything about the system, which we can have, um, uh, which we can measure. And, uh, but as I said um, earlier, there, there are always going to be some neglections. So it's, it's fairly safe to assume that there is always going to be a hidden uh, part of the dynamics, which we cannot model. So essentially what we do, uh, is that um, I consider a physics-based model for the accessible part and try to fine-tune it to make it as good as possible and then add a uh, machine-learnable machine learnable structure to compensate for the error between the measurement data and the uh, smaller order physics-based model. So basically, the two types of uh, machine learned structures I'm considering for this problem is neural networks, for which I use the DFEQ flux package in Julia. So in this case, basically, the model error and the objective function is calculated from uh, um, the error in the predicted trajectories compared to the measured ones, whereas in the other case, when I consider Gaussian processes, it was a little bit different because in this case, uh, the model uh, was fitted directly to the right-hand side of the differential equations, which means I had to use acceleration data. On the other hand, Gaussian processes were uh, more useful in the cases when there was some noise in the system because they are essentially um, um, have a, a natural way of considering process noise. Um, process noise in the model. Okay, so uh, the following slides, I just would like to going to present uh, my uh, results on the uh, model of elastic flutter, starting with the numerical simulations. So in this case, I consider the two plus one degrees of freedom model of flutter um, as uh, the underlying model of an experiment or the ground truth, if you would like. Um, where basically um, the two physical degrees of freedom of this aerofoil here, aerofoil here, the heave and the pitch motion uh, was considered as the accessible part of the model, whereas the model had a non-physical uh, degree of freedom related to the aerodynamic effects, which are considered as the hidden uh, part of the model. So basically what I did is to um, create a two degrees of freedom physics-based model using just the accessible part, the heave and the pitch motion, and added a machine learned structure to compensate uh, for the model error. Now, if uh, I uh, consider the, the simplest possible case, uh, when I had a deterministic system, then uh, Actually, uh, this kind of uh, model with a neural network as a universal approximator turned out to work really well. Um, so as you can uh, see, basically, I was able to train the model to replicate uh, uh, what the underlying model does and, and what the, the measured or, or, or uh, in this case, the simulated uh, periodic solutions uh, were. Um, but I also added uh, uh, the bifurcation diagram of the pure physics-based model just to highlight that in this case, the difference between the behavior 
of the ground truth model and the physics-based core of the universe, a differential equation model wasn't that uh, large. So in this case, I really just compensated for a small error uh, in the model. So we can uh, kind of say that, okay, this worked really well, but this was probably not a very realistic example. So I just try to um, uh, increase the complexity a little bit by considering process noise. And in this case, I use Gaussian process as the universal approximator, which still uh, worked quite well. Um, basically, the important conclusion in this case was that quite predictably, the signal to noise ratio was important, um, which uh, unfortunately also kind of limited the amount of noise one could actually consider in the model because uh, the acceleration data was more uh, prone to the um, prone to noise excitation than the trajectories uh, in case uh, of the neural network based models this is basically the reason why i um, use the neural network based model when i when i try to train the model uh, for actual uh, measurement data take, taken from the physical experiment you can see the right hand side of my slide um basically uh preconditioning the measurement data and 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 using it as a quasi deterministic uh training data um and as you can see basically uh it was it, it was possible to train a universal differential equation model which could replicate the measured uh, bifurcation diagram so we could say that uh, this is a relatively nice result Unfortunately, um, we found that uh, that solution was quite sensitive to the initial conditions of uh, the training algorithm. So actually, it, it very often uh, converts to a local minimum instead of a global one. And in this case, as you can see, the characterization of the, of, of the system behavior is, well, it's suboptimal, as, uh, as they say. Uh, so basically, this raised the question, how can we actually improve the robustness of the training procedure? And uh, an, an obvious thing, or at least it, it seemed to be obvious to me, that uh, the current training framework or, or the training framework I used previously didn't really utilize the information that we are actually dealing with system with periodic solutions. It was just a result. Um, that kind of indirectly uh, was in there, but there was no direct information about this. So what I tried to do that instead of using an initial value problem solver, uh, as is the case with the diff EQ flux package, I uh, tried to do something similar with a boundary value problem solver. And uh, I can see I don't have too much time, so I just uh, try to show the results and wrap this up quickly. But basically, I have a very simple example of this when uh, I'm using the technique of numerical collocation. And uh, once again, I'm just um, uh, comparing the, the identified periodic solution to the measured data, or in, in this case, it's actually generated uh, by a numerical model. So basically, what I do in this case that I'm just trying to do um, the damping parameter in the damping oscillator model, whereas the other uh, system parameters I fixed. And uh, this could be done with uh, relatively good accuracy, uh, finding, uh, uh, find it, finding a solution that is very close uh, uh, to the original value. And, and, and as you can see, the identified model fits uh, really bad to the measurement data, but this is uh, really just for trying whether uh, this type of concept could work. It's very old, very early days because um, I, of course, just identified a simple parameter, not really the uh, train the neural network or, or, or any more complicated model, but that would be the, the goal in this case. So to summarize these things, uh, uh, my, and, and my presentation, basically, this is uh, very much an exploratory study, mostly to find out uh, the potential of, of universal differential equation models for nonlinear dynamical systems. And uh, 
basically one of the main conclusion I could draw from from uh, my results is that uh, it very much depends on the complexity of the problem. So if the difference between what the physics-based model can do and what we see in the experiment is small, then usually the model tends to tends these models tends to work well. If uh, the, 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 the measure of behavior is more complex, then we may have further difficulties and, and, and the training procedure is often less robust. So, um, and basically the, the, my idea and concept to, to improve this and tailor this to work well with bifurcation diagrams would be to, to change uh, for a boundary value problem solver in the algorithm. Thanks very much for your attention. And I would like to uh, draw your attention to a preprint that's uh, available on archive. So if you found it interesting, then uh, please have a look at that. Thanks very much. Well, thanks a lot, Sandra. Uh, this is a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time for questions. So if you do get questions in the Discord, uh, do hop on there and answer them there. Uh, but I will start the next speaker. Um, so, and uh, I want to very quickly welcome uh, Stefan Ridderbush, Ridderbush, sorry. Um, and he's going to tell us about universal differential equations with Gaussian processes. Take it away. Um, hello, everyone. Um, first off, my apologies. I'm currently, uh, COVID is still a thing that exists. So I apologize for my voice and uh, occasional moments of confusion. Um, so in this talk, I want to talk about universal differential equations, which we all know with um, neural networks, but now let's talk about how this could potentially be done with Gaussian processes. This is based on work that I've done with, um, with Paul Goulart, as I'm a student at uh, Oxford University for the Center of Doctoral Training in Autonomous Intelligent Machines and Systems, in collaboration with Christian Offen and Zina Oberlöbaum from the University of Paderborn in Germany. Um, so let's start by talking about the motivation. And I'm not going to talk all too much about this because for a lot of um, for basically, I think most most of the listeners here who are familiar with the um, SciMail ecosystem, um, a lot of this is is, is potentially well known. Um, if you look at the literature, then you will find that a lot of Gaussian process um, machine learning papers for dynamic systems are learning the discrete flow maps. So there we we have a function that, if you give it a state, gets you the state after a certain fixed time step. That works very well because it fits directly with the trajectory data that we have usually available. Um, and uncertainty propagation is quite easy because it is just a chain of, um, of functions f uh, represented by a Gaussian process. Um, so there, there are sort of nice approximations available there. But unfortunately, the step size is fixed. You can only have the step size that you trained your model with. Um, and because you're learning effectively the flow map, chaotic and complex systems can be quite hard. Um, especially if there's a sensitivity to the initial value. So instead, let's consider continuous vector fields. Uh, and this is sort of why what we all know and like. Um, we have um, a function, and if we give it a state, it gets us back, uh, if it gets us back the gradient at that location. Um, usually, for most ODEs, the vector field is a lot less complex than the flow that you get when, than you get when solving it. Um, and also, if you have the vector field, now you can choose the step size freely and you can choose the solver freely, which is where if you have the, the wide array of solvers from, from the DFIQ ecosystems available, uh, is quite valuable. Um, unfortunately, the data to learn these models is not directly available, um, as we usually don't have the gradient observation, we only have trajectories. Um, and uncertainty propagation through an arbitrary solver is very, very difficult. Um, so now to the part that really, I think, um, I think other speakers have also already talked about. What we want to do is we want to combine data and model knowledge um, because that is substantially more powerful than having e either of those individually. Um, we ideally want, want a model which can take data for um, especially terms that are difficult to describe analytically. But if we have some analytic knowledge or some assumptions, qualitative assumptions that we can make about a system, it'd be very nice if we could incorporate those as well. Um, combining those two gets us usually, or should should get us better extrapolation performance um, structure that we can potentially exploit, and as a result, usually often cheaper training. So, effectively, 
universal differential equations in the neural networks have shown that that what I've just talked about can be done. But now let's do it with Gaussian processes. Talking about Gaussian processes, the first thing that we need to talk about is that I've already mentioned this before, we don't have derivative data available. But GPs need explicit input and output pairs, um, at least sort of in their most naive implementation. Um, and also for some less naive implementations. Um, we have trajectory data with, with time steps and states, um, potentially with noise. But now what we need is states and gradient observations. Um, and all, a, a potential option to get these would be to differentiate along the trajectory. Um, and we could do this, for example, with finite differences, or we do kernel or GP regression. Um, given that this is a talk about GPs, um, let's just assume we, we fit a GP to our time series. And then because GPs are close on a linear operators and differentiation is a linear operator, we can very, we can analytically differentiate that time series and get um, der der derivative uh, information. Um, this is where the many uh, automatic differentiation to, uh, frameworks that we can find in Julia really come in handy. Um, and because it is so easy to incorporate automatic differentiation, there's some interesting um, ideas and perspectives for end-to-end -end treatment of uncertainty. But more on that potentially later. Um, so in Julia specifically, um, there's already a very rich ecosystem of uh, various Gaussian process related um, tools. First of all, a common problem with GPs is that they are very um, computationally uh, intense because the computational cost scales with the number of data points that we have available. Um, a very common way to address these is to use sparse approximations, some of which are already implemented in the approximate GPs package. Uh, and the idea here is that we reduce the data that we have to only M inducing points, where M usually is much less than the number of the total number of data points. So now we only have this cubic scaling with, with the, the number of inducing points that we chose. And potentially, depending on how we choose those um, inducing points, we can even get structure in our kernel matrix, which we can then exploit when we invert it. Now we have certain modeling choices, similarly to neural networks, um, where we can choose the number of layers or the number, number of neurons per layer. Um, and for GPs, this is the first choice that we, we, we can make is to choose the kernel. Uh, and there's a very large number of kernels in the kernel functions.jl package. It is really, um, I think it's been described as the workhorse of the um, GP ecosystem. Um, as most kernels there are very optimized and they're all, um, and they're, they're all ready for automatic differentiation. To choose the inducing points that we might want to use to reduce and reduce the computational load, there's the package inducingpoints.jl, which has various methods to choose inducing points, including some online methods, which, which can adapt the inducing points as more data comes in. And we can also choose different cost functions, some of which are implemented in the GP likelihoods package. Um, but I've also mentioned before that we have the qualitative structure that we would like to. And for certain qualitative structures, GPs are a very good tool to use. Um, first of all, fixed points. In a lot of instances, we know where um, the system is at rest. And um, if we if we know this, this steady state um, for a given system, we can trivially add this to the derivative data set that we feed into the GP. And I'll show an example of doing this later. Um, further, we can also very nicely incorporate linear Lie group symmetries. Um, there is um, a kernel class called the GIM kernels for group integration matrix kernels, which allow us to, if we know that a system has a certain um, Lie group symmetry, we can define a kernel in this fashion. And um, 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 sorry. Um, okay, we can we can get this in a um, um, we can we can define this this uh, this kernel with this uh, integral, uh, and then if we define if we then sample from the resulting GP using this kernel, we guaranteed that the function that we get out of that has the symmetry that we want. Um, for an example. Um, 
here is the spiral ODE, which some of you may have already seen in the diff EQ flux um, example zoo. Uh, and here we compare the top row here are the GP based approaches. We see that in both cases, um, they do correctly convert to a fixed point. Um, here for the right one, we have explicitly added zero as a known fixed point, and we find that it indeed does converge correctly. Um, here it converges to somewhere else, but critically it does converge. Um, even sort of beyond the original data that was provided. Um, by contrast, the neural network example seems to go into some sort of limit cycle. Um, and this is previous work using GPs in, um, um, in ODEs. Um, but unfortunately, it completely misses even the original data, but it does um, convert correctly close to zero. Um, on a slightly shorter time, time scale, looking at this here, we see that um, the vector field gets captured quite well by most methods, um, but sort of as we could have expected from the previous slide, um, the GP-based approaches fit here, fit quite well here. Um, and we can even get uncertainty propagate like, like estimates for the uncertainty as we start to extrapolate beyond the originally provided data. Unfortunately, for this plot, um, the uncertainty was computed using very expensive sampling methods, um, which are not very practical um, in most use cases. So we're currently working on some more efficient ways to make this happen. For an example, for incorporating um, um, symmetry, let's look at the Kepler problem, um, which uh, is defined by the Lagrangian, by the, uh, which is the, defined by the uh, following Lagrangian, which we can see as a rotational symmetry. Uh, and then if we build the corresponding GIM kernel and then do um, then identify the system based on sort of one rotation of the um, of the body, we find that it does indeed sort of fit the the, the, the GP solution does indeed fit very well um, with the um, with the ground truth, especially, the critical line here to look at is the brown one. It does like the ideally the the, the first integral should be perfectly preserved. Um, the brown line has shows some um, light drift, um, which uh, is due to numerical issues currently. Um, so, how does that incorporate into SciML? Um, ideally, what we what would be nice is if it would be possible to just swap in and out neural networks and GPs when trying to identify a system so that <clears throat> um, so that uh, one can one can see which which one works which works better for a given problem um, and to do this there's currently two um, packages that sort of reflect what I've just shown the first one is Gaussian process ODEs um, that is unfortunate I wrote this about a year ago it is unfortunately mostly research code it does work. It has um, its nice bits, but it is not very extendable. So now, more recently, I've started to build GIF, uh, GP DFQ, um, which I hope can be a very lightweight package to co to really connect um, the existing tools from the Ju Julia Gaussian process or processes organization, um, as well as DFQ and Flux packages, um, so that that. As all of these parts get more powerful, the aggregate also gets better. Um, unfortunately, there's still a lot left to do. Um, in the Julian, Julia Gaussian Processes organization itself, um, I, I would like to improve the multi-output API. While multi-output processes have been implemented, um, I think last year, um, there's a bit of quality of life currently missing um, that I would like to improve upon. Um, and more approximation models um, should be added to the approximate GP package um, and to be to be nicely used in an ODE model um, these G it should be easier to rebuild the the, the GPS as, as necessary um, in G GP DFQ, um, this is currently a package um, that I would best describe as end-to-end -end ready to be fixed which is uh, a model that I've stolen from somewhere um, it sort of does all of the things broadly that I would like it to do, but now everything needs to be improved. Everything needs to be tested better, better documented, and more examples. Um, 
all of that then leads to the very big question I've already mentioned this before uncertainty propagation um, how does one send pro uh, uncertainty through an arbitrary solver um, not so trivial even for the for the explicit Euler method um, gets extreme like substantially more complicated with any other solver um, so I'm still working on that one um, yeah in summary GPs can complement neural networks when building universal differential equations. And I hope that at some point we get to a point where they can be used very simply and interchangeably. Um, there are many opportunities to incorporate additional knowledge and assumptions in GPs that are very difficult to incorporate in neural networks. Um, and Julia really is the perfect uh, knowledge to do this, uh, the perfect language to do this in, because there's already a very extensive Gaussian processes uh, ecosystem. Um, there is SIML, which is why we're all here today. Um, and it would be very nice if we could combine all of them. Um, if you have any questions um, about this, please get in touch. And I think I'm not sure how I am on time, but I might stop it here no, and you, take questions. You, you, you have five minutes left for, for questions. Um, so I have one question from YouTube uh, already. Uh, firstly, thank you for the for the talk. This was very enjoyable. Um, you have you have great pictures on the slides as well. I, I really like them. Anyway, um, so the, there's a question from YouTube. Uh, Stefan, uh, have you have you sort of done any experiments comparing you know GPs and, and polynomial chaos uh, you know type uh, approximators or any other types of approximators that you would use in you know uncertainty quantification? Um, I have I have not yet, but I would I would like to. Um, I think this is this is something where again having being being on the vector field level um, um, is much more powerful than being on the on the flow flow um, flow map level that GPS are usually used at used on. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. All right. Um, I also have a question from Discord. Um, has there been work in hierarchical methods uh, which try to sort of identify topological characteristics? Um, um, from, and using GP methods to fit based on identified features. I'm not familiar with with um, these hierarchical methods, um, but I would be very curious um, what they are and and see. Like I'm sure I'm sure that something could be done. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm sure the person um, who's asking the question on Discord is is somebody you could get in touch with and 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 sort of explore further. Um, let me see. I um, in the meantime, I also had a question. Um, how um how difficult it is uh, is it to sort of um you know get these get these things to converge sometimes uh you know um have you you know especially with arbitrary kernels that you would have in in in, in kernel functions is it is it is it, uh, it is it difficult depending on which kernel you choose uh, et cetera et cetera and do you have to do any sort of uh, a conditioning of your data for that in the first place um so so I that sort of part of my of my um, motivation to really build this um, this this package to to uh, to build upon the the uh, Julia processes, Julia Gaussian processes uh, organization is to make it much easier to trust various different kernels, to really look at like really look at this sort of very like very widely. Um, so far, like in my old package, where they had to implement a lot of things myself, um, which sort of limited what I could do. Um, in my tests so far, I found that actually Gaussian processes are quite like very, very nice to optimize. Um, they have usually much, much fewer um, parameters. And like, it's not like in your network where you have like 250, 500 or so um, um, optimization variables. Like sometimes you can, you can get by with only three, um, which means that that optimization can be very, very fast. Um, and yeah, and even even then, if if uh, there's certain certain methods where you optimize the placement of the inducing points, which then adds number of inducing points times dimension, um, additional variables, even that is sort of still less than than a typical neural network might have. Um, so yeah. And I guess um, as a final question, perhaps uh, you you said that um, you know uncertainty propagation through solvers can get very complicated, uh, you know, especially with the you know, uh, with the ex even with an explicit Euler method, could you could you comment a bit more about that so you know we get a better picture of what you're saying? Well, well, essentially, essentially the the problem is that um, um, we, a normal distribution mapped through a nonlinear function is no longer a normal distribution. Usually, it is even no longer symmetric, 
Um, and then the question really becomes, how can you find an approximation that captures that correctly and, and, and keeps, and even like, because, because if you, if you do the wrong kind of mistake, it compounds. So you have to somehow find an approximation that, that is, is, um, sort of sent like stable against compounding in a certain way that like, it, it doesn't make the same error every time. So that, that, that error sort of keeps, keeps building. Um, that is currently the, the, the challenge that I'm, that I'm going into, um, because if you, if you then allow like an arbitrary distribution and you just met, met an arbitrary distribution through nonlinear function, then, you know, then you back to sampling methods effectively. Um, so like sampling is always possible, but it would be nice to have something that uses a, like some cheap approximation, but it is currently not clear to me. I've tried a few different things. It's currently not clear to me what that approximation would need to be. I see that, that that's fascinating. Maybe uh, folks have opinions in the, in the chat. Um, but I, but I, I should thank you once again. Uh, I know you're not well today, and we, I really appreciate you coming out and, and giving this talk. And your and your voice and everything went went great. So, want you to be assured of that. Um, thank you very much. Thanks again, Stefan. Uh, all right. Um, our next and final talk of the session before we take a break is Raj Dandekar, um, and we're going to talk. He's going to talk about UDEs and epidemiology. Uh, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can see my screen. Uh, so today uh, I'll be talking about the role of UDEs in uh, epidemiology. And in doing so, I will introduce a new way uh, to do epidemic modeling. This work has been done with Chris Rakaukas and uh, also in collaboration with George Barbastatis here at MIT. At the end of this presentation, we'll be able to answer the following questions. Number one. How different were the COVID-19 quarantine policies implemented by India and South Korea? Number two, how many infections would have been saved if the southern US states did not reopen early? Can we predict the next wave of the pandemic? And fourth, what is the optimal social distancing or lockdown policy which should be enforced? We'll try answering these questions with the new, with the new framework uh, with its roots in scientific machine learning. So I've divided this presentation into two parts. The first part is the KSIR model and its applications. And the second one is the Safe Blues project. So let's dive into part one first. The SIR model is the most traditional uh, epidemiological model. So S stands for susceptible, I for infected, and R for recovered. It essentially uh, describes a transition from the susceptible to the infected compartment and from the infected to the recovered compartment. So here you can see the blue dots are susceptible, which slowly become infected, which is shown by the red dots. And finally, they become removed or recovered, which is shown by the gray dots. This interaction is represented by a set of uh, ordinary differential equations as shown here. It is because of this that the SIR model is popular because it's very interpretable in nature. However, it has a number of assumptions, one of them being that uh, the assumption of homogeneous mixing. That is, a person's contacts are randomly distributed among the population. There is no provision to include non-uniformities like quarantine or social distancing, etc. in a person's contacts. However, during COVID-19, we saw that it's these very non-uniformities that really shape an infection growth curve, which is seen in a particular country. For example, if you look at the diagram of North Korea's infection, we can see that due to the aggressive quarantining, and the social distancing measures which they implemented, the infections were really curtailed after the first wave. However, you can contrast that with the graph of USA, where we can see that there were a number of uh, peaks in terms of the infected cases because of poor quarantining and uh, social distancing policies. What we really want to do is now incorporate these complex effects in the SIR model. So let's see at a micro level, what such a such an effect would look like. So either it's something on the left, which is we quarantine or isolate a portion of the infected population, and then we prevent them from coming into contact with the rest of the population. Or it's something on the right, which simulates a kind of a lockdown situation where a person really only interacts with their neighbors and uh, uh, there's a distance range which we impose on the interactions. What we want to do is model these complexities, but without resorting to complicated agent-based models. We somehow want to retain the ODE structure which the SIR model has, but also simulate these complex effects. The way we will do this is we will develop a machine learning augmented SIR model, which takes into account these quarantining or social distancing effects. In particular, we will look at UDEs. So 
uh, you may ask how are we planning to do that so the way we'll do this is we'll represent these quarantining or social distancing effects as neural networks and then learn them based on the country specific data towards the end what we'll see is that these resulting models which are augmented by neural networks are not only expressive but they are also very good diagnostic tools they are interpretable in nature which lead to very powerful uh, globally applicable diagnostic tools so let's look at how this qsr model is constructed we know what we want to simulate we essentially want to um, isolate a portion of the infected population and prevent them from coming into contact with the rest of the population so intuitively we know that we need to subtract a term from the infected population but we don't know the form which the term will take so we'll use a neural network to approximate that term essentially the Q the sir model is converted to something of this form so here you can see that in the infected compartment we have a neural network subtraction term which represents this transition to this quarantine compartment or isolated compartment so we have one more compartment here and this is the addition additional neural network now we want to train this qsir model on country specific data to do that we will need to optimize the parameters of the neural network to minimize the loss between our model and the data to do so we'll need to take derivatives of the loss function with respect to the neural network weights and for this we'll use the adjoint equations so adjoint equations essentially let us calculate derivatives of uh, uh, functions of ode solvers with respect to neural network parameters uh, i won't go into too much detail into these adjoint equations but basically uh, they are a set of odes and once we solve them we can get a gradient of the loss function with respect to the neural network weights and then we can perform gradient descent routines to optimize these weights all of the modeling which modeling results which are shown later are done in the julia language uh, so now let's look at the results once we optimize this qsr model we can apply this to a number of different countries all over the world Firstly, we can see that uh, compared to the baseline data, the model does pretty well. So the red red bars here rep represent the infected population data in the country in Italy. And uh, the timeline, just to give you a sense, we looked at February 2020 to May 2020, so roughly about three months. And we can see that and the blue is the recovered data. We can see here that the QSR model captures the trend in the underlying data for both the infected and the recovered population this may not be too surprising since we have neural networks we expect the model to be expressive what is probably one of the important takeaways from this presentation is this plot here if you look at the so first of all this plot is for china the black dots here represent the quarantine strength which is recovered by our neural network it's the optimized neural network output and we are calling it the recovered quarantine strength it shows this particular variation. The red line is the time at which a ramp up is detected in this uh, quarantine strength. What we noticed is that this, this time is actually very similar to the time at which a government lockdown was imposed in China. And that was a great news for us because if this is true, then the model can really be used as a diagnostic tool to understand what's going on um, in the particular country. Now we wanted to test this particular thing on several different countries. And we saw that for a wide range of countries, the time at which the recovered quarantine strength, which is the red line here, shows a ramp up in our neural network optimized function lies very similar to the time at which the government lockdown was imposed or quarantine measures were strengthened in the region under consideration. We eventually did this for uh, 75 different countries which is hosted the results are hosted at this particular site you can check this out and we essentially showed that the model which you developed the qsir model is not only very expressive in nature but it can be used as a powerful diagnostic tool to understand what's happening on ground in the particular country so this makes this model pretty impactful as we have seen over the last one year it has been used by in a number of different uh, areas. Uh, various national labs have, are using it. Silicon Valley startups have reached out to us and uh, academic institutions uh, are also using it. One of the key aspects because of which the model uh, can be further more useful is that it's flexible in nature. It doesn't need to stick to just the quarantine effects, but 
there's a for example there is a group of students at mit who is working on the vsir or the vaccination sir model in this they represent the vaccination term by a neural network and then they are applying this model to a number of different countries of the world this flexibility is also one key uniqueness of the models constructed using this uh, approach rooted in scientific machine learning we wanted to further test this model on to another different setting so we choose the we chose the time period of may to july 2020 and uh, we were especially interested in what happened in the united states during this particular period so if you look at this video we can see that during may to may to july 2020 the cases in europe were kind of reducing and stagnating but there was an exponential explosion in the number of cases which was seen in especially the southern and the west central uh, united states in particular we looked at these nine states which showed a huge surge in the number of infections now we wanted to ask the question that can we apply the qsir model here and can the model recovered qft be correlated with early reopening in these states and secondly how many infections would have been reduced if these states had not reopened early okay so now we applied this model to number of different states and first i'm showing you this plot for the state of south carolina so there are number of things to unpack here so let me go step by step the red dots here represent the current neural network recovered quarantine strength by our model it shows a increase and a subsequent decrease what's great here is that the time at which there is a cusp seen in the recovered quarantine strength by our model actually matches very well with the time at which the stay at home order expired in the state of south carolina this shows that our model recovered quarantine strength q of t shows a drop when the state reopened which is here then what we did was okay what if the state had not reopened early and what if its quarantine strength had not decreased so what if the state had maintained its quarantine strength at this particular level what would have happened we simulated this particular scenario for the state of south carolina and we saw that the number of infections which are shown by this blue uh, blue line here would have been significantly less compared to the number of infections which are actually seen shown by these red bars so the second conclusion for this particular state was that in the event of a stricter lockdown the infections could have been reduced significantly so we had two basic Uh, conclusions which we wanted to check for all the states first do, do all the states for do this for all the states q of t show a drop when the state reopened and second in the event of stricter lockdown can infections have been reduced significantly in all of these states first thing which you observed is that for all nine states which we looked at our model shows a drop on q of t when the state reopened and secondly for all the states which we considered in the event of stricter lockdown the number of infections could have been reduced by significant amount so this study again confirmed the validity of the qsir model as a diagnostic tool finally uh, in the last 3 or 4 minutes i want to uh, talk about another project which is the safe blues project which we did through this project what we wanted to demonstrate was that virtual virus spread through bluetooth tokens can be used as an indicator for real time estimate of infection statistics this study is now being uh, conducted as an uh, experiment in the Auckland University uh, New Zealand so the main premise was this after a government policy is implemented such as lockdown mask measures etc it usually takes a week or two before realizing whether it's working or not so the question was can we really reduce this lag to zero and this is why we designed the safe blues campus experiment so how it works is as follows so let's say there are a number of students in a college campus we ask them to participate in this safe blues experiment once they agree to participate uh, they download the safe blues app and once they do that their phone is seeded with a huge ensemble of strands a strand has number of properties such as transmissibility incubation duration infection duration and a strand can spread across nearby smartphone through bluetooth communication so let's say if two students meet at a cafeteria and they interact then there is a and both of them have safe blue app then basically the strands can change properties based on whether it's infected or recovered etc then what we do is we train a neural network between the historical covid-19 data and the safe blues strands data the real 
key here is that the safe blue strands data is available to us in real time. So if we can train a deep neural network between the historical data and the real time safe blues data, we can have a real time prediction without any lag of the epidemic trajectory. The key point here is that uh, biological pathogens and uh, Bluetooth both have proximity as the key factor which governs their transmission. So we constructed a deep neural network and we trained it. So this plot kind of summarizes uh, the conclusions. If you look at the red dots here, this is the infected data, which we only have up till this time. Whereas the blue strands are the safe blues strands, which are available to us in real time. So it's available year, even up till year, let's say two weeks after the point during which the infected data is available. And based on this data, we train a neural network between the infected data and the safe blues data, and then we forecast. And then what we can see is that if you look at the forecasted data, the prediction which is shown by this blue line matches very well with the true data during this time, which is shown by these yellow circles. So I'm going a bit fast through this in the interest of time, but if you have any questions regarding this, please feel free to reach out. These are some preliminary results which were done in the Auckland University campus. And uh, at the heart of all of this is a scientific machine learning framework. So essentially we have neural networks integrated with uh, SIR modules, which are used for predictions. And this type of uh, safe blues module can also be used for policy control. Essentially we can ask questions like, okay, what is the lockdown strength which is required which will get the effective reproduction number to less than one it should not be too less or it should not be too high what is the optimal policy which can be implemented to get the reproduction number less than one so safe blues methodology enables us to get real-time estimates real-time estimates such as the ones presented here so okay in conclusion what we have shown and what we have seen generally is that neural network augmented frameworks udes can lead to powerful epidemiological models. These models are not only expressive and powerful, but also highly interpretable in nature. And they can potentially replace complex compartment models. In the future, we have an active collaboration, which we are doing with Sandia Labs currently to test some of these methodologies on real data, which they have. And we want to also integrate these uh, UDE framework with Bayesian modules so that we can do error quantification. And I would like to thank you for your time and would be happy to um, answer or discuss any questions. Thanks, thanks a lot, Raj. Um, uh, you could um, you could still share your screen if, you, if you'd like to skip over slides, um, yeah. but that's not crucial. Um, uh, to a great, great talk, I, I mean, I've seen previous versions of the talk and I think you've really nailed it this time. It's fantastic. Uh, I, I have one question from YouTube. Um, so uh, do you do Cindy or something similar to try and identify the symbolic form of the quarantine term Q? Yeah. So uh, what we have shown um, in one of our recent studies is that um, symbolic recovery can be done on these models. And we can essentially get the interaction terms, like what the neural network actually represents. I plan to include it in this talk, but I thought that it would extend the time. But I will be definitely happy to chat further regarding this. So whoever has posted this question, yeah, it's it's on it's on YouTube. You you'll be able to find it on the on the live stream. Yes. Um, uh, I uh, I have one more question. Um, mm -hmm. Why why the why the SIR models? I'm sure there are like a, a million of these uh, these models out there, right? So why why do you why do you choose to add mm -hmm. neural networks to that one, or why not a different one? Yeah, that's a good question actually. So first, we wanted to start out with the simplest model. And the SIR is one of the simplest compartment models out there. So it's a three compartment model. And after showing that it works indeed for three compartment models, and now we have even shown that it works for five or nine compartment models. So we just chose the SIR because it's simple. And uh, now we are moving to more complicated uh, models. I see. So in principle, you could you could use different ones and you'll get different kinds of inter interpretability for each exactly, of them. Exactly, exactly. Mm, I see. Um, and and uh, I think we have another minute, so I will I will follow up again and say, hey, mm -hmm. uh, what about the uh, the vaccine SIR model? Uh, what how how well is it doing? Do we do we get a sneak peek of the results there? 
that's a good question actually so the team who is working on that i think they started uh, four or five months back and uh, i still think they are working a bit more to polish the results but essentially there is a good comparison result between let's say the country of israel and some other countries so i think there are some good results to be expected in that study well that's a, that sounds very very exciting i think we're at the point where we all want to see mm-hmm. those types of results um, yeah. all right i um i think i will close it off uh, uh close it off now and uh, give one minute to the audience and we have a 10 minute break now mm-hmm. um thanks again raj by okay. the way um thanks ranjit see you around um so we have um we have a 10 minute break now and and we will begin again at uh, 3 pm eastern All right and see you guys in about uh, 10 minutes
All right, we are back. Just gonna, Rafael, I just added you to the stream along with your slides. Um, and we can begin uh, in approximately a minute. Sounds good. Can you hear me well? Yep, I can hear you well and your slides are visible. My slides are visible. Let me check. Am I changing the slide now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, you um, can flip through them if you'd like as well. I mean, yeah, all looks. Um, yeah, can I can I start now? Yeah, let me let me uh, wait. Uh, it's two fifty nine. Yeah, now yeah, let me introduce you first. So, um, I welcome back everyone. Um, uh, it it is our pleasure to to invite uh, Rafael Pestori from MIT to uh, give us a talk on physics enhanced deep surrogates that are trained end to end. Hi, um, I am. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranjan, for the introduction. Uh, so I am a postdoctoral associate uh, in the math uh, mathematics department at MIT, and today I'm presenting about physics enhanced uh, deep surrogate trained end to end using Julia. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with uh, Youssef Mwue and Payal Das from IBM and uh, uh, Chris and uh, Steven Johnson um, from uh, MIT. Um, and so uh, what, is, what is a surrogate model? Uh, it is a learned model that fits a particular outcome of a partial differential equation, uh, which I will call PDE. Uh, and it, it is not a solver. Uh, that will compute the solution for the PDE, uh, but rather a data-driven model which will fit a particular property of the PDE solution. For example, in uh, optics, uh, um, uh, where the PDE, uh, PDE is our Maxwell's equation, um, you can see on this image um, a surrogate um, that is fitted to pre predict the complex transmission um, uh, through a structure uh, based on the parameters of the geometry here, the, the width of all those little rectangles over the 10 layers that you can see. And another parameter of the surrogate model uh, are the, is the frequency of the incoming light. Um, and today uh, we'll show uh, results for this uh, specific surrogate model. Um, at evaluation time, um, since a surrogate model does not solve uh, for the PDE solution, but rather evaluates a fit, uh, surrogate models are orders of magnitude faster than PDE solvers. For an application like uh, this one in optics, a typical speed up would be 10,000 times faster in 2D uh, simulations uh, and uh, a million times faster for a 3D simulation. Um, uh, sorry. Um, and, and in practice, in optics, this surrogate model is used in conjunction with uh, decomposition methods um, for a very computationally challenging simulation problem, such as computing the light scattered by a meta surface. And if you are more interested, I'm not going to talk about it today, but if you're interested in, uh, into this, uh, please refer to my previous work in Optics Express. Um, uh, but, but there's no uh, free lunch. The fast evaluation uh, time uh, comes at the cost of generating a lot of training data, which uh, involves um, computing PDE solutions many times. And so data generation uh, re is really the bottleneck of uh, high dimensional surrogate models. Um, note that like surrogate models are also become more costly as the number of inputs uh, dimension increases. But the bottleneck is the cost of the generation of the data. Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on uh, in my talk today. Um, and and uh, a, a first a surrogate model, a traditional one that works very well for up to four or five parameters uh, is Chebyshev interpolation. Chebyshev polynomials are great because they are exponentially convergence uh, for a smooth function. And so it, less, it requires less expensive PDE solves to train. Um, and, and these two images here, the top left and the bottom right, um, shows that like the choice of point is important. The strength of Chebyshev interpolation comes from its uh, polynomials and its uh, special set of training points that you can see at the bottom left, uh, the Chebyshev points. Uh, 
for the same function, uh, the top left image uses GPGF points and the bottom right uses equally spaced points. And the latter presents uh, very big artificial uh, oscillations, which are a catastrophe for uh, surrogate models, which is called Runge phenomenon. And uh, here it really shows that, um, yeah, the choice of points uh, really matters. Unfortunately, uh, for um, Chebyshev polynomials, uh, it requires uh, for like a polynomial of degree n in each direction, it requires n plus one uh, points. And so for p parameters, you would need uh, n plus one to the power of p points uh, to train uh, your surrogate model. And so the, the number of points um, uh, really quickly becomes intractable as the number of parameter increases. Uh, and this is called the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and so in contrast to polynomials, uh, neural networks seem to alleviate the curse of dimensionality. Uh, neural networks are now very popular. It is an algorithm with thousands to millions of parameters which take uh, an input, uh, does a bunch of matrix multiplications composed with nonlinear activation functions on multiple layers. Research is still active to understand why they work so well, but they have had a lot of practical successes in particular as surrogate models in optics. But again, there's a trade-off between accuracy and training time. A neural network uh, with many parameters might be more expressive, but it will be more expensive to evaluate and take more data to train. Again, today we are going to focus on alleviating the training cost, which is then dominated by data generation. When and why should we use neural networks instead of brute force solvers for PDEs? Um, in optics, at least, a lot of people are trying to use neural network, um, but our physics model is great in optics, unlike uh, for some other problems where neural network are used, like uh, face recognition. Um, and, and so in the top left of this slide, uh, I show uh, uh, another Frenchman, a Frenchman like me, André-Marie Ampère, and in the top right, James Clerk Maxwell, and, uh, them and a lot of other people worked really hard to have a very good physical model for electromagnetic waves. And, and neural networks, uh, the vanilla neural networks at least, don't, don't have physics in them. And so it's very difficult to compete with physical models and um, brute force solvers. And often um, you are better off solving for Maxwell's equation with a good brute force model uh, uh, directly. However, um, Surrogate models are a complete case for using neural networks because they can be reused millions of times and evaluate much faster than solving for the PDE. And so over time, you can amortize the training cost. And also, they seem to handle uh, uh, high dimensional inputs well, so it makes them great candidate for surrogate applications. Later in this talk, I'm presenting ways to include the physical knowledge uh, of the PDEs inside the deep surrogate. So today I will focus on the topic of data efficiency and I will start by mentioning briefly an active learning algorithm which I published a couple of years ago and I'm currently expanding uh, Coded in Julia with Ranjan and Antaraman. Um, and the question uh, for this type of uh, project is how can we use feedback from the surrogate model as it learns to find an efficient set of training points? Uh, start with the results here. Here I show the fractional error on a test set for three models. Uh, in green, uh, the Chebyshev interpolation, which uses Chebyshev points, and it performs the worst because it suffers the curse of dimensionality. Recall I'm using this surrogate model I introduced earlier with 10 geometry parameters. Uh, the orange and blue models are neural network surrogates, which can we can already see that the neural networks perform much better than polynomials. And the orange one was trained with randomly sample points, uh, uh, whereas the blue one was trained with points explored using our active learning algorithm. We see that um, the blue model reaches an accuracy of 7% with about 20, uh, uh, 12 times less points than the orange model, showing the effectiveness of our active learning algorithm. And the active learning algorithm goes as followed. Um, the training set is initialized with a few sample, uh, a few points sampled at random, and then there are three steps. 
a, a training step first where uh, you train your data model on your current training set. And you train another model, which is your uncertainty quantification model, which will give you an estimate of how well, uh, uh, or give you an estimate of the error uh, of your data model for your surrogate model. And then you have a second step, the filtering step, where you evaluate your uh, uncertainty model, your uh, error estimate on n times k randomly sampled points. And you select only the k points with the highest uh, uncertainty estimates. And there's a third uh, uh, step where you compute the points, but only for those with highest uh, estimated uncertainty. Uh, and then you add those to the training set. And uh, you repeat this uh, t times. Uh, and the result showed, uh, showed in the previous slide, uh, m was equal to 4. So I discarded 3 quarter of the randomly sampled points before the PDA uh, 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 simulations. And t was equal to 8. So for each data set size, the data set was created by incrementally adding points to the training set eight times. And what is great about this uh, uh, algorithm is its generality. It's independent of the uncertainty quantification method. So you can use it with var a variety of UQ techniques. And in fact, you only need a monotonic function of the error. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, confidence interna, uh, interval spread uh, would work just as well. And it's independent of the PDE, so, so it can work with any PDEs. And uh, we've seen uh, already uh, 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 improvement and reduction in uh, need for data for Maxwell's equation, linear elastic mechanics, and uh, the Fourier heat equation. Um, and uh, in, in the NPG article from two years ago, I used uh, an ensemble of heteroscedastic regressions, uh, whose mean is the predictor um, uh, and uh, the, of, for the complex transmission. And the pool variance is the measure of uncertainty quantification. Uh, and, uh, here the, uh, and, and here the loss uh, function was the negative log likelihood of the model. Um, I'm using uh, this last function uh, in the next part uh, of my talk. Uh, and, and in this application, the model serves both as predictor and as measure of uncertainty quantification. But technically, those two models don't need to be in the same. They can be separate. Uh, now I will focus on the second question. Uh, how? Uh, can we leverage field knowledge inside the surrogate? And this work was published at the end of last year on archive. Um, and indeed, there is a lot of field knowledge out there to, to leverage on for surrogate models. Uh, we know a lot of PDEs that uh, governs different physical processes in optics, um, thermal, uh, quantum physics, photovoltaics, climate modeling, or mechanics. And so, uh, coming back on our optics example, we want to fit. So I'm uh, looking at uh, the, this uh, 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 box, the 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 the, the, right, the right top left rectangle. We want to fit the complex transmission computed by an accurate solver that is symbolized by a picture of James Clerk Maxwell. And the idea of the physics enhanced deep surrogate, the the other box uh, called PEDS. Uh, is to combine a neural network generator with a low fidelity model here symbolized by a cartoon of James Clerk Maxwell. In itself, the low fidelity model is very inaccurate with an error of more than 100%, uh, but it contains uh, knowledge of the physics. It contains Maxwell's equation, could contain, you know, in other applications, conservation laws, and, and it computes much faster than the high fidelity solver. The surrogate model takes the same geometry as the accurate solver. And inside PEDS, there are two channels. One is a field knowledge-based transformation of the input to an input of the low fidelity solver. And the other goes through a generative neural network that will alter this low fidelity solver input. Trained end-to-end, -end, the neural network generator finds the input to the low fidelity model that will result in the same complex transmission as the computationally closely accurate solver for Maxwell's equation. This type of surrogate model 
is about 10,000 times faster than solving for the Krusty Maxwell's equation directly in 3D. And here I'm presenting the fractional error with respect to the number of training data for these optic surrogate. Uh, and I compare the, the results of PETS combined with my active learning algorithm, which I presented before. Um, and I compare it to this uh, the neural network only baseline and also to an improved baseline that uses active learning. And, and the, the improvement is really dramatic and potentially asymptotically faster. Looking back on the motivation for PEDS, uh, it can be applied to many different physics problems. Uh, a a low-fidelity model is very easy to find. It can be, for example, a model that is reducing the resolution. Um, it can be a model that is simplifying the physics, for example, I don't know, uh, um, removing a nonlinear term in the PDE. Uh, and, and you can apply this PET strategy for many physics problems. We're currently looking into uh, 3D Maxwell surrogates and surrogates for the Boltzmann transport equation. Wanted to um, talk about um, uh, th these projects are uh, now uh, both uh, fully implemented in Julia. Uh, the active learning project, uh, uh, we're currently extended, extending this active learning algorithm with Ranjan uh, and integrating it into Julia Sim circuit, the JL. And for the physics enhanced deep circuit, I'm going to release the code soon. Uh, it's currently um, uh, uh, not really uh, open source ready. Um, but uh, it, it was easily uh, it was easy to stack the neural network with this like solver layer using uh, flux.gl and zygote.gl, and for the back propagation through the solver layer uh, under the hood, what it's doing is an adjoint simulation that is uh, solved inside an R rule uh, that that was like custom defined using chain rules.gl. Uh, and the code runs on CPU, unfortunately, because um, uh, it, it uses uh, sparse solves, which are not supported on GPUs. Uh, and solving for the low fidelity solver, in my case, required a sparse solve. Um, but I, I did parallelize the batch loop uh, when training uh, the model uh, using MPI.gl and the all reduce function, which also needed um, uh, another R, a specific R, R rule. I'm very excited uh, to be presenting uh, here and invited to uh, give this talk. And I am open to collaboration. So please uh, contact me if you want to use this framework for your own physical systems. And uh, I will also... Uh, yeah, uh, answer questions on Discord. Yeah. Minutes uh, <laughs> uh, for for your talk, but but uh, but yeah, we can. Um, let me quickly check the 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 Discord. Um. Yeah. Um. Actually, um, maybe I should perhaps lead with my own question. Um. Mm -hmm. So there's so you spoke about you know that you're looking at the course geometry and then you're you're uh, using a generative network. To, uh, to generate the fine geometry, and how do you train that generative network? Do you use like a multigrid method to figure out like an interpolation, interpolating factor between some coarse geometry and a fine geometry, and just keep training that into keep training that GAN to, to imitate that interpolation? Or how exactly do you train it? Yeah, so the, you know you have a lot of freedom uh, uh, in, in your generator. Uh, in the slides I've showed, it, it's actually. Um, uh, using a, the parameterization of the fine geometry, so it's it, you know it's using those width of the different rectangles, uh, and then it's just a, a fully connected neural network that that uh, uh, outputs like the a, a coarsified uh, version of, uh, of the structure uh, that will you know result uh, in in the same um, uh, complex transmission uh, once you solve it with this low fidelity solver and. So matching the high fidelity solver, uh, but I'm also exploring uh, uh, an, in another project like uh, 
uh, more of a convol convolutional arch architecture when the input is just like the fine image directly. Um, and and right now it's it, there's no there's it, it's not like uh, adversarial uh, you know uh, type of approach. It's it's just uh, you you have this you have this generator um, uh, that's that uh, which output is used by your low fidelity solver and, and then you're just tra training end to end to match uh, uh, the surrogate output that you need. Well, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, there's a question from YouTube. Um, you mentioned earlier in the in the talk about drawing candidate points at random. Yeah. So it was like uniformly uh, at random. Oh, uh, yeah. So that that's like uh, that's the baseline we used. No. Yeah. Okay. The, the question is is what distribution that is, and you and you just uh, answered us. Yeah, yeah. And and then basically the, this active learning uh, uh, algorithm is is really kind of a Bayesian algorithm where uh, you know you're 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 basically changing the the the, the distribution of of uh, of your sample points by using this filtering technique. Mm -hmm. um, you also have a couple of questions from Discord. So um, does PEDS introduce a new level of opaqueness in the investigation of uh, the Maxwell equations? Uh, what does it mean by, by opaqueness? Uh, it, it, I would say, if anything, it's, it's adding knowledge and it's making it more interpretable. Uh, you can, for example, um, uh, inspect what uh, what is the generated uh, low fidelity structure and uh, maybe make sense out of it. Um, uh, so, so in a sense of interpretability of your model, I think it's, uh, and, and, you, and then the low fidelity solver is really just like a solver for the PDE. So it's pretty interpretable. Okay. Um, but I'm, I, I might have misunderstood the question. Yeah, no, I, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's one interpretation. Um, there's there's another one on Discord and on YouTube. So why do you need a a, a sparse solve instead of a low resolution dense solve? You know specifically when when talking about the FTDT simulation. Yeah, so it's an uh, 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 a frequency domain simulation. So you have you know uh, your your you you have your operator that is uh, you know matrix which is uh, uh, you know uh, very sparse. So you want to use this uh, property in order to uh, you know, solve it efficiently and be able to scale it a bit. Okay, and um, I think the the person who asked the question about opaqueness, uh, they by opaqueness they meant that uh, you know there is there's an extra layer added, right? I mean, there's this generator layer added that that perhaps uh, is not interpretable or perhaps is not uh, we that, that we don't quite may not know how to interpret as well. Uh, so, if you have any comments on that? Yeah, in in the archive paper, we actually have a whole section about uh, 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 you know physical insights uh, related to the the generator. Um, so you, you can see what it generates, and then uh, we did also some uh, PCA analysis of of the generator, and we could like uh, and 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 this all like the the results we found like all made sense. For example, uh, for um, higher uh, frequency. Um, which corresponds to shorter wavelength, the generated structures like were varying, varying much more uh, compared to like low frequency uh, uh, type of gener uh, 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 generations. Okay, so I think um, I've exhausted the questions from YouTube and Slack, but I had one. I had one more on uh, on on geometries again. Aren't there other aren't there other types of methods out there that generate uh, geometries for you know for for PDE solutions, um, and you know, if so, if, is is do you get a chance to look at in, any of the other methods? Um, so the the method I've um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but um, there is a, a whole literature on a technique called space mapping, um, and uh, the major difference is in space mapping the 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 dimension of the. Uh, the dimension of your low fidelity solver is the same as the dimension of your high fidelity solver. So you don't, you don't have that um, uh, that freedom uh, in the generate in the generator. You don't have as much freedom. Uh, so, but that's that's a very large literature over the past twenty years. Um, yeah. 
All right, that, that, that makes sense. There's, there's one more question on YouTube about benchmarks. Um, when you said your approach is faster than PD solvers, you know, how, how much faster? Um, when I approach what? Um, so supposing, um, you know, let's say you're solving the Maxwell's equations, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, versus... Yeah, so, so so in order to get this complex transmission, so like it's a surrogate model, it's not a solver, right? So you you only care about the complex transmission, for example, or for some other applications. Uh, in in thermal, uh, you might uh, care about the thermal conductivity of your your structure, uh, or like the young models in linear elas uh, elastic mechanics. Uh, so there's just one number, um, and so uh, to to compute that number. Uh, it's uh, for example, uh, go back in optics. Uh, it was it's uh, ten thousand times faster to evaluate that PEDS uh, compared to evaluating the brute force Maxwell solve. All right, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have fifteen minutes until the the next talk, but um, I think uh, maybe we'll we'll close this talk and just uh, break for fifteen minutes and come back. Oh, yeah. uh, th thanks again, Rafael. This is great. I really yeah. enjoyed it. All right, we are going to take a break now, and we will be back at 3.40 p.m. Uh, EST.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we will we will start the next talk very soon. Um, let me try and add the pre-recorded video here. Um, all right, our next our next speaker is uh, Ching Yu Chu, um, who will be talking about fractional order computing and modeling with Julia. Um, this is a pre-recorded video, so um, once the video is, uh, make sure to ask questions on the chat that uh, Ching Yu can check out either, uh, you know, whenever it's uh, it's morning for him. So um, we would appreciate uh, we would appreciate you just directing the questions to the chat. And let me just start it off. Introduce you how can Julia be used in fractional order computing and modeling? Well, we already studied classical calculus. We can get the derivative and integral of a function. But you may wonder, is there a half derivative or a quarter integral? The answer is yes, we have fractional calculus. So here we have a simple introduction of fractional calculus. Suppose we have a function fx equals k power of x. Then we can get the first derivative and the second derivative. We can extend to the nth derivative. So here we replace n to a half. We can get the half derivative of fx. So you may be wonder, we already have classical calculus. What is the meaning of fractional order? So since the invention of fractional calculus, it has shown its powerful application in mathematics and engineering. So I believe fractional order modeling and computing will only become more and more appealing. <laughs> so first, we will see the fractional calculus.gl. It's a package, it's a Julia package we can use to compute fractional calculus. There are different sets derivative and integral in fractional calculus. So we also have support for all these kinds, such as capital, remainable, and other sense. The usage of fractional calculus.gl is very simple. Just call frac div and frac int and pass the function order the, the, the specific point and the step size and choose an algorithm to compute the derivative and the integral. So here is so here is the different order of different functions. With the help of symbolic utils.gl, we implement symbolic half-order fractional differentiation and integration. While these features are still in test periods, I think I still think these features can help researchers a lot. Then we can see the fractional diffq.gl. Here is the problems overview of all of the problem types in fractional difficult.gl. We have FODE problem, FPDE problem, FDDE problem, FIE problem, and many more. So we can start with the FODE problem, which is fractional ordinary differential equations. We can divide FODE problem into two classes. First, we will see the single term FODE which means there is only one fractional differential equation. There is only one fractional differential operator in the equation. All we need to do is define the problem by a similar to differential equations to GL by passing the function, order, initial condition, and the time span. Choose an algorithm and plot our solutions 
we can see the solver achieve a high precision. Then, we can see the multi-term FODE. There are many fractional differential operators in the, in the equation. So we, can def so we can abstract the mathematical models and define our problem by passing the parameters, orders, right-hand function, and time span. Choose an algorithm, then plot the approximating solutions. So then we can see the system of fractional differential equations. It's very easy to solve the system of FDE. But here, what I what what amazed me the most must be the enhancement of FDE solvers. So when in MATLAB we we are so in MATLAB we are we are solving a trial system using FOTF toolbox. But it cost us 20 minutes to complete the simulation. Then we use Met, then we use then we from then we translate the code from MATLAB to Julia. Then we only cost eight minutes to complete the simulation. And that is just what we and that is we just translate the code from MATLAB to Julia. So I believe there will be more improvement in fractional difficult GL. So here is some fractional order chaotic systems. Very beautiful. Then, then we can see the fractional partial differential equations. Uh, there are relatively little solvers for FPDE, mainly focused on diffusion equations and advection equations. But I think there will be more solvers in the future. Then we can see the fractional delay differential equations. It's also very easy to solve these problems. Abstract our mathematical models similar to differential equations or GL and choose an algorithm and solve the problem. Plot the numerical solution. We get the we got we get our solutions. Then it's very easy to solve system of FDD. Just define problem, solve problem, and plot solutions. Yeah. Okay. Then, then we can see the distributed order differential equations. So what is the distributed order? The 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 differentiation order is no longer integer or fractions, but the weight function of distribution of order. The, the mathematical definition is as follows. Similar with similar with mm, what we had what we said before, just define our problem by let's say here is an example. Define our problem with parameters. Here we have the parameters or the order. The, here, the, here the omega alpha is a function. And the right hand side to uh, and then pass, pass the function. And uh, so here we choose a, so, choose a solver. Choose a solver to solve the problem. Then we plot. Then we can plot our solution. Then we can see the fractional integral equations. While while the while the FIE problem is still in test periods, but uh, it's very it is very exciting. With the help of approximate GL, fractional difficult difficult or Fractional difficult or GL is able to solve fractional integral equations. Like the example, we have second kind of integral equation. Similar with 
similar with before, similar with what we had, what we said before, like FOTE problem, FTE problem. Here we define our FIE problem with these parameters, order, and right hand side, and choose its forward, plot our solution. We get our we get our approximating solution. So then, if we, we take left brain function as the queen function in fractional calculus, many uh, many solutions of fractional differential equations are in forms of we take left brain function. In fractional difficult GL, we have built in we take left brain function computing. We support one parameter, two parameter, and three parameter metagraphic function computing. So here, here is the different order of metagraphic function. Yeah, this is the one parameter version. Okay. I had to, I had to admit there are also some imperfects in in these libraries. There are still more there are still a lot of works we need to do in the future. For example, the design pattern and the, the benchmarks, also the documents, there are some missing documents we need to we need to fix. So here inside ML conference I call for developers who interested in fractional differential equations and uh, Julian to join us. So our mission uh, our mission is to make the fractional order modern and computing more easier with Julian. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Chingyu. We apologize for the uh, the audio issues here. Um, you know, while while these audio issues are uh, undesirable at virtual conferences, they are just far too co common. Um, so um, we we again we have uh, time to spare before our next talk. So what we're going to do is take a break until our next talk, which will start at four p.m. Um, all right. See you, uh, see you guys in a bit. Don't forget to ask Chingyu questions in, in the Discord so that he can get to them. Thank you.
All right, the music should have stopped playing. Um, all right, uh, Gabriel, I'll uh, quickly introduce you, and you could start at uh, 4 p.m. sharp. That sounds good. Uh, you are on mute, by the way. Can you hear me all right now? I can hear you all right now, and your and your screen is visible too. So that sounds good. Yes. All right. Right. It, it's four, so I'll introduce you. Um, um, please let me welcome uh, Gabriel Birnbaum, who's going to talk to us about modeling plasma ph physics with neuralpds.gif. Cool. Thank you. So hi, everyone. So my name is Gabriel Birnbaum, and I'm an independent computational scientist based in San Francisco. Um, during the day, I actually work at a tech startup here called Substack. And at night, I work on like modeling differential physics, which I find quite neat as a little hobby. Um, and today I want to talk to you about how it used um, NeuroPDE to solve some plasma physics models and to build Plasma JL, which is this interface to make it easier for others to do the same. So we're going to talk about building this interface, extending NeuroPDE to these use cases, and generally working with physics, physics informed neural networks. So first, let's talk about what is a plasma. Not to be confused with the blood plasma, or what we're talking about here is the superheated matter, also known as the fourth state of matter. So when something is very cold, it is in a solid state, you heat it up a bit, it becomes a liquid, you heat it up more, it becomes a gas. And when you heat up a gas to a certain point um, in really extreme temperatures, the electrons are basically ripped away from the atoms, making it an ionized gas, um, which is also called a plasma. And these gases, they're electrically conducting systems and their behavior is pretty complex. As you can see, you know, gas models are already pretty complex to model. And once one adds electrodynamics to it, the system becomes even more um, intricate. But in any case, plasma is pretty important. It comprises over 99% of the visible universe. Stars are plasmas, nebulas are plasmas. And um, it is the active goal of, um, uh, part of astrophysics and much of nuclear fusion research to predict um, the behavior and movement of plasmas. So I guess the question comes up that, how does one model plasmas? And one way to do that is through the Vlasov equation. And this Vlasov model is one of the most accurate models that we have to model plasma behavior. It's a kinetic model, and it describes the time evolution of the distribution function of a plasma. It is also one of the most complex models that we, we have in plasma physics. Um, as you can see here, are, um, a lot of math. We don't need to worry too much um, about it. Gabriel, are you are you, uh, cha are you uh, changing your slides there? Uh, because yeah. we cannot see the, the slides changing. Oh, that is odd. Did you see okay. this change? Uh, no. Um, you see this? Ah, now, now I can see it's changed. That Let's is. do it like this then. Sorry about yeah. that. Um, Okay, so we were here. What is a plasma? And now we're talking about plasma and the Vlasov equation. Sorry about that. Moving along. So basically, um, the as I was saying, the Vlasov equation describes the time evolution of the distribution function of plasmas. And it is a pretty complex model. Um, I'm not going to go into the math here per se, but as you can tell here, this, this is pretty complicated. It is um, a, a phase space model. So it, it can be up to six dimensions plus time. Um, uh, so uh, you need to know the position and velocity of each particle um, or um, at each point, which is you know um, a lot of dimensions. It is also a self-coupling system. So here the distribution function F um, describes um, and defines rho and J. And rho and J basically um, define the electro electric and magnetic fields E and B, and these fields then impact F. So this makes the system pretty nonlinear, um, and that is like sort of a, a really part hard ma makes the whole system fairly hard to um, model as well. And because of that, it is pretty hard to solve this numerically, and we still don't have good models for it. Um, and you know s some other things make it harder, like the system needs to conserve um, charge and momentum and preserve positivity of the distribution function. And it's hard for the meshes um, generally to handle several characteristic speeds. So you have waves that are really fast and waves that are really slow, and they're interacting together at all times. Um, and that's pretty hard to, to figure out. 
Um, so we thought about just doing, what about physics informed neural networks? Can we use that um, instead of meshes to, to um, solve this? And we thought that this was a good idea because the initial approach is basically like, let's give it a shot, right? Let's try this like new, new, new way of modeling things and see how far we get. And I think it's important to highlight, and I wonder what Chris Rokakas would say about it. So I think this is sort of one of those good use cases for physics and forum neural networks. I think they are overused, but in a case where something is high dimensional and our numeric models are not very good and surrogate models are quite attractive, um, then using um, physics and forum neural networks could um, make sense. So as many of you might know, uh, NeuroPD is the package in SciML that takes care of, of solving, of, of, you know, is the solver package for neural networks in the SciML ecosystem. So I turned my attention to it um, to try to build on top of it um, and to build plasma models on top of it. Um, but there were a few problems at the time. So for one, um, the, the plasma equation is a heterogeneous integral differential equation with indefinite integrals. And at the time, NeuroPD did not support um, integral differential equations, nor did it support heterogeneous systems, nor, nor did it support indefinite integrals. And I still wanted to do this. So what I did is I actually just went into the code and started to like um, uh, contribute to it. Um, I mentioned this fairly um, j just because I think it's a good model to contribute to SciML this way, like trying to expand the scope of what it can do and thus like doing cool things with it. Um, and it was a lot of fun. So I, you know, encourage everyone to do the same, but that's enough talking. Um, how about we talk, go through a code example and, uh, we would just walk through it line, line by line, but I'll just basically describe it first that, um, pl plasma is basically, uh, an array of distribution functions and species. So you, you give it, um, you give a plasma, you describe a plasma by saying, Hey, I want this plasma to be electrostatic or collisionless. And then you, you define it by setting up the distribu initial distribution function and the initial species that species has a mass and a charge. And with that knowledge, we can create a full plasma model that we can then, um, pass to a solver to create a, a simulation. So the first line here, we just call plasma and all its contents. Um, the second and third line there, we just defined the temperature that's going to be used to define the Maxwellian um, uh, distribution of, uh, of the, the plasma that we're trying to model. And then in line four and five, we define species. These are predefined species that are already um, in plasma JL. So this is a deuterium ion and the other one is an electron. Um, then the lines underneath that, we then set, set a distribution object based on the Maxwellian initial distribution and the species D and the same analogously to E. What we're doing here, this Maxwellian distribution is already predefined in plasma.jl, but you can also create your own um, uh, distribution functions. We don't need to think about the geometry right now, but basically what we get at the end is that we get to define a plasma as an electrostatic plasma that takes these distributions and the geometry. And th this, this object can then be passed to the solver that can then take in any kind of, uh, you know, can do any kind of dimensional um, sol solve with any strategy available in your PDE, any number of layers and of newer networks. And that's all sort of like abstracted away. So you can, you can configure it if you want to, but we, we have like, reasonable and sane defaults to make it even easier to model plasmas. So let's see what this um, looks like, this example. This is a pretty boring example because it's uh, it's a plasma in equilibrium. You, you barely see any difference um, as, as the code sort of progresses. But um, the good news, and this is not dis displayed here, is that this preserves momentum and, 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 and energy which is like a good sign of a model that is working in the plasma world. So, um, yeah. 
moving along to another example, which is a little bit more um, complex, is the two-stream instability, which is a common benchmark in plasma physics between codes. Like we, we check how accurate they are, how fast they are, and so on. Um, and uh, we'll just walk through this once again, line by line. So once again, we call plasma, and then we define the species, um, electrons. And now we're gonna create our own um, initial distribution function called two stream here. And each distribution function in plasma JL um, returns a, a function that has, that needs to have two arguments, one X and one V for the position and the velocity of the particles. Those can be scalars or, or vectors. And basically, we create the initial condition of two stream instability. We pass that function, or we call that function here in the distribution, and we, we create an object here, um, DE, with the, the electron species, so the distribution of E. We call geometry. Let's ignore that, that for now. And then we, um, once again, call an electrostatic plasma, and then we solve it with a slightly different time span, slightly different time domain and space domain, um, which seems pretty clear. Let me know if you have questions there later. But um, this is a more interesting example, as you can see here. Let's see if we get this to run. OK, so here we start to see some more interesting behavior, but also some more problematic behavior. For one, um, there's an interesting thing here is that the neural network is capturing the behavior, but it's not capturing the initial condition very well. And you can see that slightly small here, but that the loss struggles to converge and it's basically dominated by the initial condition of the distribution function F. So that means that, um, and you can see that in the, uh, in the simulation as well, that this takes a while for it to st stabilize and form this, this like stream. Um, and these are th this is a problem that can be mitigated now that we have domain decomposition and adaptive loss, particularly adaptive loss in um, neuro PDE, thanks to Zoe McCarthy's um, pull request that was merged a couple of weeks ago. So this is definitely something that needs to be improved upon um, in the future. So let's talk about the features of the Plasma JL interface. I touched on this briefly, but basically the goal is to model any number, uh, any any plasma, so easily, right? So that means that we need to model any number of species, any number of dimensions with any training method, with any distribution and either electrostatic plasmas or collisionless plasmas, just like super easily. So we built the interface so that you can um, create a plasma object that takes uh, an array of distribution functions and each distribution function has uh, an initial distribution and a species. And uh, you can pass that to a solver, which returns a plasma solution, which is an object hold, holding like all elements that you need to like um, analyze the solution that you got. And you can sort of see us, you know, you can sort of play around with this a little bit in the sense that you can create your own species or use a pre-made one, create several types of initial distributions. As you can see here with the hot carrier example, which is a different um, plasma benchmark. Um, and then you can always uh, set a plasma to be collisionless or electrostatic, and then solve it in one to three dimensions, which is actually three to six dimensions plus time. Um, yeah. So just in conclusion, uh, I know I talked fast, sorry about that. Um, what was done is that we attempted to solve the Vlasov Maxwell and Vlasov Poisson um, systems with physics informed neural networks. We built support for indefinite integral differential equations and heterogeneous systems in neural PDE. We created a solver for plasmas based on neural PDE. And we open sourced Plasma JL as an interface to easily model these plasmas with physics informed neural networks. And the future goals, um, and basically our road to V1 is to add GPU support. These are pretty heavy models and I've been running them in Julia Hub and like the cheapest um, CPU, which is not ideal. And this needs to be fixed upstream, um, probably in the near PDE level. Um, we want to add decomposed do uh, domain decomposition for um, in to increase accuracy and to increase um, the conservation of mass and momentum and um, uh, energy. 
um, in some of these models that, that I ran, um, conservation um, started to wane as the model advanced um, with time. And with dom domain decomposition, we think this is going to be well mitigated. Um, we also want to use adaptive loss for some, some models that are harder to, um, th th you know, that struggle to converge, like the one I, I, I showed earlier. We want to create a makey recipe for better graphing. Right now, this is a problem with newer PDE as well, and we need to get a little bit better at graphing. I think this needs to be solved a little bit further upstream. And then we want to add support for our surrogate models in an interface, um, which is already possible in your PDE, and then also add batteries included um, validation. Um, so basically, I, I can ask, hey, Plasma JL, how well is my model? How good is my model? And it can just show me the conservation laws and how well they're being um, maintained in the, in, the, in the simulation. So I can basically know how much it should rely on um, the model that I'm looking at. Um, thank you. Um, you can reach out on Discord or via email or check out my GitHub. And I'm happy to answer questions now. Thanks, Gabriel. That's very nice. Um, I. Uh... I'm just picking up some questions from YouTube and Discord. Um, so the first question is, uh, what does your plot show for the two stream instability? How does this compare to a, a kinetic or pick model? Oh, yeah. So basically, that one is, I'm basically, I, I get the question because I zoomed in into one stream over there. So basically, you, you could zoom out, and then there are two streams down there. I just wanted to show the weird behavior that you saw on, on, the, on that one stream on top. But basically, it's the same. It, it's it plots f versus v um, uh, in zero to four domain, um, and that's like different from a particle and cell model because you're not actually moving a particle. You're just seeing the solution to the Vlasov equation in that time um, and space domain. All right. Um, next question: uh, How does your model handle kinetic effects like Landau Dapnik? Um, well, the Vlasov equation generally um, neglects some some um, Landau damping, um, if I recall correctly. Definitely some scattering is neglected there. Um, basically, it's it models every it's supposed to model everything the Vlasov equation models, and it's supposed to neglect everything that Vlasov equation neglects, right? So it's basically just plugging in the Vlasov equation and to a physics informed neural network and seeing what it does. All right. Um, next, uh, is the number of particles in each species defined by the distributions you mentioned? Is that a limit? Um, and as a follow up, is that also is that also a way to add boundary conditions or ex uh, or external fields? Um, can you repeat the first question? Uh, the first question is the uh, is the number of particles in each species. I I, I assume that this question is specific to a slide. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is it defined um, by any? distributions that you mentioned uh or is that a limit yeah so so this is a little different so this is a particle and cell uh, method that has like a number of particles and and what we're doing here is is really just solving mathematics like approximating the Vlasov equation with a neural network so it's a bit it's, it's something a bit different all right um i okay so last question um Last question. So how how can you do hybrid models with plasma.gl? That would be that would be the ideal thing, I think. So um using that to develop surrogate models would be would be great. So because we you have this thing in plasma physics called um gyrokinetic uh models, which are pretty accurate but super expensive. Um and doing that with like a hybrid model with that and plasma JL. Will probably be probably be the way to go um, uh, long term for like high accuracy. It is not something that's been implemented yet. Um, so, yeah. All right. Um, I think we can do one last one. Like, did you did you happen to comment on boundary conditions? Um, you know, or oh yeah, you can, uh, you can implement your own boundary conditions as well. Okay. So that, that, that will just go into the pin. You know. Yeah. The, so you can also pick them like. Um, to be Dirichlet or um, Neumann as well, or you know, for for the distribution function, they can be reflective or not, um, or periodic. Um, that's all implemented in the interface. 
All right. Uh, you you have more questions, I think, in you on YouTube as well as um, as well as Discord. So do uh, do check both those out. Um, okay. And uh, thanks again, Gabriel. I'm just going to move on to the the next speaker real quick. Thank you. Um, next we have Avik, uh, who's um, I Avik. Your your screen is. Your screen is a bit, I you know, ah, this, now now it's now it's better. <laughs> I was confused as to what was happening there. Um, all right, I, I will quickly introduce Avik Pal uh, from the Julia Lab at MIT, who's going to talk about mixing implicit and explicit deep learning with skip DEQs and infinite time neurologies. Yeah. So hey everyone, I'm Avik, and I'm going to be talking about uh, mixing implicit and explicit deep learning with skip decks. So this is a work done at Julie Lab in collaboration with Alan Littleman and Chris. Uh, so we'll directly get into uh, what deep equilibrium networks are. So they're essentially a class of implicit neural networks, which are used to model infinitely deep neural networks. So what that means, essentially, we have an explicit neural network, let's say f of theta. And we just want to apply the same function over the input x an infinite number of times. So it's essentially an infinite composition. Uh, but that raises two questions. How would we actually backpropagate through an infinite composition? And how do we reasonably store those intermediate solutions because there are potentially an infinite number of them? Uh, so what happens when you actually iteratively evaluate the same function over, over, over and over again? So there can, there can be many possibilities, but let's say three of the most common ones the first one would be if the solution just diverges. One case could be the solution keeps on oscillating between multiple values. And the third one could be that it reaches a steady state or an equilibrium. Uh, this, uh, this third case is what we are mostly concerned about because that would mean that if we evaluate a function uh, for n times uh, and we reach a constant value, we do not really need to evaluate the function till infinity. We have already reached a steady state solution and it doesn't really matter how many times we evaluate it next. So this is where the deep equilibrium model comes in. So instead of just uh, defining a new, new explicit model, we are just saying that the output of this uh, equilibrium model must be the steady solution of the steady state equation, f of the, uh, with an initial condition zero and parameters theta. Uh, now, do, because of implicit function theorem, what we can do is if we differentiate the function, it turns out that we, in the backward pass, we just have to solve a linear equation. So we do not really need to solve, like store any of the intermediate values. This is good because uh, if you see the equation, it just means that we need one VJP, which uh, we, which we get from the reverse mode out of def. So packages like zygote or reverse def would give us that. And we can solve the linear equation using any neutron Krylov method, which is really fast. And again, like we do not really need to store any of the intermediate com computations. Uh, now that we know what deep equilibrium models are, uh, like why are we actually interested in studying these models? First thing is that the back propagation doesn't really rely on intermediate gradients. Uh, so which means that these models are really memory efficient. Like you can have a thousand iterations or a hundred iterations, the memory cost for the backward pass is constant. Second, you can have you are able to model dynamical systems more accurately. So you can impose stronger inductive biases into those models. And in a lot of cases, that would actually accelerate. Uh, your learning because you have stronger priors. The last and uh, the case that we are mostly interested in is that these models can automatically adapt their depth to the input. So for explicit models, you have a fixed model and given any input of any complexity, you have, the, you have to do the same computation. But let's say you have two cases where one is a simpler input and one is a more complex input. You want to have more depth for the more complex input and have shallower depth for the easier one. So a deep equilibrium network or even neural ODEs would automatically adapt its depth based on what the input is. 
However, like uh, as we saw for the equilibrium network, network in the forward pass, you have to stop solve a steady state equation, which is not very cheap. So how do we accelerate that? And that is the question that motivates us to develop this new framework called skip text. So the, like we have a very simple intuition. The initial condition that we give to the solver is not very good. It's just zero, which doesn't really make sense. Can we make, have a better guess? So what we do is we have a small explicit model, let's call it GFI, and we tell the network to guess a good initial uh, condition for our steady state solver. So if the model is able to predict the initial condition that's really close to this actual steady state, we'll have to perform less iterations. So the idea is that over time, like as we are training the model and we are doing it end to end, so we are jointly learning theta and phi, the model would learn to predict the steady state solution or at least get so close to it that we have to perform very uh, few iterations. So we can think of it like a predictor corrector approach. So the neural network G of phi is the predictor and then the steady state solver is just performing a, a set of corrections. Uh, but now we have introduced a couple, like a few problems. Like, do we now we have to we have more hyperparameters in the form of G of phi, which is not ideal. In our experiments, we just found that if we set G of phi to be f of same same as f of theta, uh, it just works for all the problems. And as far as how do we train it, we have the we just minimize the L to norm between the initial between the guest initial condition and the final solution from the steady state solver and that and that's the essentially auxiliary loss term and we can end to end back propagate through this uh, we also explore another idea so as you can saw that introducing gfi added some extra parameters and like since our entire pitch is around like we have low uh, low memory requirements it's uh, not ideal to have extra parameters so can we actually get rid of that it turns out if we, instead of using G of uh, phi, if we minimize, so if we perform one iteration of F of theta, and we say that the first iteration needs to be as close to the steady state sub solution. So what this does would be, this would incentivize the model to learn a simpler dynamics. And turns out in most cases, even this outperforms the skip text. And we just call it skip text version two. Uh, now I'll just uh, introduce the package that we have been working on for this. So we call it FastTech and it's uh, publicly available on GitHub. So what do you do uh, to define a deep equilibrium network? You just pass an initial model and you just say what solver you're going to use. For now, uh, let's call this discrete deck solvers. I'll discuss what they are in the latest slide. To define a skip deck, you would just have to pass an additional function, which is essentially modeling G of phi. Similarly, for the regularized DEX or skip deck v2, you just uh, don't pass G of phi. So like with a simple API, you can actually perform all these kinds of different uh, deep equilibrium networks, and uh, it already implements all the linear solving in the back end and everything. Now, coming to infinite time near load ease, or as you call it, continuous DEX, so the models that we saw in the previous slides uh, were modeling discrete dynamical system, but discrete, like discrete dynamical system come with its own set of problems. So consider a linear dynamical system uh, with u naught equals to one. We know that it will converge to a steady state of zero if, if the norm of alpha is less than one. But if you see that if you set alpha to zero point nine, you will see that every step is like it's just slowly slowly going to con convergence so in most real world applications we uh evaluating the function would be very expensive so we do not want to make a lot of evaluations similarly if alpha is minus 0 0.9 it just this value just ping pongs over the steady state so like we consider these shortcomings of dynamical like discrete dynamical systems and what we could do is rewrite the deck as a continuous dynamical system. So instead of uh, finding a steady state for f of theta z minus z, uh, we are taking that quantity and saying that this is the rate of change of z. 
Uh, for people who are familiar with neural ODEs, the right hand side, like if the right, entire right hand side would be modeled by, let's say, G of theta, that would exactly resemble a neural ODE. Uh, and now we are solving this uh, uh, infinite time neural ODE with the initial condition C naught, C naught, and we are solving it till time t equals to infinity. For a neural ODE, we would uh, stop at a lesser time, let's say at t equals to one or two or something like that. Also note that this formulation just works out of the box with skip text because we would just have to change the initial condition and we have made no assumption on what the initial condition is for modeling it as a continuous dynamical system. Again, like we uh, provide out of the box support for continuous text and fast tech. So this was the example from the previous slide. Uh, so we have a discrete text solver. So instead of just passing a discrete text solver, you could just pass a continuous text solver and pass your favorite ODE solver. So here we are using TZ5. Uh, and in most of the other ODE solvers would just work out of the box. You could even use a fixed time step solver uh, and it should just work. Now uh, coming to a few results. Uh, so what we see is that our models do indeed converge much faster to the steady state. So here is a toy problem. We are just fitting uh, multiple points to a polynomial. Uh, if you look at the leftmost, you would see that the uh, solution actually wiggles a lot before it actually converges to the red line, which is the ground truth. Uh, skip tech also like doesn't wiggle that much, but also takes some time to reach the solution. Whereas skip type V2 or regularized text uh, reach the steady state really fast and they do not actually wiggle. Uh, coming to more realistic cases, we uh, if we run it on MNIST, turns out we have like 2x faster training and 6x faster predictions. Uh, so our model is actually able to uh, circumvent a lot of problems with implicit models, which involve like uh, dramatically slower training and very slow predictions. So uh, we get closer to explicit, explicit models. We are not uh, completely there yet, but this is definitely a progress in the, same, in the correct direction. Now coming to continuous models, uh, for Cypher 10, we saw that if we use uh, just the vanilla deck uh, uh, with like even continuous and discrete, like none of them actually converge to a steady state. This doesn't affect training per se, however, uh the yeah uh, however if we go for continuous uh, skip decks we do see that the models are actually able to converge with a reasonable tab so for these models we had like a threshold of a maximum of 25 layers deep for convergence and within that only the continuous regularized models could uh, converge finally this is uh, some of the plot so as you can see uh we like most of the models have re like the similar accuracy, even though the continuous skip models are converge faster uh, to the steady state, which also means that during prediction and training, they are uh, trained faster. And uh, thank you, that's all. All right, uh, thanks, Avik. Um, I have one question from Discord. So um, what are some good applications? Oops, did I? Yeah, there you are. Um, your uh, screen is not on the stream, though. Ah, there it is. Um, so what are some good applications of DEQs in general? Uh, what types of problems would be good candidates for, for DEQs? Uh, so right now, I, I would say uh, we can use any of these implicit models for uh, in place of let's say any standard explicit model say image classification segmentation like uh, a lot of papers have shown that we uh, these models are competitive with uh, standard like resnets and everything for Im like imagenet and coco and all those data sets uh, some other applications would be if you're trying to uh, fit a system and you know that it, like and you know certain parameters of it so any dynamical system you could uh, try fitting those in as well. So basically anything is, so right now we are just constrained uh, with the uh, training time and like a lot of papers are currently working on the same direction. 
Uh, also, uh, if you consider ro robust models, so there have been certain papers showing that these models might be slightly more robust to adversarial examples than explicit models. All right. I, um, I'm just uh, looking for more questions from the Slack and, and YouTube. But in the meantime, I, I had a question. Um, I mean, you were talking about dynamical systems, and then you and then you showed us this MNIST example, mm -hmm. and and in my mind, I couldn't quite compute the connection between image classification and dynamical systems. So, uh, mm -hmm. could you comment a bit on that? Sure. Yeah. So I, I would think of uh, like DEQs as like a general framework for like just doing a mapping, right? So you have a, a like n-dimensional real plane to an n-dimensional real plane. You're just performing a mapping. Uh, so yes, that the uh, we are so this mapping is being performed by a dynamical system, but the input can really be anything. And so and because we were targeting like a more machine learning, uh, like traditional deep learning space, it made sense that we have like an image classification problem where the input is like an n-dimensional input would be the image. And we are just transforming that image into some latent uh, space, and then just applying some form of like classification head over that. I see does that, that. Clarify. Yeah, that that does. Thank you. Um, let me let me check the uh, let me check the other platforms. Um, have you uh, have you tried have you tried it on dynamical systems then, and uh, you know have uh, what sort of uh, benchmarks and results do you see? Uh, we haven't tried directly these models on dynamical systems. However, like we are uh, using, like we are, we have been developing models inspired by uh, this idea of like better initial guesses for stiff uh, systems, and uh, I can say that we are getting at least like around seven to eight x performance gains there. Like, even if we include training times and everything. I see. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's, I, I know we, we have like three to four more minutes. I think we, uh, we don't have any further questions in the chat. So what I will do is I will take this time to thank you and uh, transition to the next set of speakers and, um, and get that all set up for them. All right. Thanks again, Avik. Right. Hey, Theo and Zach, welcome. Hello. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, Zach, could you could you test your audio again? I'm not sure I heard you well. Hi. Could you hear me? Yeah. Now, now I can hear you. Okay. okay. So, um, do you, so do you guys want to both share your screens, and I can put whoever's screen on. Uh, sure. Great. Yeah, Zach's going to be sharing first. Okay. All right. Full screen. Try full screen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, we have another three minutes. So, um, you know, you can start then. Theo, when will will you be speaking over Zach's slides or do you, do you have a separate screen to share that I should switch to? Um, I will be speaking first for the first two and then um, I will uh, have a separate screen share at the uh, second half of the talk. Okay. Would you would you mind testing that screen share as well? Because we have the time. Yes. Let me do it. Oh, it looks like I have to quit Google Chrome and reopen it real quick. So, could we start early then? He's back. Okay. Does this work? Yeah. Um, yes, Zach, you could continue sharing your screen. I okay. and uh, yeah. So uh, what what would happen is you know whenever. Um, Whenever we just need, you know, I, I can just switch to Theo's screen. Uh, okay, okay, cool. Thanks. Okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah, you could just keep. So you're your first screen. Yeah. I'm just gonna I'm gonna put your slides on, 
And since we are one minute, I'm just going to start introducing uh, both of you, and um, and then you can take it away. All right. Um, all right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, and um, welcome back. We are with uh, Theo Diamandis and uh, Zach Frangella, um, who will be talking to us about uh, speeding up. A backslash B with a randomized preconditionals .gl. Um, uh, whenever you guys are ready, you guys can uh, can take it off. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. And thanks so much for organizing uh, organizing the first SciMLCon. So hi everyone. My name's Theo. I'm a PhD student at MIT in the Julia Lab. I'm working with Zach, who's a PhD student at Cornell, and we're going to talk to you all about how to speed up linear system solves with randomized preconditioners .jl. So next slide. So essentially, we're going to show you this, uh, you know, one easy trick that your professors are not going to tell you about to get a very uh, easy five to 10 X speed up on iterative solves of linear systems. Um, and we're going to do this by constructing a very particular preconditioner, which is actually going to go through how to uh, do this next. Hi, everyone. I'm going to give you an overview of our preconditioning technique, uh, randomized Nistrum preconditioning which was a joint work with Joel Tropp at Caltech and my advisor, Madeline Udell. So our setting for today is uh, we want to solve uh, large symmetric positive definite linear systems, possibly with uh, regularization. And uh, by large, we mean a direct solve is not computationally feasible. Uh, the ideas can be extended to other systems, such as symmetric systems, but we're mainly going to focus on the SPD case today. So the standard uh, large scale uh, solver for symmetric positive definite matrices is the conjugate gradient method. Uh, it's very scalable because it only requires matrix vector products. And uh, we know CG converges quickly when the condition number of A is small or equivalently the eigenvalues are clustered. Unfortunately, a lot of times in practice, this isn't the case. So that could make CG quite slow. But to give a nice visualization here, uh, on the left, we have a figure that shows spectrum that are easy for CG, like the ideal case here, first figure on the left, the spectrum's completely flat and the uh, condition number is one. Whereas on the right here, we have spectrum that are quite hard for CG, like this first one, uh, both these figures on the right, the, spec the condition number is quite large. Um, especially in particular, this one on the right, you see the spectrum a lot in machine learning applications. So uh, if you notice, if you could just kind of flatten the top spectrum here, you could get a very uh, well-conditioned system and CG would be fast. And the, the preconditioner we're gonna talk about today does this. So what is a preconditioner? So preconditioner is something that, you know, has basically has to satisfy two properties. Uh, you can easily apply its inverse and, you know, it makes results in a nice spectrum where the uh, preconditioned matrix well-conditioned. If you get that, you know, CG will be very uh, fast to converge. So like what our approach is, is that uh, we're basically find like the best possible preconditioner uh, for a certain class, but instead of doing it, uh, forming it exactly, which would be quite slow, we approximate it in a fast and efficient manner. So the ideal preconditioner uh, for our type of problem would be uh, if you wanted to just flatten the top spectrum, the ideal thing would be to find where, you know, uh, the rank K, but you need to go to the flatten the spectrum sufficiently, and you would form this preconditioner here, P. Um, so P uh, is a very easy to invert uh, and cheap to apply. So to invert it, you would just flip this uh, ratio here, and uh, you would just replace lambda K plus mu I by lambda K plus mu I inverse. And what this does is this flattens the spectrum associated with the dominant uh, K eigenspace of the matrix. So it flattens all those guys to lambda k plus one plus mu. So as a result, uh, the preconditioned system, the condition number reduces from lambda one plus mu to over lambda n plus mu to lambda k plus one plus mu over lambda n plus mu. So this is a very uh, significant reduction when the spectrum decays. So that's uh, very helpful. Unfortunately, that's not very practical because computing a partial exact eigen decomposition is expensive. So instead, we do it approximately using what's known as a Nystrom sketch. So it's kind of the, by definition, it's given by this expression here, which is a little bit unintuitive at this point, but uh, we'll give an explanation for where it comes from. Uh, so we do not compute this, though, using this like naive expression here, because with the pseudo inverse, because that'd be numerically unstable. 
Our procedure instead uh, returns the Nystrom approximation as an approximate eigen decomposition, V hat, lambda hat, V hat transposed. Um, and here, omega is just a random test matrix. Uh, the common choice to use is a standard normal Gaussian matrix. And where does this come from? So it turns out uh, the Nystrom approximation, although it has a kind of funny expression, solves this very intuitive approximation problem, uh, optimization problem. All we're doing is we're just finding the best approximation to A and the column space uh, of A omega. So that's where this comes from. And so just to give you a little bit of a theory for why this works. So the Nystrom approximation uh, does very well, gives you a very good uh, rank R approximation whenever the uh, spectrum decays quite quickly. This is an older bound from like Trop et al. 2017. If you want to see a more refined bound for the approximation error, you could check out uh, Frangella, Trop Udell, 2021. And, you know, in the case of regularized systems, uh, we've showed that, you know, under the right conditions for constructing the preconditioner, the condition number is uh, less than 28 in expectation. So you get a very well-conditioned linear system. So that's kind of the theory behind it and the idea. Now I'm going to turn it over to Theo for the uh, details on the implementation. Can we go ahead and switch the screen share? All right, great. Um, so the uh, implementation of this is going to be in randomized preconditioners.jl. Um, and you can construct the Nystrom sketch with only two lines of code. Um, so one line of code to construct the sketch and then another line of code um, to build the preconditioner. And sometimes uh, you may want to get uh, P inverse as well. And so this can be done super easily with um, a Nystrom preconditioner inverse. So these preconditioners in particular have very efficient methods um, for solvers. Uh, so we use multiple dispatch to implement efficient left divides and multiplies. Um, and so this is done because we store a factored sketch of the preconditioner. Um, and then you can essentially just use one keyword argument to pass these to your favorite iterative solvers. Uh, so for example, krylov.jl is going to use P inverse and iterative solvers.jl is going to use P. Um, so all you have to do is set the preconditioner keyword argument in each of these. So we talked primarily about the Nystrom sketch here. Um, however, uh, if you're moving beyond positive semi-definite matrices, we include a few other sketches in randomized preconditioners.jl. In particular, um, for symmetric matrices, there's the Eigen sketch. Um, and you can do most of the same things with the Eigen sketch as you can with the Nystrom sketch. However, if you're uh, looking at general matrices, um, we also have the randomized SVD. And so one additional keyword argument here is this Q, um, which is essentially a powering parameter, um, which uh, does a type of Krylov method to uh, have a more accurate sketch. So these sketches also come with um, several utilities, uh, one of which is fast multiplication, essentially leveraging the fact that they're stored as their factored forms. Um, and then uh, some tools for adaptive sketch size selection. So one parameter that you saw show up through this presentation um, was this R parameter, which is the size of the sketch. Um, and a lot of times you don't know this a priori, uh, you would only actually know it exactly if you could compute the full eigen decomposition. And the whole point of these methods is that you don't do that, um, but you can use these adaptive techniques where you say double the sketch size parameter until your estimate of um, the norm of the sketch um, minus the original matrix is small. And so a few examples of this, uh, here's one of ridge regression um, with, a, uh, with about 4,000 features, and this is a data set from OpenML. The eigenvalues of the matrix that's constructed are on the left. Um, you can see that essentially the rank of the matrix is approximately 2,000. And then you can also see mu, which is gonna be the parameter of ridge regression, uh, which we choose as one E negative four. On the right is the convergence of conjugate gradient uh, with several sketch size selections. Um, so several sketch size selections are. And one thing in particular that I wanna point out is essentially whatever parameter you choose, you always get a speed up here. And these uh, sketches are really fast to construct. So it almost never hurts you to do something like this. Um, however, you can see that even if we choose a relatively modest sketch size, so for instance, R equals 100, we get about a 3x speed up, despite the fact that the tree rank here is about 2000, so it's much uh, greater than 100. And then actually, as you go to a sketch that approximates the rank, 
So once we get to R equals 2000, uh, we get convergence um, to, uh, we get convergence here in um, nine iterations. So it can get really, really fast as you actually approach the rank. And then back to the example that I showed at the beginning of this presentation, um, here's ridge regression with 15,000 features. Um, and this is solved with the Nystrom preconditioner in under five seconds on a laptop. The um, preconditioner itself takes about two seconds to construct. So you're getting a total system solve of about six seconds with the Nystrom preconditioner versus about 25 seconds with no preconditioner. In addition, um, this is a case where the diagonal preconditioner works quite well. However, a lot of times the diagonal preconditioner doesn't work particularly well. Um, however, the Nystrom preconditioner can usually uh, almost always get you some type of speed up. So again, it almost never hurts. So uh, to go from here, um, I encourage you to check out randomizedpreconditioners.jl, which has uh, these methods, um, and that's on GitHub right now. It's being added to the Julia registry in a few days. Uh, also, this does work with linearsolve.jl, which is the SciML linear solve interface. So again, just with two lines of code, you can construct your preconditioner and then um, just put it in whatever uh, solver you call from linearsolve.jl. In addition, uh, check out Zach's paper on Nystrom um, preconditioned conjugate gradient method. And then for more kind of in the randomized numerical linear algebra um, world, you can check out this Martinson TROP survey, uh, which is recent and quite good. So to conclude and just highlight a few future directions that we're thinking about, um, with this package in particular, one of the things that we would like to do is add additional test matrices. So right now we're using that standard Gaussian normal test matrix that Zach mentioned. And uh, this is great for dense systems. However, for sparse systems, it a lot of times destroys the sparsity pattern. However, there are some other um, test matrices that are more specifically tailored for sparse systems. And so we hope to add those to the package pretty soon. Um, on the more research side of things, general preconditioners for non-symmetric systems is pretty much an open research question. So if this is something that's interested to uh, interesting to you or would be useful to you or you'd like to collaborate on this, please reach out to us. And then, of course, uh, we would like to um, improve performance and robustness a bit of this package and then also uh, work on applications. So both Zach and I come from the optimization community and um, being able to solve linear systems fast is kind of a core primitive that are, it's in a lot of optimization algorithms. And so uh, finally, here are the references uh, that were cited in this talk. And then um, thanks for your time. If you want to contact us, here are both of our emails. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Zach and Theo. This is actually pretty exciting work. Um, so there's, there's one big question in the chat is, uh, you know, uh, does this work with sparse matrices? You, you said there's limited support and that you need better support. So uh, what's missing? Yeah, I guess so it, it works. Um, it's just right now kind of when you take that sketch of the sparse, sparse matrix, um, you're taking the sketch with something that's totally dense. So it kind of destroys the sparsity pattern. Um, that might, depending on the application and depending on your sketch size, that might be totally fine and it might not matter. Um, however, sometimes, of course, like you would want to retain as much of that sparse structure as possible. Um, and so for that, like I said, we're trying to add some other test matrices that allow you to kind of pick from a, a library of test matrices, um, whatever the best one for your application might be. And so that's trading off things like accuracy uh, versus sparsity, preservation, and so on, computational time, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, we there's, uh, there's another question from YouTube. Does it, um... Can it take a, a random number generator state, you know, just setting a random number generator state to make this entire thing reproducible? Oh, uh, yeah, that, there's no reason uh, why it couldn't. OK. Um, so um, even even with the um, so even with your sketching, right, you don't you maybe you don't even need to preserve sparsity in a sense, right? You just need um, you just need a, a sparse matrix that's that's sort of easy to invert according to your according to your sketching standard, right? And it just needs to perhaps have the same sparsity level, um, or or even if it doesn't, it 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 yeah maybe maybe just the space same sparsity level given given the the memory requirements of the problem at hand, uh, generally speaking. So um, so so yeah. Do you have any comments on uh, comments on that? You don't need to. I guess you don't need to. Uh, the fact that you don't need to preserve sparsity. 
or, or, or I don't know, maybe, maybe that's what you meant by preserve sparsity. Zach, do you want to take that one? Or do you uh, want to? Sure, sure. I didn't know. Like, uh, so I guess uh, our current precondition, the one we've talked about, right? Um, because you're taking the eigen decomposition, ultimately you're going to get something that uh, an, a, a partial eigen decomposition, you know, we output it as U and like lambda hat. So that U matrix is dense. So it's N by R. So, you know, if that's not ideal, you might want to do something different, but there's ways of modifying the construction where like, you know, you could keep the thing to be uh, sparse, but we didn't really focus on that. Uh, some of the matrices we were looking at uh, when we were initially working on this project was uh, were dense uh, matrices for machine learning, like kernel matrices or data matrices at the rise in ridge regression. So that was our focus, but there's some different things you could do probably to better optimize for sparsity. Okay, that's the that that's cool. Um... Uh, could you uh, could you recap which uh, preconditioners you benchmarked this against? Uh, um, I, I saw a little chart there. Um, uh, so, like, uh, if you look at the uh, the if you look at the paper, we compare it to other randomized preconditioners. So, like, there's a for least squares problem. A common one is uh, Rockland and Tigert. Uh, we also compare it to a, another method of a, uh, known as an adaptive iterative Hessian sketch. And uh, for uh, kernel matrices, we compared to a uh, random features preconditioning. Um, but for uh, this presentation, we just compared to uh, we just stuck to diagonal preconditioning here. That's what the that's the Jacobi in the second plot that Theo shared. All right, sounds good. Um, otherwise, uh, well, thank you both for your time. I don't see any further. Well, actually, there is there could be one incoming question uh, on the on the Discord. Um, so I'll just wait for a second for that, um, you know, because you have four minutes. Um, let's see. Don't see any other questions on YouTube. So let's, let's look at Discord. All right, this is taking a while. Um, It's, it's it, the, the the person who has the question uh, said that they were going to take a while to type the question, so um, so yeah, I guess they're they're in a race for time here, but um, but now this 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 is great work. I I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I can't wait uh, to try it out with my with my stuff. You know, sparsity I think would be a big thing for for a lot of people. Um, you know, just just mostly because you know PDEs and all of that. You know. Yes, mm. it's sparse. Yeah, you want to preserve yeah. that structure for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. And we're currently working on applying this in some optimization context, which also a lot of times have, have sparse structure as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. Um, okay, so I'm, okay, so the question hasn't come in yet. So what I will do is uh, I will request both of you to, to get on the Discord and sort of help answer questions there. Um, because it's fascinating work. So, um, so, and I'm sure people are pretty enthusiastic uh, to ask more questions. Um, so I'd request you to check out the Discord. All right, otherwise, I want to thank, thank you both, and I will welcome the next speaker. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, we have two more minutes. Um, we have two more minutes. So, um, you know, uh, one minute. Uh, you know, at four fifty nine, I will introduce you, and um, and we can, um, and then you go, you can start at four, at at five, uh, sharp. Okay, if that sounds good to you. It sounds good. Yeah, could you could you uh, say something else, please, uh, just to ch test your audio? I thought it was faint for a sec. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. This this is better. All right. It it was faint faint at the at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, but the, this is, I believe, the uh, final talk for the day. Um, actually, you know what? I may as well uh, announce this. You know, this is the final talk of the day. After which, we will send out a Zoom link to the Discord, where uh, you know we can join for like for you know an open format discussion. Um, but but uh, we will end the live stream after this talk. Um, you know, after you know, I guess thanking all the speakers, etc. But um, 
but um, but yeah, we should you should uh, be on the Discord to look out for that Zoom link. Otherwise, um, I will introduce our next and fi our final speaker of the day, um, Kyung Hyun Lee. Um, he's here to talk talk to us about bifurcation based machine learning of dynamical systems. Uh, take it away whenever you're ready, Kyung. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Gyeong, and I'm a PhD student at University of Bristol. And my supervisors are David Barton and Ludovic Ranson. And today I will um, talk about uh, bifurcation based machine learning of dynamical system, uh, which is um, um, example of applying CIMO packages uh, for system with bifurcations in nonlinear dynamical systems. Um, I will introduce some examples um, from experimental bifurcation analysis uh, to using experimental bifurcation analysis to build the dynamical system models. I'll first show you some example of parameter dependent systems that undergoes bifurcations. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I have problem with, I think I have problem with um, videos in this slide. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, I see if you, you pro, did you upload a PDF or a Google slide up here? Uh, I uploaded my slide here. I see. Hmm. Oh yeah, it's um, actually it was shown in um, my colleague's uh, slide, Sandor's slide. You it was, can send uh, links to uh, links to it, and I can and I can just uh, and I can just send it to the Discord if if that's that's easy. Uh, but 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 you should continue with your talk. Oh yeah, I'll just continue with it. Um, it's um, um, self-excited system example of self-excited systems. Um, like um in airplanes at certain speeds, um, there could be some limit cycle oscillations on airplane wings and it can end up uh, of disasters. So usually researchers doesn't want those kind of problems. And these are the first example that I wanted to show was this, uh, the it's called air elastic flutter and the wing flaps at certain wind speeds. And the, another example that I wanted to show on this uh, second slide, uh, second video was a wheel shimmy, which, um, which at certain speed of the uh, vehicle with wheels, it can lose like its controllability or manu manu maneuvering ability so it's called as limit cycle oscillations and self-excited systems and this type of dynamic system without an external excitation is often called a self-excited system and it is quite challenging to make a model that can predict this phenomena accurately and i'll show you some example that if we use cyml packages uh, packages then we can model these systems quite um, interestingly And self-excited systems are typically modeled with ODEs with Hopf bifurcation. And we can understand Hopf bifurcation geometrically from this figure here. And at certain parameter value of mu, uh, we call this a control parameter. And there can be change of stability, changing of an equilibrium and the branch of um, limit cycle oscillation is generated at this equilibrium and uh, self-excited vibrations that we uh, observe that are shown in the pre uh, previous slides uh, are some stable limit cycles somewhere over um, in the upper branch over here and there are some interesting characteristics of systems with bifurcations that we can use in modeling, which is like um, existence of an invert manifold, which I will explain from the next slide. 
And invariant manifolds are sub-manifold of state space that are preserved under the flow. And this is a very nice figure explaining the invariant manifold of the flows start and flows starting in this manifold stays in this manifold. And dynamics on this manifold is called reduced dynamics. And many reduced order modeling starts with finding this manifold from the full scale ODEs. And system with hop bifurcation has a center manifold. And for example, damped mechanical systems has um, some invariant manifold as well. And in this, in this case, and we can use the uh, existence of the invariant manifold and the dimension of the invariant manifold as the domain knowledge of the modeling. And this is a general framework of training parameter dependent ODE models using machine learning. And first, we model the parameter dependent vector field using scientific um, models or universal approximators like neural networks, or we can use hybrid models. And we need to also model the observations. Uh, for example, we can model this as a just simple projection map or also universal approximators. And after we make a model structure, then we have to transform the parameter identifi identification problem to an optimization problem using data fitting criteria such as mean square error. And I'll explain from the next slide how we infuse the domain knowledge of the invariant manifold and the bifurcation to our machine learning problems. Yes. So um, basically, um, I do experiment uh, for system with, with bifurcations, uh, which is called experimental bifurcation analysis. This is the um, bifurcation diagram measured from a, a flutter rig experiment, uh, which is a typical subcritical half bifurcation measurement. Um, these red circles are the um, measured unstable periodic solutions, um, which are stabilized using feedback controllers. And these blue uh, blue circles are the um, measured stable limit cycle oscillations. So if we draw this uh, a bif bifurcation diagram, then we can um, plot this like uh, this typical subcritical half bifurcation diagram. And and this, we know the bifurcation structure of this um, this uh, measured system, on, which is a dyna reduced dynamic on the invariant manifold. And the in interesting thing of nonlinear dynamical systems are we can use coordinate transformations to transform this this. Uh, dynamic system to a topologically equivalent dynamic systems, and we can we we usually use uh, these coordinate transformations to um, derive some simple type of uh, type of uh, ordinary differential equations, which is called norma forms, and these are the simplest uh, polynomial usually a polynomial type of uh, equations that. Um, reproduces this dynamics in a uh, simplest form. And, and we can use this, uh, those kind of um, differential equations as uh, our basis model. And I'll show you how we can train this uh, system using the normal form. So uh, I'm sorry about the... Um, this equations errors. Um, I don't know what happened, but um, anyway, I'll just go on. The equation I have used to reproduce the dynamics uh, shown in the last slide is using the sub subcritical Hopf norma form, but I added uh, quintic 
terms to reproduce the satellite bifurcations to uh, to make a stable limit cycle oscillations on the in the uh, on the upper branch. So this is the basis model I used to make a topologically equivalent um, dynamic system. And the advantage of using normal form-like equations is that the shape of the trajectory of the LCOs of this system on the normal form coordinates are LCOs, just very simple LCOs with a circle trajectory. And um, if we transform this to a polar coordinates, and it's it shows that the uh, amplitude of the normal forms are just uh, simple fixed points, and the, we can decouple the speed of the oscillations uh, with the amplitude equations. And using this basis model, we can design the bifurcation diagram very easily uh, using um, the, the, these are model parameters um, A2 to design the um, design the bifurcation diagram and this mu, this mu zero is the Hopf bifurcation point and this large omega uh, is to uh, model the speed of the oscillation um, and I use neural network in my um, in my modeling case and <clears throat> this is the summary of training uh, the the um, obser observable, um, which is uh, basically a coordinate transformation between the um, invariant manifold, which is a center manifold in this case, uh, between the invariant manifold and the measured uh, measured trajectory. So basically, uh, this observable, which is a neural network, uh, it's uh, it's a combination of linear transformation and the neural network uh, transforms the uh, circle, uh, which is the trajectory of the normal form. And this two are uh, measured um, some complicated closed form shapes. And so in order to match this uh, Transformed um, trajectory to the uh, to the measured trajectory. I use uh, the metric uh, between the two distinct curves, uh, which I use these um, Fourier coefficients of the closed curve because a closed curve is a two pi periodic uh, function on the polar coordinates. So um, I measure the distance between these two curves, which I have uh, used as a loss function in the optimization pr process. And to summarize the uh, procedure of training the model, uh, I first create the topologically equivalent dynamic system on the normal form coordinates, uh, which is um, just um, arbitrary coordinates. Uh, then train the this arbitrary coordinates between arbitrary coordinates and the measured coordinates, which is um, observable. Then um, train the um, another part of the normal form, which is responsible for the speed of the oscillation, which is um, this omega function here. And this is um, the experiment I, I did in the wind tunnel. This is the uh, flutter rig, and um, this this system oscillates at certain wind speeds. And I measured this uh, flutter phenomena with this kind of rig and stabilized the. Um, unstable periodic solutions using this shaker with a feedback control. So <clears throat> this is the measured uh, bifurcation diagram. Uh, these are the measured uh, bifurcation uh, lim limit cycle oscillations, um, stable limit cycles in the upper branch and the unstable limit cycles in the in this lower branch and 
uh, we can see that the um, bifurcation diagram is quite accurately predicted and also um, we can predict the um, phase trajectory of the uh, limit cycle oscillations. And so I also train the speed of the oscillations um, using the optimization, um, which I used um, loss function to minimize the uh, mean square error using diffqflux.jl. So um, you, you can see that um, the speed of the oscillations are uh, very accurately, pre uh, accurately trained uh, on the stable branch and as well as on the stable branch. Um, the trick of a little trick to train on stable branch was if, uh, because of the uh, unstable unstable predict solutions for half bifurcation is unstable direction of the this um, periodic solution is on the reduced direction uh, and uh, the re reduce of the uh, the amplitude of the oscillation is the fixed point uh, so i only uh the the time integration in the tangential direction so which is uh, a trivial flip with corresponds to a trivial flock flock multiplier. So I didn't have any problem with the um, stability issues in this case. Uh, oh, I need to go fast. And I'll show you another example of using invariant manifold and um, this bifurcation theory in training uh, for a system with uh, mechanical system with uh, harmonically forced systems. This type of uh, a system has also invariant manifold, which we can uh, understand as a nonlinear version of modal subspaces. So um, like this forced systems uh, also have bifurcation diagram, uh, which, which is uh, called frequency response functions. And if we fix this uh, force amplitude, then we can have one of the um, this frequency responses plotted here. And so this system is actually a two-parameter bifurcation problem with um, which uh, like three parameters are forcing amplitude and the forcing frequency. And this red curve in the middle is called the backbone curve, which characterizes the nonlinear um, resonances. So this equation here is a normal form of forced mechanical system in polar coordinates. Uh, this row is uh, amplitude of the vibration. And this, uh, this psi here is the um, um, is the phase difference between the force and the response. And if we measure the uh, phase of the response and as well as the uh, phase of the force, then we can train um, this normal form using the input output map generated from uh, this, uh, this equation here. And in this case, the steady state responses have um, very nice input output uh, map relations. In this case, um, um, rather than using numerical integration in uh, training the machine learning model, I used uh, kernel rich regression with uh, which I used kernel functions.jl and optim.jl to um, optimize the hyperparameters here. So from the bifurcation diagram, I have trained the, this machine learned model to predict uh, the steady state response of the system with the invariant manifold. And this is the um, experimental example here, uh, which I, uh, which is just called a uh, nonlinear electromagnetic system. And I excited uh, the, the base structure here uh, using the shaker. 
Oh no! I, actually, I didn't excite it. Um, my colleague excited this, and uh, I used the uh, data of this measure, uh, this experiment to build a model. And this is uh, this 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 these uh, curves are bifurcation diagram uh, with fixing forcing frequency and varying uh, forcing amplitude. These these curves are called S curves here, and this blue blue dots here are used to train the model uh, no green dots here on uh, these these green dots here are the training data sets and using the normal form model i trained the machine learning model and you can see here that um this uh these blue blue circles here are the untrained uh, measurements and we can see that um, the model can predict the untrained bifurcation diagram quite accurately. And from the backbone curve here, uh, measured backbone curve here, um, uh, we can see that the machine learned model can extrapolate as well as the interpolate like, um, here. Yeah, um, yeah I used um, Jul Julia's IML packages to build a parameter dependent OD models from data. And what machine learning modeling approach developed here uses uh, invariant manifold and bifurcation structure as a domain knowledge. And for the future work, uh, I want I'm I'm trying to identify by invariant manifold from delay embedding maps and discover um, here. I only discovered the tangential. Uh, dynamics of the invariant manifold, but I want to discover the trans transverse dynamics of the invariant manifold, which I can build a much um, much general dynamical system model. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, that's right. all. Sorry, um, sorry, I had to cut you off this point. It's a great talk. I really, I really enjoyed uh, you know looking at all the experiments that you generated data from. Um, but uh, I, uh, we do have to move on to the last item of the day, um, um, and I'll have to give a few announcements. So I want to thank the speaker once again, um, and then make a few uh, announcements. Thanks, Kyung. Yeah, thank you. So um, thank you for uh, bearing with us or uh, being with us until the end of SIMALCON. Um, we have one last item for the day, which is an open discussion. The open discussion will be on Zoom, and we are pasting a Zoom link as of right now into the Discord. Right. So if you if you'd like to join this open discussion, please do join the Zoom link on the Discord. Otherwise, um, you know, Chris, unless you have any anything further to say, I I just want to thank all the speakers and uh, and and the keynote speaker. Let me add you to the stream. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I just want to say, yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, you know, this was a, this ended up being a great conference. Um, we saw a whole lot of variety, a whole lot of applications, a whole lot of new methods. Um, and so I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think that this shows that we should be doing this again. Um, when, when we came into this, we didn't know, you know, will we have enough applications? Like, is our is our community large enough? Um, we have seen that we we've gotten to the level of of being able to to pull off a conference, and that's uh, really exciting. Um, there are a long ways that we have to go. We're still a fairly um, small community, and you know, we're still a fairly small community, and um, you know, there's a lot that we should be doing, right, to, to be able to grow this community um, and, 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 you know, increase in, in many different ways, you know, in terms of contributors and users and, and everything. Um, and so we'll be launching a bunch of summer programs in order to continue growing uh, the, the, this community, and um, I hope to see you and chat with you about all sorts of things, you know, technical and also just community-related in this um in, in this in this uh discord so you know if, if you want to chat uh please join the the discord um you will you know you'll see our chats and then you can join our zoom our, our zoom call and we'll be talking in breakout rooms for the rest of the day so thank you very much everyone thank you everyone i'm ending the live stream now